Good morning, Miguel. courtesy announcement that we are live on the internet and in our meeting portal. Good morning, Frank. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Miguel, um, I have two of you can, I'm not sure if you're having a computer and have double logged in, but can you please identify yourself so I can um, let the other one go? Miguel Marquez? Miguel Marquez, can you please identify yourself? Miguel Marquez, please identify yourself. Miguel, it looks like one of these is unmuted. Yeah, uh, I'm signed on twice, but I um, hopefully you can hear me and I can hear you. Okay, so are both the both of those people are you then? That's correct. Yep. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure because if I boot you out, you won't be able to get back in. So I wanted to be very careful. So thank you very much for right. identifying. Thank you, Rhonda. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me again? I sure can, Jeff. Thank you. And hi, Shannon. And hi, Steve. And hi, Megan. Good morning. Good morning, Shannon. Good morning, Ms. Megan. Good morning. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
morning, Paul. Good morning, Samina. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning, Paul. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Just a courtesy announcement that we are live on the internet and in the meeting portal. Good morning, Annie. Um, you're still muted if you'd like to test your mic. Okay, here I am. Hi, good morning. Good morning, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Supervisor Wasserman. Good morning, Rhonda. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good, as it should be. Um, as usual, I'll be your meeting host, and today, Jill Mendoza will be your clerk. Jill, thank you very much. Thanks, Rhonda. You're welcome. Uh -huh. Hi, Angela. Good morning. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself, Mr. Malcolm. No problem. I just let you know that there are several members of the Muslim community that are going to be accepting the Ramadan uh, resolution uh, alongside with me. There's a, and they'll just be speaking for a minute or two. We were told to give the names yesterday. So they should likely be um, as listed as participants right now because they weren't given unique, um, like Zoom links. So they could be upgraded. Right now. Do you have their names, Samina? Yeah. Do you want me to just email it to you? That might be easier. Uh, yeah, do you still have my email address? I should. If not, I'll, I'll find a way to text you. <laughs> All, All right. right. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Good morning, Supervisor Sun Supervisor Chavez. <laughs> Supervisor Chavez, would you like to do a mic check? Say mic, mic, mic. Good morning, Rhonda, Susan. Good morning, Supervisor Ellenberg. Nice to see you, Vice President Ellenberg. <laughs> nice to hear you. Clerk Schroeder. I've got 9.30. I see Supervisors Ellenberg, Chavez, and I don't see either of the other two gentlemen. Rhonda, do you have supervisors? Lee supervisor, I do Lee see Supervi Supervisor Lee is here. I do not yet see Supervisor Samidia. All right, we'll give it another 30 seconds and then uh, we'll get started.
I just sent him a text. Are you sending me a text, Supervisor? And there you are. I was. I'm here. I just don't have my screen on. Forgive me. Wonderful. No problem at all. All right, Rhonda, with that, let's start roll call. All right. Take it away, Jim. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Smidian. Here. Vice President. I'm here. And President Wasserman. I'm here as well. Supervisor Chavez, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? If you're able, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, which it stands one nation, nation under God, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. I'm now going to turn things over to Supervisor Chavez for our invitation. Thank you very much. I'm very excited uh, to have Pastor Tony Williams with us. I know um, all of us know him and respect him very much, but let me just give you a little bit more information about him. Since 1987, Pastor Tony has served as a senior pastor for Maranatha Christian Center. In 2001, he was appointed the chairman of the City Team Ministries International Committee. Pastor Tony serves as co-chair of the county's faith-based reentry coalition and as a commissioner and really a founding leader to our reentry work and to our reentry commission. Pastor Tony's heart and outreach extends well beyond the members of his church, which is why we all know him so well. He launched the Maranatha Outreach Center, a non-religious community center, which offers homework assistance, tutoring, and computer training for youth and adults. And he has been a volunteer chaplain in Santa Clara County for many years. It's really a pleasure to introduce um, someone who you all know, Pastor Tony Williams. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see your faces and to be here with you this morning. Uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we invite your presence to be here this morning. Our county stands in a season of great challenge. and We ask for your wisdom and guidance that you would bless our county with health and safety and prosperity. We pray for businesses and corporations and corporate leaders that they would grow and prosper in business in this county. We pray for small business owners, that they would grow and develop their businesses as well. We pray for all of those who protect and guard our county, our policemen, our firemen, our sheriffs. And we pray for all the city workers that keep our county moving ahead. We also pray for the homeless and those who struggle to make it ends meet in these very difficult times and seasons. We pray for our supervisors this morning and our leaders that you would give them wisdom and grace to guide and to govern our county. We thank you for your grace and your mercy upon this county day by day. Bless this county and we ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Tony. And Cindy Chavez, if uh, you are still on, we're going to move to item number four, um, announcing adjournments in memoria. And you are first, first up. Thank you very much. I have the um, really the sad honor of asking for an adjournment for Charles W. Davidson. And I'm I think his family is here with us, and I wanted to acknowledge. Um, Mark Davidson and Tony Ariola and Mark Lazzarini, who I think are also with us today. And I don't know if there are any other um, members of the family, but if there, if there are, if they would let me know, I'd love to acknowledge them. I don't see them. Um, I, I'm gonna start by uh, just saying, and I know uh, Supervisor Ellenberg is also joining me in this um, in memoriam. Chuck was born in Eastern Oklahoma, the fifth of eight children. In his early years, he helped with the family farm, plowing with horses, tending to the crops, chickens, and cows, mined for coal to heat the house, and picked blackberries every summer. In 1951, he hit the road with his friend Jerry to find his fortune, first trying Kansas City, then Los Angeles, and to our great benefit, he settled in San Jose. 
1957, he graduated from San Jose State University with a degree in civil engineering. After working nights in, a local, in local railroad yards and attending classes during the day, he also received an honorary doctorate in uh, humane letters on April 25th, 2014 from San Jose State. Chuck started his professional career as a civil engineer for the city of San Jose, where he helped process development in the early growth days of the Valley. After leaving the city in 1959, he started the Charles Davidson Company, a civil engineering consulting firm, which over the years subdivided thousands of residential lots throughout Santa Clara Valley. He was a home builder and a developer since the 1960s, and he's developed over 5,000 units of subsidized housing by the mid-1980s. Chuck also founded DKB Homes, a residential development company in 1970, Davidson Homes in 1962, Edenvale Construction Company in 1962, and DKD Property Management in 1970, and L&D Construction Company in 1979, which mainly builds affordable housing throughout our county. Most recently, Chuck made a donation of $15 million to his alma mater, San Jose State, and as a result, the College of Engineering was renamed the Charles Davidson College of Engineering. He will be remembered as a legendary philanthropist and developer in Silicon Valley who built thousands of homes and was a pioneer in affordable housing. A lifelong community um, leader, Chuck was one of the various most successful real estate developers and an early advocate for affordable housing <laughs> in our county. He championed causes for women and children, and one of his initiatives was to support the development of the YWCA Mary Riley Davidson Child Care Center in downtown San Jose, the center which provides low-cost housing or no-cost child care to families in need, is dedicated to Mr. Davidson's mother, who raised eight children during the Great Depression. There's not a day that goes by in my life that I don't think of her and thank her for what she did, said Chuck at the center's dedication. He is preceded in death by his daughter, Cheryl and Sandra, and Charles is survived by his wife, Anita, children, Bill and Stephanie, and six wonderful grandchildren, Lillian, Savannah, Gabriella, Gavin, Billy, and um, Billy and Stella. And um, I understand Bill Davidson Jr. is also joining us this morning. You know, I, I wanted to just say a couple things about um, Chuck that I didn't read about him, but that I know about him. Um, one of them was that for many of you who know Chuck Davidson, he was an early advocate for women and people of color running for office. He, he sought out leaders in the community. He really tried to think about equity before it was a, a thing to do. He had a very strong understanding of racism and discrimination and worried a lot about it and put his time and energy where it was really to, to address these issues. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to say about him, he, um, in addition to being a family man, I thought one of the funny things I read was that, you know, he tried to take up hobbies, but his hobby was really starting new businesses. And, you know, he understood the importance of affordable housing. Like he really fought to protect that affordable housing and has had a deep partnership um, with the, the Santa Clara, San Jose um, a housing authority and worked to make sure that, that he had vouchers for families that were most in need. And when given an opportunity, which he had many times to sell that property or to upgrade that property to make it um, for folks that didn't need affordable housing, he resisted at every turn. Um, I know that uh, Tony and Mark and uh, Bill and um, who are with us today and you know Mark, his nephew, know this about him. He was hilarious, he was irreverent, he was a bull in a china shop. I couldn't miss him more. And I'm so grateful to my colleagues for letting me tell you a little bit about Chuck. He really was one of a kind and he will be so deeply missed. Supervisor Ellenberg, did you wanna add anything? You actually just did such a, a beautiful job, Supervisor Chavez, and um, are doing his, his memory justice. I'll just add my condolences to his family and very, very many friends and share your gratitude for the leadership and impact and legacy he leaves in Santa Clara County. Yeah. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, supervisors. We now move on to item number 4B, 
adjournment for Supervisor Simidian regarding Mr. Mullen. And then Supervisor, I understand you have a second one too regarding Mr. Geschke. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and colleagues. Yes, I, uh, I want to begin uh, noting the passing of a friend and former colleague, uh, Gene Mullen. And um, Gene uh, was a San Mateo County guy uh, through and through, uh, but uh, I wanted uh, to ask that we take a moment and recall his uh, memory and his service uh, for reasons that I think will uh, be clear. Um, Gene Mullen was uh, a, a guy who really lived a life full of public service in ways that were large and small, uh, very visible and public in the community, but also uh, in quieter ways as well. Uh, he was first and foremost an educator, uh, taught for uh, more than 30 years at South San Francisco High School, uh, was a coach uh, there for, uh, gosh, I guess uh, better than 20 years as a basketball coach, um, was a beloved teacher. Uh, he was, uh, in fact, named the San Mateo County Teacher of the Year uh, back in the 90s, uh, active uh, with um, uh, CTA and his own uh, local chapter. He was president of the South San Francisco CTA chapter, uh, was a veteran of the U.S. Army Reserves. Uh, but as if all of that wasn't enough, he decided to um, serve as a mayor in South San Francisco. And then I got to know him when he came to the California State Legislature and we were colleagues together uh, for the six years that he served in the California State Assembly. And he was, again, not surprisingly, uh, always focused on public education, chaired the Assembly Education Committee. Uh, but um, what prompted me to ask for the opportunity to uh, do an adjourn in, uh, in his memory uh, is that Gene Mullen was one of the most fundamentally decent human beings it's ever been my privilege to know and work with. Uh, we sometimes think of uh, people in politics as uh, a little bit loud, a little bit aggressive, uh, a little bit uh, self-absorbed, if I may say so, and uh, none of that was Gene. Gene was just uh, decent to the core, uh, carried himself in a way that uh, made you know that uh, his word was good, his values were solid, and that uh, you could count on him to do the right thing as he saw it. And uh, he will be missed uh, both uh, as a, uh, a person of public service, uh, as, a, as a family member, certainly, by his uh, extended family, and as a friend by uh, all who knew him. I did want to take a chance, um, uh, take this chance, uh, Mr. Chairman, to say that when someone passes, it's um, sometimes the case that you realize that as well as you thought you know them, there are things that you did not know. And um, I, I just want to share a paragraph from uh, Gene's published um, obituary, uh, because uh, most of the information in the paragraph is information I did not know. And it reminds us uh, that the people we know and the people we have the opportunity to serve with are often uh, far more complex than uh, we perhaps realize. Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna read directly, uh, Mr. Chairman, from the obituary for my friend and former colleague, uh, Gene Mullen. Um, and the obituary reads, while Gene was well known as a teacher, coach, distinguished public servant and community leader, he held a fascinating array of jobs earlier in his career. He was a dealer, shill and lifeguard at Calneva Lodge at State Line Lake Tahoe, a joke writer for Phyllis Diller when she appeared at Calneva, and a golf caddy for Joe Kennedy, the father of JFK and RFK. He spent time as a ticket agent with the Southern Pacific Railroad, a vendor at Kizar Stadium, a brick cleaner, and a private investigator reviewing FBI files, including a case involving the Playboy trademark, he even did a stint opening Willie Mays' mail and responding on Willie's behalf. Um, that is um, the side of Gene Mullen that I did not know quite so well. Uh, but as I say, I, uh, I particularly wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to adjourn for truly one of the most decent people uh, it's ever been my privilege to know and work with. And then um, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you mentioned, there is a uh, a second in memoriam, uh, and it is for uh, a friend and uh, local constituent, uh, Chuck Geschke, who just passed away at the age of 81. Uh, for folks in Santa Clara County, uh, Chuck is known as uh, someone who is uh, almost synonymous with Adobe, the business he co-founded. Uh, when um, uh, you uh, see that uh, three-letter acronym PDF, uh, that's Chuck. Uh, he, he really had a, um, a, a, an outsized influence, not only in the, uh, the world of technology, but uh, in our world here in Santa Clara County. He had a deep commitment to making sure that the firm that he co-founded was, uh, in fact, uh, here, and many of us drive by it on a regular basis. Uh, I got to know Chuck uh, back, uh, gosh, a little more than 20 years ago now when he was in my ALF class, American Leadership Forum. Uh, and what I was always struck by uh, in Chuck's case was that uh, in a group full of accomplished people where he was uh, probably among the most accomplished, he was also, quite frankly, among the most uh, reserved, humble, quiet, uh, never in any way, shape, or form uh, self-aggrandizing. And, you know, Chuck uh, went through life, uh, in this case, I think the word I would use as one of the most gracious people that uh, I've ever known. He carried, and not in a, uh, not in a sense of... Um, good manners, although he was certainly a, a good mannered human being in his every interaction, but he, he simply carried himself with grace in every interaction and, and quiet dignity. And uh, I knew him as, a, as I say, as a, an ALF classmate, as a, as a friend from that experience, uh, as someone who certainly was a, a, a generous and active um, philanthropist and local community member uh, we would uh, see each other at events and take the opportunity to catch up on our lives. Uh, he and Nan, his wife, uh, were just um, uh, seemingly inseparable, but uh, mostly it is his quiet grace that uh, is going to be missed, I think, uh, and the dignity he brought to uh, every interaction. And so while we say um, adjourn in memory of an extraordinary business leader, uh, we uh, also say adjourn in memory uh, in recognizing the passing of a, a person of real grace in the way they carry themselves in the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, colleagues, for the opportunity to adjourn today's meeting in memory of these two uh, extraordinary folks. Thank you. And that was amazing to hear the additional info about Gene. That was just incredible. Incredible. Thank you for that. Thank you all and our condolences to all the family affected um, by the three adjourned to memoriam today. With that, we'll move on to item oh, five. Hmm. We actually have one more uh, <clears throat> adjournment, please. <clears throat> oh, Supervisor Lee, please <clears throat> yes. go right ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so before I start, I just want to say uh, I have a chance to meet uh, uh, Assemblyman <clears throat> Jim Mullen and myself uh, about 20 years ago, and his son, Kevin Mullen, who is now serving distinguished in the uh, assembly and certainly will miss him dearly for all his uh, great work. Uh, today, I'm actually bringing the, uh, uh, the German a memorial for Tony Acevedo Lopez. Antonio Acevedo Lopez was born in the family of Lucia Lopez Vega and Marcelino Acevedo Rosa in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico on April 15, 1952. And he is the fourth child. Tony loved sports, especially softball and baseball where he was designated as a pitcher. He worked for the education department in Puerto Rico for several years. Tony moved to California in 1979 and worked for more than 20 years as a welfare social worker for Santa Clara County. He also founded his own orchestra and band, Saboricua. He was famous for playing and singing salsa all over the Bay Area as a leading singer and founder of Saboricua. Tony was a member of the San Jose Puerto Rican Civic Club for many years, and he served as president for two years terms from 05 to 06. And he also planned to retire in March 2021, but gained his heavenly wings on January 20th this year. His 12 children and 15 grandchildren really loved him. And his family hosted a memorial service for Tony Acevedo on Saturday, April 17th, 2021 
in San Juan Bautista, California. Today, uh, joining us, I see we have Angela Tirado, the voice of San Jose. And Angela, would you want to say a few words? Thank you very much. I want to just share real quick his picture. And I come today as Angela Tirado, the voice of San Jose. I also come as Madam Chair Commissioner on the Social Services Advisory Commission. And I come as a proud Puerto Rican. And I had the pleasure of knowing um, Tony uh, through his music. Um, you didn't just hear his music. You didn't just hear him sing. You really felt it. Um, he was a beloved educator, an artist, public servant. He dedicated his life to serving the community and he created an impact on the lives of many of us. Um, he had a true passion for playing and for singing salsa. He brought like that flavor to San Jose, the Puerto Rican flavor. Um, and many people touched it. You didn't have to be Puerto Rican to feel that flavor because uh, everyone felt that. And uh, he played baseball. He helped with the baseball and he was actually part of the Puerto Rican league there. And he gave a lot of advice. And if he saw a young man or a young woman playing and he would always go out there and, and play with them, you know, as an adult. So, um, you know, the, the legacy that he left on our community is truly a gift, a truly a gift that we are proud of and we are grateful for. And that is something that, uh, that we're truly going to miss, but that's something in every day that we'll be able to honor him. And I just want to thank you, um, Supervisor Lee, for taking the opportunity, especially this short notice, um, to be able to share because he, he really put unity in community. And that's what, what we're all about. So thank you very much. And uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be Tony if I didn't end this with and the home of the brave play ball, Tony. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. We now move on to item five and 5A is also Supervisor Lee um, with the proclamation. Thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, today, we have a few di distinguished guests here today is uh, Samina Usman from the Council of American Islamic Relations, Molana Nabi Abidi, the Shia Association of the Bay Area, Dr. Muhammad Nadim, President of the Muslim Community Association, Farla Andrabi, President of Mountain View, Palo Alto, Musala, Shakil Alaudin Albakir, Shakir at the Valley Community West Valley Community Association, Athar Sadiqi from the South Bay Islamic Association, and Akba Said, President for the Evergreen Islamic Center, and they are with us today. Muslims are one of the most racially diverse religious groups in the United States of America. According to a study done in 2017 by the Institute for Social Policy, American Muslims are the only faith community surveyed with no majority race, with 26% white, 18% Asian, 18% Arab, 9% Black, 7% mixed race, and 5% Hispanics. Muslims have a long history in the United States, dating back to the slave trade in which 10 to even 20% of the slaves brought over to the colonial America from Africa to work on the plantations were Muslims. Muslims have long served the nation's armed forces and fought in all major United States wars from the American Revolutionary War to the modern conflicts today with some Muslim Americans making the ultimate sacrifice in combat. Muslims have contributed to social movements throughout the history of the United States, including right here in Santa Clara County to work toward justice and fair inclusion for all. 
Muslim American communities have played a significant role in the history of California's economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development. So whereas Ramadan is a holy month of fasting and spiritual renewal for Muslims worldwide, and it's the ninth month of the Muslim calendar year, this sacred time is also spent focused on charitable work, increased time in spiritual worship, and donating money and other needs to feed those who are in need. Muslims contribute significantly to philanthropic organizations that help people from all faiths in the United States and around the world by providing medical assistance, family services, and academic supplies, feeding the hungry, and providing essential services. And whereas Ramadan is a time to reflect spiritually, build communally, and aid those in need, and marks an annual spiritual renewal for each individual and a reason to attitude this month. And whereas Support Life Education has distributed over a million pounds of food to those in need in Santa Clara County since August 2020 and coordinated a vaccine clinic from the base here at the Muslim Community Association in Santa Clara to vaccinate hundreds of people. So now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors for the County of Santa Clara thus hereby recognize and proclaim April 12th through May 12, 2021, as a Ramadan, the holy month, and then encourage all county residents to continue supporting those in need during this special time in Santa Clara County. And just to show uh, on the screen, everybody can see the proclamation uh, passed and adopted by the Board of Supervisors, County of Santa Clara, State of California, on this 20th day of April, 2021, by unanimous vote. Congratulations. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And before we move on to item 5B that will be um, presented by Supervisor Simidian, I invite anyone who wishes to speak under public comment, which will come after this next, to electronically register so their hand is raised and that uh, Jill can recognize you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, colleagues. It's uh, my pleasure today to uh, welcome uh, a longtime friend and community leader, Annie Annie Komshan, who's uh, with us today at the meeting, uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, we are uh, joined for a, a solemn occasion, and that is the uh, recognition of uh, April the 24th as the uh, 106th anniversary of the uh, Armenian Genocide. Uh, Ani is um, uh, a leader in the community in many respects with the Armenian National Committee uh, here in Silicon Valley, uh, where she deals with um, some very challenging uh, geopolitical issues uh, and their local relevance. Uh, someone I've known uh, for a very long time through St. Andrew uh, Armenian Apostolic Church in Cupertino in my district, uh, and as uh, someone who has the kindness and patience to be a leader of uh, Homenet Men, which is the scouting organization uh, with um, uh, young people uh, scattered around the Capitol lawn in my memory uh, during my time in Sacramento, uh, as well as uh, uh, serving as a color guard uh, quite frequently locally these days. So in all of those roles, we welcome her, even though it's for a somber occasion. And that somber occasion, as I say, is the commemoration uh, but also the acknowledgement in a public venue, Mr. Chair and colleagues, of the genocide that took place uh, starting 106 years ago on um, April the 24th. I, I say um, acknowledgement because <clears throat> for uh, too long and in too many instances, uh, people have been uh, reluctant to simply step up and say the words out loud. Armenian Genocide. And uh, that's notwithstanding the fact that uh, the uh, contemporaneous news accounts were very clear, notwithstanding the fact that uh, there is a uh, broad historical understanding and acknowledgement and recognition, uh, and notwithstanding the fact that at various times uh, our national leaders have made it pretty plain uh, just what happened and why it's important to recall these kinds of uh, experiences. 
um, you know, President Jimmy Carter more than uh, 30, 40 years ago now, I guess, uh, made reference to the fact that there was a quote, a concerted effort made to eliminate all the Armenian people uh, and described it as, uh, quote, probably one of the greatest tragedies that ever befell any group. Uh, and uh, some years later, uh, President Reagan referred to <clears throat> the genocide of the Armenians in just that language. Um, later, the first President George Bush referred to the, quote, terrible massacre suffered in 1915 to 1923 at the hands of the rulers of the Ottoman Empire. And again, uh, colleagues, as I say, these are uh, direct quotes. Um, President Clinton uh, referred to the commemoration as, uh, quote, one of the saddest chapters in the history of uh, that century, uh, the deportations and massacres of one and a half million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I could uh, uh, also note that the second President Bush similarly said that the 20, <clears throat> excuse me, the 20th century was marred by wars of unimaginable brutality, mass murder, and genocide. And history records that the Armenians were the first people of the last century to have endured these cruelties. Uh, President Obama uh, also uh, said that the Armenian genocide uh, is not is not an allegation, a personal opinion, or a point of view, but rather a widely documented fact supported by an overwhelming body of historical evidence. The facts are undeniable, said he. And yet, in spite of all of those uh, observations, uh, it is um, a source of continuing discomfort and concern that as a matter of official policy, uh, the United States has not always stepped up the way our board has, and certainly the state legislature has, uh, has not always stepped up to acknowledge uh, this uh, genocide and call it by that name, largely for reasons of uh, foreign policy, uh, quite frankly, uh, which is why it was uh, so gratifying when uh, earlier, uh, uh, just a couple years ago, actually, and I, I want to pull the language here, uh, why it was so gratifying that the Congress of the United States finally took action in October of uh, uh, 2019. Congress uh, took action uh, in the House, the House of Representatives, to pass Res 296 by a vote of 405 to 11 affirming uh, that it is the official policy of the United States to commemorate and recognize the Armenian genocide and to uh, reject association of the U.S. government with all forms of its denial uh, and to, to promote the public education of the Armenian genocide. Uh, it, it is um, uh, so gratifying after so many years of denial from uh, some sources. And we are hopeful that in the coming few days, uh, we will hear uh, from President Biden in a, uh, an official way with some uh, statement in his role, uh, not as a uh, member of the Senate uh, or a vice president or candidate, but in his role as president of the United States. Before I turn uh, the microphone over to uh, Ani, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just briefly, uh, I wanted to offer an observation um, about the importance of uh, this uh, moment and this proclamation. Um, if, for those of you who've had a chance to uh, travel to Israel uh, and visit Jerusalem, and uh, one of the most uh, significant uh, experiences for me during any visit is uh, an opportunity to visit Yad Vashem, which is a both a center of learning, but also a center of uh, remembrance for those who perished in the Holocaust. And there is a quote tucked away from the German Jewish essayist Kurt Tucholsky um, that um, I look for when I visit, uh, and it is simply this. A country is not only what it does, but also what it tolerates. And I think that's something of which we should be mindful. Uh, it is uh, so important that we um, continue to uh, call these things by their name, uh, because what we have seen in the now more than a century that has passed is that man's inhumanity to man uh, is 
painfully uh, revisited year after year, decade after decade, now century after century, uh, in the absence of our acknowledgement and a commitment to say no longer. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your patience. It's an honor to once again be able to uh, take these moments and uh, remember and uh, recognize and commit. And I'd like to turn uh, the microphone over, if I could, to Ani and Ikomshan for just a few brief words. Thank you. And after Ani, after you speak, um, I'm going to go back to Supervisor Lee for one or two speakers uh, regarding the Ramadan proclamation that he did as well. Ani, go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Samitian. Uh, Honorable Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg, Supervisors Chavez, Lee, and Simitian, on behalf of the St. Andrew Armenian Church and the Armenian National Committee of America, Silicon Valley, thank you for your Armenian Genocide Commemoration Proclamation on April 24th. For many years, Santa Clara County has stood by us acknowledging and recognizing the Armenian Genocide, uh, which occurred 106 years ago. Unfortunately, Turkey still denies this fact. And as you know, the final stage of genocide is denial. Uh, we know what happens with genocide denial. It's likely to happen again. As genocide has its stages, so does hatred. When ignored, it can escalate. Let's take the recent hate crimes against members of our own community here. Many groups have suffered. For example, the Black community, the Asian community. Motivations may differ, but all hate crimes are unacceptable and must be stopped. Armenians, too, have dealt with their share of hate crimes recently in the Bay Area at our schools and community centers uh, in San Francisco. Those are our safe places purchased and built by exemplary U.S. citizens, Armenian American genocide survivors like my grandfather, my father, and, uh, and their friends. Um, as you know, immediately following these hate crimes, Azerbaijan and Turkey started an unprovoked war on Artsakh nagorno karabakh committing gross war crimes with the intent to remove Armenians from their indig indigenous lands. Sound familiar? Didn't this just happen 106 years ago? Uh, when Ar Armenians were massacred and removed from their indigenous lands of Western Armenia, uh, also known as current day Eastern Turkey. Uh, many Armenian Americans living in your districts uh, have been dealing with this as uh, this um, impacts directly their families who live in Armenia and Artsakh. Um, they've all been impacted by this war. How could this happen in 2020 when genocide is not condemned by the entire world the crime remains unpunished. Leaders like Erdogan and Aliyev become emboldened. So what can the United States do? Well, the United States did a lot at the time in, in 1915 through the Near East Relief Foundation. And we greatly appreciate that. Today, local, state, and federal level all uh, recognize the Armenian Genocide. And we do hope that President Biden will keep his word and recognize the Armenian Genocide. It is a matter of human rights and ultimately world peace. And it's the right thing to do. Uh, dear supervisors, once again, thank you for joining us in our com annual commemoration. Uh, we sincerely appreciate it. And we sincerely appreciate all that you do for our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ani. Supervisor Smitting, did you have a second speaker or I'll go back to Supervisor Lee? No, thank you very much. And uh, I wanna uh, just express my appreciation to my colleagues for the opportunity to uh, share these thoughts today. Absolutely. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. I apologize for uh, not uh, failing to rec recognize and ask uh, the, our speaker here today uh, regarding Ramadan proclamation. Uh, I will go ahead and hand over to our friend Samina Usman uh, for a few words, please. Thank you so much, Supervisor Lee. I truly appreciate uh, the resolution that you presented. Um, you know, with with anywhere between 1.6 and 1.8 billion Muslims around the world who are, you know, the vast majority are practicing um, the act of fasting. Um, you know, we get 
uh, we get to understand just barely what it feels like to be hungry as so many people are facing hunger today, given the pandemic, given you know the, the difficulties that we're facing. And I truly appreciate, especially Santa Clara County being at the forefront to helping those uh, during the pandemic and providing those services. And I want to say that the Muslim community has been um, also you know, stepping up um, their efforts in order to help those in the pandemic. And I'll, I'll be turning it over to uh, Sheikh Al-Azina Bakri to, to share some of the things I know it, it was mentioned in the proclamation, but we really truly want to make sure that we are um, uh, helping those in need, making sure to uplift uh, those. Um, and, and um, you know, but again, Ramadan is a truly special time. It's been challenging, of course, to, given the pandemic, because we can't gather together like we used to. I mean, like prayers would be like, you know, you would have the whole halls packed because of people praying in the evening. And, uh, but now there've been adjustments and Dr. Muhammad Nazim will, will share a little bit about that in order to ensure that, you know, we're all staying safe and healthy and, uh, um, but, you know, we, we hope that we'll be able to come out of this pandemic uh, as soon as possible so that we can um, hopefully next year be able to uh, celebrate Ramadan um, in congregation uh, like we used to. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sheikh Al-Azim al -Bakri if he's able to say a couple words, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sister Samina, and thank you, uh, Board of Supervisors, for inviting us today for recognizing Ramadan. Uh, it really makes a huge difference. I am uh, a resident of the city of Santa Clara, um, and um, I'm the local imam at the West Valley Muslim Association, which is in Saratoga. But I also serve uh, at MCA and at SBIA. Both presidents are here. Um, I go and teach there, and we do activities that not only serve the Muslim community, but the larger community. Uh, almost a year ago, maybe 10 months, uh, we started uh, at Support Life Foundation, of which uh, I'm a board member. Um, the, we started serving the larger community by doing food distribution using the MCA uh, ground parking lot uh, and in partnership with Second Harvest. And almost every Saturday uh, for four or five hours, we would literally deliver food to the houses over 500 as addresses of delivery and 500 uh, uh, people that would come and pick up the food from the location itself. So it's both a pickup and a distribution center. So after 10 months, uh, we think we topped over a million pounds of food distributed uh, to the larger community. And uh, definitely that's, you know, informed by, uh, you know, our faith, our citizenship, our feeling that we belong, um, and this is home, and these are our neighbors, and uh, these are the simple tenets of faith that this is the least that we can do. But um, to be here today and to see the recognition, it really uh, makes me uh, want to cry and uh, <laughs> get emotional. I think when you fast, you get very emotional very easily. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, and on behalf of so many communities. I mean, I speak and lecture at seven different major centers in the Bay Area. Half of them or four of them are in the South Bay in the county of Santa Clara. Thank you for being a, a very supportive uh, board of supervisors and leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, with that, we will move on to item number six, which Can is I... public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Do doctor, you raising your hand? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Lee and President Bazerman and distinguished members of the Board of Supervisor. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be here. We are really honored and grateful. I particularly want to take uh, a minute here to thank uh, the county for, uh, for giving such an amazing opportunity for our Muslim community to, to open our mosque here in Santa Clara MCA, which is the leading Islamic and community center here in the Bay Area. In fact, uh, I would say that this is not only just a unique and a special place for the Muslim community and the community at large. Uh, one of the things that's slightly different than what we are doing this year because of the restrictions uh, from the county and the state and CDC, um, we are uh, in journal on a yearly basis during the Ramadan nights, we accommodate anywhere from 
2,500 to 3,000 people on a daily basis who come for the nightly or the thoroughly prayer. This year is slightly different because of the restrictions. We are averaging about 600 to 700 and all our halls, uh, the prayer halls, the banquet hall, and, and the outdoors, uh, because we are doing both indoor and outdoor prayers, they're all completely packed. Uh, and we are really grateful and thankful for, for the county for allowing us this opportunity to do this. Uh, one of the things that we are really missing is the presence of the community at large. MCA is, is, is a vibrant and bustling place, uh, you know, especially in the month of Ramadan on weekends. We do open houses, we invite the community at large to, to come and enjoy and see what the Muslim community <laughs> does uh, in the month of Ramadan. Uh, but we are hoping as we move forward beyond Ramadan, as, as the county allows, as the things open up, we, we have a huge series of uh, programs lined up uh, for, for not only our community to enjoy, but the community at large to come and enjoy with us. And the, the last thing I, I wanted to say that MCA is, is, is a special place, uh, not just for the Muslim community, for, for all of us, is because we have such a diverse group of uh, the Muslims, at least from 70 different nationalities. And we are really proud of that. And these are doctors, engineers, software engineers, people from all walks of life who live as far as Livermore, Dublin, and Gilroy. They, they want to come to MCA. They want to be here to enjoy that beautiful experience that MCA provides them. So we are very really proud of that. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Farha, I see your hand raised. Did you wish to speak as well? And, and if so, I need to, oop, the screen is changing on me. Yeah, Farah, if you wanted to speak. Yes, uh, yes good. Uh, I just basically, I wanted to. I just need uh, to, to limit you to two minutes at this point. All right, thank you. Uh, to uh, appreciate the county's efforts to um, incorporate the Muslims in, in the mainstream by recognizing Ramadan. And uh, of course, it's uh, like my colleagues have already mentioned, uh, the things we do in Ramadan, focus on charity and all. Uh, this year, I think for us, because um, due to the COVID conditions, we are um, praying outside, outdoors, the nightly prayers, it did encourage us to reach out to our neighbors and all who we are inviting for uh, to share food with, which we hadn't been doing before. And in addition, we are also you know, reaching out to the community at large and including them. We are, compared to the other mosques, uh, smaller musallah, it's a smaller community. And um, um, the supervisor, Joe Smithian, mentioned Boy Scouts also. We also have a Boy Scout uh, troop, and um, I happen to be the scout master of that Boy Scout troop. And you would be happy to know that I am America's first female scout master to start a Boy Scout troop. Um, in addition, it's a little bit uh, away from Ramadan, but as a Kashmiri, uh, what uh, Supervisor Joe Smithian mentioned, um, that a country is uh, known by what it tolerates um, as a Kashmiri whose land is occupied by India. And although the United Nations has passed resolutions that um, the solution should be according to the wishes of the people, but for similar reasons for which um, our nation has uh, not uh, officially raised voices for other issues, such issues, we're facing similar issues. So it would be wonderful to bring to um, the attention of um, higher uh, officials that Kashmir is also an issue um, that needs similar attention. Thank you. Thank you, Farhad. And with, with that, we need to end the uh, accommodation proclamation portion of our meeting today. Thank you all very much. We now move on to item six, which is public comment where anyone can speak about anything not on today's agenda. And if I look at my participant screen, Jill, I see two people. Yes, sir, we currently have two speakers, three. Oh. Okay, let's just, just limit that to two minutes each. Thank you, one moment while we get the timer up. Thank you. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you, please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, my name is Paul Soto, and I'm a registered California Mission Indian. I'm a Komie from the Dueño Nation, and we built the Mission San Diego 
which is the first mission that was built it, when my people came into contact with Junipero Serra. I would like for uh, for uh, Supervisor Samidian, uh, precisely, I mean word for word, precisely what you spoke and how emphatically you spoke in defense of the Armenian people, which is just, which is just of you to do that. I would like the same courtesy extended to the California Mission Indian. I quote from your colleague, Senator John Burton, pro tem, September 2002. The California state legislature created laws that controlled California Indians' land, lives, and livelihoods. With the, while the enforcement and implementation occurred at the county and local township levels, some examples include county level courts of sessions and local townships, justices of the peace, determined which Indians and Indian children were quote unquote apprenticed or indentured. He's talking about slavery. From 1851 to 1859, the California legislature passed 27 laws that the state comptroller relied upon in determining total expenditures related to the expeditions against Indians. They got a number right here. One million two hundred and ninety-three thousand dollars was paid out between 1851 to 1859 at five dollars per decapitated head and twenty-five cents per uh, scalp of children and women. And when they were when when there was no more Indians around, they started grave robbing. So I would like that same courtesy extended on an official level right here because it happened right here to my people. Scott Largent, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. I uh, normally don't talk about articles kind of on the same days they come out or the following day, but there was something interesting on San Jose Inside um, about a gentleman that works for our district attorney. Um, his name is Daniel M. Chung. And he also did another article several months back in the Mercury, um, which is, is some pretty interesting stuff. I did enjoy reading this. Um, I, I, I do appreciate when uh, county staff kind of does the right thing and speaks up for our community. And it really does seem that that's what this man was doing. I don't think his intentions were to derail the DA's office or, or cause a lot of problems. I do hope that you supervisors uh, will stand up for this man. He is being retaliated against by uh, by Jeffrey Frozen. Uh, the same issues with Jeff. Um, he does not have thick skin. If you criticize his um, his DA's office or himself, uh, he will come after you with both barrels. I've been maliciously prosecuted now for four or five years. I've been able to get a lot of the exculpatory evidence, just showing all the investigations and waste. It's just taxpayer waste. I mean, this guy thinks I'm a terrorist. You know, I, I'm not even on probation or parole. But let me get back to this man right here. Okay, I got about 30 seconds left. Daniel did the right thing. He spoke up for our community, and he's also speaking up for the Asian community. And there was one section in here where Jeff Rosen was making fun of him uh, in regards to his hair and saying he looked like a North uh, Korean dictator, uh, which is, you know, these are not appropriate comments. And we also have a DA that likes to make fun of uh, uh, disabled people at uh, county meetings. And that's another just dig that's just, it, this is inappropriate. This man just needs to go. We really need a new DA in Santa Clara mm -hmm. County. Thank you. Is Daniela Anaya? I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Daniela Anaya, and I'm a clinician working for Family and Children's Services within the Behavioral Health Department. We serve the birth to five and school age population. As we all know, the COVID 19 pandemic has resulted in health and mental health crises that has been compounded by social and systemic injustices, as well as ec economic hardships. Our department has had an influx of referrals for behavioral health as many families and children are suffering. While we have seen an influx of referrals, we have not had the sufficient staff to accommodate our community's growing needs. As of October 1st, 2020, the department implemented assessment for intervention redesign, which has shifted all assessments for incoming referrals for birth to five clients from community-based organizations 
to only three clinics. This new arrangement increases monthly birth to five assessments for full-time employees from four to six cases per month to eight to 10 cases. This cuts hours needed for support and care through the assessment process, shortens duration of assessments from state allowance of 60 days to complete assessments to only 30 days to complete assessments. This arrangement impacts the quality of assessment and quality of services provided to the community. As clinicians, we strive to serve each family with care, dignity, and respect. This is why we urge the board to protect these populations by applying the American Rescue Plan Fund to add sufficient staff in order to provide quality care and strengthen the foundation and sustainability of our work. Thank you for your time. I yield the rest of my time. That concludes our speakers, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jill. And that concludes public comment. We move on to item number seven, which is to approve the consent calendar and changes the Board of Supervisors agenda. Before we look for any members of the public that wish to speak um, on this item, we currently have requests from Vice President Ellenberg to consider items 19 and 30 together and request from administration to hold 77 and 78. Jill, do we have any speakers on any of the items on the consent calendar? We do not. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, I'll turn to you first for any additions or subtractions. Thank you. You still have a public speaker, I think, on all, but in our side, on the panel side. Malawana. Malana. 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 Jill, do we have? Yes. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, extend my uh, uh, gratitude to all of you, especially the Board of uh, Supervisors in Santa Clara. It's an honor and pleasure to see this resolution. Uh, I know that we can. Um, bring lots of topics when it comes to the injustice and also when it comes to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, what uh, happening in the uh, uh, Middle East or in Armenia or in Kashmir or different places. I think the uh, most outstanding point here, what I saw is uh, I was able to see a great faces here and also uh, the commitment from the uh, uh, supervisors from the Santa Clara County and their dedication and devotion to bring this community together and to tackle to the roots of the problems. Uh, I am here, Imam, uh, in Sabah, Shia Association of the area, a mosque, and also we do have a RISE Academy, RISE Online Schools also. It's an honor and pleasure to serve the uh, uh, our community and also at large. Uh, we do have uh, different programs here for the uh, you know the uh, uh, social and welfare and also for the uh, uh, intra-faith and uh, interfaith. Uh, I would like to commend all of you for uh, this great resolution. And I was humbled to see uh, this resolution from the uh, uh, Board of Supervisors from the uh, Santa Clara County. May God bless all of you and give us uh, strength to perform our duties and responsibilities in this great month, month of Ramadan for all of us, kind of a special month, which is a connection uh, to God and connection to the people. And we enjoy that. And I can see uh, in this uh, Board of Supervisors of Santa Clara's uh, resolution, uh, part of that. And I'm so happy and so, so humbled to uh, see that. Thank you um, for all your effort and dedication. Thank you very much. We'll, con we'll uh, consider that under public comment. Now back to item number seven, approving the consent calendar. Supervisor Chavez, your hand was raised. Was that yes, the speaker or the consent calendar? It was for the consent calendar. Um, I'd ahead. like to thank you, uh, President Wasserman. I'd like um, to register a no vote on item 60 regarding the sponsorship policy, just to be consistent with my last vote. I'm sorry, item six zero or five? Yes, six zero. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to request that we hear item 21, which is the Valley um, Homeless Healthcare Program with at right after item eight, because it's the reports primarily focused on how we're addressing vaccines for the homeless. Um, item 43 is a grant application for the county to expand our work with youth experiencing psychosis. Um, I, I'm really excited about this and I, I hope the grant does well. I wanted to ask staff to be inclusive of making sure that this program has lab tests that rule out any neurological or anti-immune reason for psychosis before diagnosing and treating it as a mental illness. And again, I wish the staff good luck on that item. 
and that was item 43. Um, item 48, I wanted is really worth a shout out. I want to thank the BMC Foundation for equipping our Chibet outreach teams with iPads because they're signing so many people up. I just wanted to say yay and keep the, up the good work to the BMC <coughs> Foundation. Um, item 58 is the resolution to establish our advisory redistricting commission. And I would like to make sure that um, there is press um, and communication done when the website link becomes available and to encourage the application is, um, is posted wide that, they, that the outreach program, and I think we discussed this, but that the outreach program at least be reported off agenda within the next couple of weeks. And then item 28, um, this is that this is an item that um, relates to how the courts are communicating with our um, custody system. And even though some agreements have been reached relative to the information sharing, I'd like to put this on consent um, with the request uh, on the, uh, to get a progress update at our August reentry network meeting. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Just two clarifications, please. You were a no vote on 6060. 60. Thank you. And you wanted to hear 8 and 21 together. Yes. 8 Thank and, you. wait, I'm sorry. Let me just verify that. Yes. 8 and 21. Yes. And 28 Thank on consent. I'm sorry. You wanted to put 28 on consent? Correct. Okay. And Jill, if you can remove any people that we have on as panelists, um, the, mostly the uh, previous speakers, that would be great. Supervisor Ellenberg, go ahead. Thank you, President Wasserman. There was an update to the consent calendar that was sent out this morning that reflected my request that we move item number 23, uh, which is to approve, approve agreement with Matrix Consulting for a comprehensive fire and emergency services study onto the consent calendar. Item number 23, gotcha. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jill, looks like we still have one speaker left. Is that correct? Supervisors taking their hands down. Okay, we do have one public comment, sir. We have one public comment, all right. May we please hear for that person and he or she has two minutes. Oh, uh, President Osman, I do have some changes to the consent as well. Should oh, I let's speak let's oh. let's do your let's do your changes first, so the speaker is aware of that. Great, as Thank you. do I, Supervisor. Thank you. Go right ahead, Supervisor yes. Lee. Thank you. Uh, I would like to request to pull uh, item fifty-four off the consent and being uh, have it heard concurrently with item twenty-four, um, if that's okay. Pull fifty-four and hear it with twenty-four. Correct. Uh huh. And then the next one is a little bit longer. Uh, I'll try to speak slow on this. Uh, it's for item 42. Uh, I, I'm, we're okay to have it remain in consent, uh, but I would like to also see if we could provide the follow direction. Number one is request of BHX SD uh, to work with our V3 uh, uh, office to conduct some more additional targeted outreach uh, holding community education sessions um, to help destigmatize mental health in partnership with the LGBTQ and the Latinx community-based stakeholders. Um, and for the sessions to be held concurrently with the Mental Health Services Act Community Mobile Response Program application moving forward. Number one. Second is asking the BHSD to provide an off-agenda memo to the board um, <coughs> on the issue regarding the screening call center. Um, focus really on the operations, staffing, and funding levels, um, the calls being received, um, and the referrals being made to community-based providers. Um, and, and this memo is to look at the, the recommendations for potentially outsourcing calls um, for the MCRT uh, to, to some type of a, a behavior health service provider to manage and operate, similar to how the community response team program is being envisioned to be operated managed by a CBO provider. Um, it's my understanding that the providers be contracted to operate the community response team call center will be asked to screen and refer these incoming calls, say to, to either PERT or MCRT. Um, and this will help streamline the calls and minimize uh, the confusion. 
of community. Third is to request the HSD to provide an option and memo also to the board uh, regarding the de redesign uh, of the targeted public awareness pro uh, pro campaign uh, regarding destigmatizing the mental health of women of communities of color, uh, as well as promoting the uh, community mobile response program. Uh, this type of campaign should include, but not limited to paid TV, radio, or print ads, um, and in multilingual PSAs. Um, and finally, it's asked the BHSD to, to provide a board on a periodic uh, say semi-annual uh, progress reports on the uh, MCRP, the Community uh, Mobile Response Program. All right. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Smidian. Oh, one, well, oh, I'm sorry. One, one more thing. Um, on item number 28. Yes. Um, I believe um, the uh, supervisor, the Chavez, wants to move this to consent, correct? Just yes. Now? Right. Um, so we, we do have a, a follow up question uh, of request of our of agenda report. Um, to see if it's possible to receive a copy of the template court order drafted by Judge Manley to use to request access to the medical records of the track two clients. Um, and try to also figure out how we determined uh, the AP, ABA Team 10 track two uh, and how the staff determined when the individual is incompetent to stand trial. Um, Okay, uh, and in a little bit more detail, we can to find out what the average length of stay for these inmates are, inmates are before it's determined that they are track <clears throat> eligible and how long do they stay after they're eligible in custody before the client is being placed in the community-based treatment. Gotcha, certainly questions that, that can be asked of staff and, and uh, responded offline if that's all right with you. Okay, yeah, let's do that, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian and then Chavez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will uh, ask that I be recorded as an abstention on item 68. That is 6-8. Uh, I will abstain. Uh, I um, would like to ask that item 23, which uh, had been suggested as a possibility for consent, uh, actually stay on our regular agenda just because I have some follow-up uh, questions and requests to make. So if we could keep 23 on the agenda. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. And uh, let me just ask uh, County Council uh, for some guidance here in real time. Forgive me. Uh, item 73 is an item that involves uh, some back and forth uh, regarding uh, county owned property and uh, VTA, the Valley uh, Transportation Authority, uh, as uh, council knows, uh, two members of our board, myself included, sit on the VTA board, as well as uh, being members of this board of supervisors. So we're in the somewhat unusual position of being members of both bodies that are uh, part of this uh, legal back and forth. Is there any conflict or need to um, recuse on this item, if I could ask council in real time. Uh, without having any knowledge of uh, what may be specifically going on involving the board on the VTA side, I can say I'm, I'm not aware of any reason you would need to recuse. All right, thank you. I, I'm not aware either, uh, and I uh, think on a consent calendar item, probably fine uh, to simply uh, cast an eye vote, and that's where I'll be on this item. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Those were my three uh, items for follow-up. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, on item 54, and I think this was the Mental Health, um, the Mental Health Services Act um, application we're applying for for the community response. Yes. Um, I, I do just want to say that I, I'm, I'm comfortable moving it as is with the concurrent outreach um, moving forward. I think the other recommendations, Supervisor Lee, that you're making, are you asking for a, a report back 
on the ideas that you're putting forward? Supervisor Lee? Yes, yeah, so on 50, um, yeah, so what actually for 54, uh, we're just putting out consent so that we could talk about it uh, a little bit later uh, uh, along with 24. So we're not going to deal with that consent. Oh, I'm time. sorry. F 54. Yes, 54 has been pulled to here with 24, Supervisor Chavez. Correct. I'm sorry. I'm, I may have the number uh, confused. On the, Let me just look real quick in my notes. He was talking about item 42, if that's of any help. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That item, you're just making recommendations for information. Right. Request. Okay, as long as those are information requests, and this is rel relative to our application for the mental health services. Right. Uh, the reason is, let me just say this, this sure. went through a community process. And so mm -hmm. I don't want to see us making um, changes. I, I do like the idea of continued outreach if the, mm -hmm. but if the only thing you're asking for is an off agenda information is it off agenda information regarding the issues that you're raising correct and okay. i think it would be helpful to continue doing outreach but i certainly don't want to slow down just like you're saying because the work is so important we need to start soon right yeah i'm i'm more concerned about um uh, just about the the direction on the the other programs that are that are tangentially um, engaged here, but if, if what you're asking for is an off agenda report, then I, then I think that's fine and we'll all get a chance to look at it. So that's mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I see we have three speakers, Jill. Let's go back to those three speakers. Those will be the final three on consent and each one has two minutes. We'll get the timer up. Thank you. Our first speaker is Chantal Gaines. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, good or good morning, sorry. Chantel Cotton Gaines, Deputy City Manager with the City of Palo Alto. Thank you all for your time today. I just wanted to express our support as a community for item number 42 and to thank the Stakeholder Leadership Committee as well as the Behavioral Health Board and staff for all of their hard work with um, the community engagement and identifying the sites for this mental health uh, community response program. So just wanted to take a moment to express our support as a community for this program and all the hard work done. And I'm excited to see support for it. Thank you, have a great one. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you, please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, uh, good morning everyone, Scott Largent. The, the item on the consent calendar uh, that I'm speaking about right now is, is item 42. I, I tried to participate in the uh, process, the community involvement end of things like that, and that just basically crashed and burned. I mean, you could put up your hand a hundred times. No one was ever going to call on you or take any type of feedback um, or if quorum was ever even met. So I, 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 I was very frustrated about that. I wanted to provide my feedback and it was pretty much shot down. Um, I very much appreciate Supervisor Lee. Um, the questioning that you're doing now. Um, you're kind of chasing in the right direction right now. Um, I, I, I really am excited that you're asking these type of questions in an open and public setting and not, not just kind of burying it off to the side. Um, I am not impressed with Judge Manley's courtroom. Um, I'm not impressed with the fact that people are put on 10 years worth of probation, that they're cycling in and out of a system and yet they're still behind a dumpster, butt naked, smoking mess, screaming and yelling and not really getting any type of services. You guys are gonna start catching on to more of this, um, but it's questions like what Supervisor Lee is asking that are really gonna kind of blow the doors open um, on that failure of a system there. His team is a joke. These people are not getting help. Um, I advocate for a lot of them. I get thrown out of Manley's courtroom. He doesn't want the public in there. They just don't want anybody having their eyes in there. Um, and, and you as supervisors are just getting smoke blown up yet. I mean, that's what's going on. And uh, I like the line of questioning, uh, Supervisor Lee. And if there's any um, information that you would like to see on my internal audit, um, I think it would be helpful. Nobody should be on probation for 10 years and basically uh, um, sent down a diversionary program that never has any success at all. So thank you. 
Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto, and I'd like to affirm everything that Scott Largent is saying. It's, it's sad to hear that, that he's not being acknowledged as an asset in the community because the information that he has and the lived experience that he has, I can affirm that. that, that it, it's, it's solid information that you're getting from him. Uh, two things. Uh, number one is the in custody. They stay in custody anywhere between 30 days after they have already been okay to split. You're, you're everything, all the paperwork, everything, you're ready to go, everywhere between 30 days and up to a year. Up to a year. That's how long they're sitting in jail with no crime. And I will remind the, the, the board that that was the circumstance in which Michael Tyree was murdered. Michael Tyree was not in jail for charges. He was there waiting for a bed. And he was murdered by, by those deputies. Okay, and, so, and, and I went into that dorm after that had happened, two weeks, two weeks after that had happened, I entered that dorm, so I know what that felt like. The residue, it stayed there. Secondly, is, is, is with respect to the, the, uh, the response team, that is, a, that is a rock solid idea. I've read the memos, I've read the paperwork, all of the, uh, all of the uh, you've covered every single area. The meetings that you've had, they've been thorough. They really understand um, about the uniforms. They understand about the car. They understand about the talk. They understand the necessity for uh, for peers, counselor. So you have everything. The issue is going to be the actual bureaucracy that you set in place and make sure that all of those pieces are connected so that the service is seamless and that the person on the street um, um, is able to receive the service because you're gonna have an acceleration of that population within the next five years. That is a guarantee that you're gonna have that. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, Jill. All right, fellow supervisors and Jill, this is what we've got and what we're going to do. We are going to hear numbers 19 and 30 together, hold 77 and 78, Record the fact Supervisor Chavez is a no vote. <clears throat> Excuse me, on number 60, 60. We are going to hear items 8 and 21 together. We are going to pull 54 and hear it with 24. Regarding number 52, Supervisor Lee's requests are for information only. And Supervisor Simeon is is abstaining on item 68. And I will take the liberty of making that a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ellenberg. Any further discussion on those items? Um, I, I think, did you, add, did you add 28 to consent also? Yes, 28 is on consent. And the last one you, you talked about where there were information only was item 42, not yes. 52. Thank you. Yes. I can repeat the list if any of if any of you wishes. Thank you. Nope. Jill, may we please have a roll call vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. With that, board members, we are going to item number nine which is to approve a referral to administration to report to the board. And I will take the lead on this as it is my referral. I'm bringing this referral to the board to address the issue of lead emissions at both Reed Hillview and San Martin airports. We have heard the concerns from our residents near the airports and under the flight paths. Although we'll know more about potential lead emissions from automobile and aviation. When we get the study in back in May, I believe this action can be taken immediately. This is a common sense approach to public health. I look forward to a report back with concrete steps to make the, this unleaded fuel options at our airports a reality. Ultimately, this referral aims to create a healthier and sustainable environment for all our residents. And I hope to have the board support. And with that, I will make a motion for approval. 
can I'll look second for a second. It. Supervisor Chavez, thank you very much for your second. Do we have any further discussion? I, I just wanted to add um, a couple things. Um, one is that we did get a report on this item in February 2020, but I realized that the you know, the industry is moving really fast. So Supervisor Wasserman, I just wanted to appreciate you bringing it forward. I also just wanted to emphasize that when we approved a new fuel tank at San Martin in January of 2021, we were able to verify the new tank can accommodate unleaded fuel. And I just wanna make sure that as the staff um, dives into this, that there's a recognition of that um, as, a, as a, an opportunity and an option. And I, and I think it's pretty aspirational, but I do think that we have to figure out a way to regularly check on the on the um, on the market in this area. So thank you, Supervisor Wasserman. Very welcome. We have one speaker. Looks like Jill. That person will have one minute. It's the timer for one minute. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto. I'm also a descendant of South Sea Puedes. Um, well, I, I, I do commend you, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, because it is just and it is right what you were doing. It's about two generations too late. You know, that Hillview Airport is where pesticides, DDTs, were filled up. They filled up those tanks. Pat Hillview Airport was manufactured to create an infrastructure to spray the fields from, from San Martin all the way to South Si Puedes. They sprayed them on my ancestors, okay? They stuck children. They put children into the fields from planes that were loaded with DDTs from Hillview Airport, and they sprayed this poison amongst the kids. And Santa Clara County and San Jose were the profiteers. They profited from this. That's why Cesar Chavez was right there in the center, was because he knew that that was the scene of the crime. That was a crime against humanity, what happened out of Hillview Airport with those pesticides. That concludes our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez, you have your hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, we have a motion uh, by Wasserman, a second by Chavez. We've heard from the public. I don't see any other supervisors. Joe, will you please uh, call for the vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you very much. Vice President Ellenberg, I'm going to need you to take over on item number 10. I need to recuse myself from this item because of my financial interest in McDonald's. And I've been made aware by county that I can uh, listen, so I'll know when to come back in. If you'll take over on this item, I'd appreciate it. I'd be happy to do so. Item 10 is to approve a refer referral to administration to send a letter of support for Assembly Bill 257, the Fast Food Accountability and Standards Recovery Act, and it is Supervisor Chavez's referral. So I'm happy to turn to you. That we are bringing together, Supervisor Allenberg. Um, so I, together with Supervisor Allenberg, we're bringing this referral forward, seeking support for the county to send a letter of support for AB 257, the Fast Food Accountability and Standards Act. The legislation will create a fast food sector council that will include stakeholders from all different parts of the industry and will be able to create, maintain minimum health, safety, and employment standards in the fast food retail industry. Um, hold, and it will hold fast food franchisors responsible for ensure, ensuring that franchisees comply with health, safety, and employment standards. Importantly, the legislation recognizes the large corporate entities that act as franchisors franchisors have the larger responsibility to make sure that minimum wage and uh, working conditions for employees are safe within their franchisees. And I would like to request support from my colleagues and then I'll see if Supervisor Ellenberg wanted to add anything. Thank you. Is that a, a, a motion for approval? Thank you. I'm happy to second it. Thank you for including me on, on this uh, referral. I have nothing in addition to add, but I'm, I'm very glad to support it today. Do we have any public speakers on this item? Looks like, looks like we've got five. 
Uh, so Jill, let's set the timer for uh, one minute, please. And invite our speakers. First speaker is Eddie Chong. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you so much, Vice President Ellenberg, members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm here today to request your opposition to Board of Row number 10, which will commit Santa Clara County to supporting AB 257 and would devastate restaurants, franchise businesses throughout California. Restaurant fi franchises are independent small businesses. Just because they are associated with a corporation for branding and marketing purposes, that does not mean that franchises are large businesses themselves or have similar profitability and margins. Small franchises make their own decisions when it comes to hiring. In fact, the reason why so many minorities and independent entrepreneurs choose to open a franchise is because they do not have the resources to start a small a business by themselves. Minority entrepreneurs link themselves to a franchisor so that they can access a successful business model and to access new opportunities that may otherwise be unattainable. AB 257 would eliminate opportunities for minority business entrepreneurs and I urge the county supervisors to uh, not take a position on this at this time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rebecca Armendariz. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, President Wasserman, honorable board members. Uh, my name is Rebecca Armendariz. I'm here on behalf of Silicon Valley Rising and Working Partnerships USA. I'm calling today to ask the board to support Assembly Bill 257, the Fast Food Accountability and Standards uh, Recovery Act, also known as FAST. Passage of FAST will mean increased and improved worker protections and working conditions for the approximately half a million workers in California's fast food sector. These are the very workers, the essential workers who risk their lives and those of their families to provide meals for us and keep a substantial part of our economy running while others of us are safely working from home. This pandemic shed light not only on how much we need these workers, but also on how vulnerable they are. More restaurant workers died from COVID-19 than any other job in any other industry. COVID has disproportionately impacted these workers on many fronts as they are mostly from communities of color and live in multi-generational households. So we ask that their voice be heard, that they be given a seat at the table via the establishment of a fast food sector council. Our next speaker is Olivia Garcia. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Olivia, if you could unmute. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Olivia García. Estoy aquí apoyando a la ley AB257 para beneficio de nuestras familias porque es muy importante tener un seguro médico que nos proteja para nuestra salud. Gracias. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto. I don't speak Spanish because uh, my mother was abused in, in San Jose Unified School District for speaking Spanish, for being Mexican as an American citizen. Now, I don't understand Spanish, but that lady right there, I felt what she had to say because this is, it, this is getting vulgar now. The exploitation of this country and how strung out it is like a heroin addict on slave labor. They keep the immigration laws in place. You, I'm tired of these restaurants exploiting my people, my people. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of them exploiting the hotel workers. I, I, I can't, it, it makes me sick when I go to a hotel and I see how hard these women are working and then how disrespectful they were treated with respect to absolutely no uh, uh, COVID protections. The senora had to, uh, uh, a protest out here in front of the McDonald's right here on First Street, right down the street from your building. I mean, this is really getting sick. I'm sick and tired of hearing these restaurants complain and then exploit the worker. Our Bill, next... uh, apologies, before you go to the next speaker, we should have had a translation of the, of the Spanish speaker. Is there someone that can do that, please? I'm working, ma'am. Um, we did send the link, and it looks like the translator is not in the room at the moment. We'll get someone. We're going to ask, right, if we can look and have somebody play that back and translate it for us. Thank you so much. So in the meantime, we'll, we'll go on. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elisa Blum. I am. Um, 
Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, I'm Eliza. Um, and to help translate Olivia Garcia, um, she was saying that she is in support of AB 257 um, as a fast worker. She needs medical, um, she needs health insurance, and she really needs to be able to protect herself um, from COVID-19. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Supervisor Chavez and Ellenberg for introducing this referral today. Um, the amazing leaders of South Bay have been so incredibly helpful in supporting this effort. So I want to draw your attention to the many list of letters of referral from the Fight for 15, from Powis, from Together We Will San Jose, from Working Partnerships USA, from the Poor People's Campaign, Luna, Stanford Solidarity Network, and a multitude of other people um, urging you to support this referral, please. Um, fast food workers are on strike right now in Oakland and heading to Sacramento tomorrow. Um, and they wouldn't be doing this if this bill weren't so necessary. Um, so with that, I urge you to support um, Supervisor Chavez and Ellen Burge referral. Our next speaker is Forrest Peterson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Thank you, Supervisors. Uh, my name is uh, Forrest Peterson. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University. I have a PhD in engineering. And I've worked on wage theft uh, data. I'm actually in a call right now with the Wage Theft Coalition. Uh, Senator Katrazi just spoke a minute ago. And I just want to relate that the importance of having a, um, having the, uh, sorry, the, the fast food sector council uh, to provide recommendations for fast food workers is incredibly important to uh, balance the, the disproportionate power created by the franchise uh, environment and that wage theft and just the, the exploitation of, of the workforce is just unbelievable and the lack of voice to work, work uh, to advocate for yourself, uh, the workforce is really silenced. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pablo Narvaez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Pablo, if you could unmute, please. We're unable to connect with Pablo. Um, we do have the Spanish interpreter in the room now, ma'am. Thank you. And can we have, I, I appreciated the previous speaker's uh, help in translating. I want to just um, make sure that that we have our, our translator who can confirm that for us and then is on hand as needed. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, I am the Spanish interpreter. Um, I did not receive the link to become a panelist, so I had to join from the public, um, the link that was open to the public. That is why you could not see me. Apologies for that, and thank you for joining us now. And are you able to please translate the Spanish speaker's uh, comment for the public? Yes. Uh, the if the past um, lady who who commented could please repeat her uh, her her comment so that I can interpret, please. I don't know that we will be able to get her back on. Um, what I'd like to ask is that you will move on and if you could review the um, the recording and get that that comment back and then share it when you uh, when it's available, that would be helpful. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, returning uh, to my call, that was the last speaker, correct, Jill? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we can remove the clock. And I will turn to my colleagues. Do any of you, other than Supervisor Wasserman, have any questions or additional comments? If not, we have a motion from Supervisor Chavez, a second from myself, and let's do a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman with a recusal. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Handing the uh, virtual gavel back to President Wasserman. Thank you, Madam Vice President, very much. That concluded item number 10. We move on to item 11, 
which is to consider recommendations related to increasing indoor air safety brought to us by Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Um, I know my colleagues are well aware of the loss of life in our community and that we've had over 80,000 people lose their job just in our county alone. And um, I know all of us are starting to feel like we're on the path to recovery and vac vaccines are kicking in. And as a result, federal and state governments are providing resources for county governments to help our communities recover from the pandemic. This referral seeks to capture those resources to help our small businesses, nonprofits, schools, and other shared indoor spaces to be better protected from COVID-19 transmission and to be able to reopen faster. Indoor transmission of COVID-19 is a result of either short-term uh, exposure to the virus or a result of long range exposure where an infectious person leaves viral particles in stagnant indoor air and the long term exposure can be mitigated by reduced occupancy indoors and by improving ventilation and air cleaning. Therefore, by establishing a county grant program utilizing federal and state relief funds with matching fund funds from our city partners we can help our businesses and nonprofit organizations upgrade their air safety systems and buy new devices to protect themselves from COVID-19 and its variants and hopefully help us return to normal faster. Providing an opportunity for businesses and nonprofits to improve their indoor, indoor air quality will have the added benefit of protecting county residents from smoke during wildfire season. We all saw last year the confluence of multiple emergencies occurring all at once the pandemic, wildfires and smokes, power shutoffs, and a heat wave. And when people are forced inside due to emergencies, they need to have clean air to breathe. This referral requests that the staff create a 10 billion, uh, 10 billion, 10 million, sorry. 10, I object. <laughs> a $10 million countywide grant initiative with our city partners for the purpose of giving grants to small businesses and nonprofits to support them to use for upgrade in their air, air filtration systems and purchase supplemental air safety devices. And this referral requests that staff allocate $5 million from the county's federal and state COVID relief funds to grant the initiative to um, and incentivize our city partners to do the same with their federal uh, and state grants. I wanna, I, I just wanna make sure that um, we're beginning the uh, planning as we start to see more and more people go back to work. I'd like, to ask the staff to consider partnering with our small business development centers on this type of initiative and leverage our existing contractual relationships with the small business development center and to have our staff work with Dr. Duan and the Office of Education to make sure that the schools have what they need to open. That would be a motion. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. I'm, I'm happy to second for uh, purposes of conversation, but I, ha I have a couple of questions first. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you, Supervisor Chavez, for bringing this forward and for the continued work of, of our entire board to identify ways to mitigate the harms to our small local businesses that have resulted from uh, pandemic-related policies. Um, first, with regard to scope of the referral, I want to understand how you're envisioning that it fits with other forms of support that the board has implemented to meet the needs of small businesses um, uh, impacted by the pandemic. The, the first is this, um, is there specific funding specifically, let me ask that better. <laughs> is there funding specifically for this air filtration um, uh, support in the American Rescue Package, or would this draw on flexible resources that are anticipated to be received by the county? It would draw on flexible resources that are that as a county as they come to the county. I'd like this to be one of the areas that we prioritize. Okay, and in prior discussions of the Small Business Support Program that Supervisor Simidian and I um, proposed that resulted in the inclusion of uh, $6 million in the California Rebuilding Fund, um, part of the reason that this was my preference, I will specify, not, uh, not Supervisor Simidian's, but one of the considerations I wanted to make was for grants rather than loans. And my understanding from County Council was that we were limited in being able to 
issue grants of public funds to for-profit businesses. And I just want to check with council to see if that is, is an issue before us now or not. James, can you respond? Sure, it depends on the specifics of the program, including the relevant criteria. And so that's something that we would look into as this moves forward and comes back. Uh, but it would be important to have appropriate criteria related to uh, public benefit and who is eligible and for what reason. Got and, and the gift of public funds it, it issue that that would thank you um, because I, I certainly I think the intention is is very good and very important. Um, I just want to make sure that we that we that we do this in a way that's proper and. Um, Finally, while I, I really appreciate the goal of helping businesses reduce their risk of transmission by increasing ventilation, I wonder if this, it's a, it's a pretty large proposed investment, um, if it could be used by businesses more flexibly, uh, if they didn't need air filtration, but they needed PPE, they needed to install barriers, they needed to move their operations outside. My preference would be, um, to whatever grant program is created that's permissible uh, to allow more flexibility for businesses to, to apply for what they need. And wondering, Supervisor Chavez, if you'd be open to that or if you wanna keep it limited to air filtration. You know, I think it would be worth letting the staff take a look at it. The reason that I was looking at air filtration in particular was that, that I think it also could help people who are on the bubble of deciding what to do relative to um, their investments. And I think we have to be mindful of the high level of risk. And, and I'm really thinking that we don't know, like, we just don't know how long the vaccines are going to last in people. There's a lot we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was looking at, at air filtration in particular. And, um, you know, and I think your point, if if part of dealing with um, with air is is you know being outdoors instead of indoors, I think that's good. But I really am focused on air quality. Let me just add one other thing. Part of what I was also trying to figure out how to address is instead of doing a program that deals with air in one way, that we really gave the businesses the opportunity to use HEPA filters or UV lighting, like whatever their their buildings really required to allow them to really focus on air quality. And there's a there's just one other point here. There's a piece of state legislation that um, I think it got passed about a year ago that focuses on creating clean air stations in um, in community centers and which I think is fine, but I also think we're needing, you know, as we think about climate change and all of these other issues that are hitting us at the same time, that we really need to give, take a really robust look at indoor spaces of all kinds. And I'm concerned and that for smaller businesses that this may fall off the radar just because of the other choices that people have to make. I mean, so that said, that's why I was so focused on air air quality. But I think if if what we're looking at is circulation and and the like, it makes sense. Otherwise, it's a grant program of you know just and and I think the board should think about that. Frankly, one of my concerns about the um, the loan program is that I think folks have taken out so many loans that I I too wanted it to be grants. So. I was hoping to have this conversation about grants when we had the conversation in the budget about the 19, adding another 19 million to the loan program. Well, I, I agree with your, your preference for, for grants over loans and, and, I, and I'm clearer now on your purpose of the, of the referral, which really wasn't a general um, small business recovery grant program, but something that very specifically applies to air quality, which uh, I certainly agree is, is just as relevant for um, general environment and, and fire um, air quality concerns that, that we all experienced last summer. So um, thank you. I appreciate the additional information and I look forward to hearing from the rest of our colleagues. Thanks. Supervisor Smitty and then Dr. Smith. 
Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Smith, if I could go to you with one per uh, particular question. Uh, I understand that we're uh, in line to receive significant federal uh, funding and obviously I'm thankful for that and should take a moment to thank our uh, congressional delegation for their efforts to make all that happen. It, it didn't just happen. Uh, people made the case that it was important for uh, local governments, including our county, to have the resources to do the work. I, I am assuming that, the, as I understand the conversation so far, that we could lawfully and appropriately use funds from that allocation but that there isn't a specific set aside for these purposes. And that presumably if we did use the funds, it's just a choice we have to make about if we use the money for that purpose, it's then not there to use for some other COVID related purpose. Is that where we are in this conversation and the back and forth about funding? Yep, I would say that's my understanding. Um, right now we're going through the process of waiting for some of the regulatory um, requirements uh, for the expenditures that we will, or for the revenues that we will eventually get. Um, but it's likely that uh, within those regulations, there will be some flexibility. So I think at this point, we can presume that if we were going to allocate $5 million from the Rescue Act uh, revenue that it would be five million dollars. It could also be used at some other for some other purpose. Thank you. And um, I uh, I may be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, uh, Mr. Chair. But I wonder if I could, through the chair, uh, ask Supervisor Ellenberg, who I see is um, one of the two sponsors on item 14 about a grant program, which would be, as I understand it, uh, based on uh, using funds that were collected, if and when they are collected, uh, on fines uh, during the pandemic for a grant program. Is there any opportunity, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, in your thinking to merge that item with this item, number 11, meaning that if uh, the fines were uh, collected that they might be devoted to just such an air filtration system as Supervisor Chavez is uh, suggesting in item 11, or well, I'll stop there and just ask the question. Supervisor Ellenberg. I, 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 I would certainly be open to talking more about that. The vision for the, the small business grants was actually more generalized than just the air filtration, which is why I was trying to understand um, this better, but it certainly is along the same lines of looking to be as flexible as possible and accommodating as possible and supporting our uh, small business uh, community. So I'm, I'm, I'm open when we get to that item to talk about um, the fines being included in this in this larger on this larger bucket. We've only collected about half a million dollars in fines, so it certainly wouldn't um, wouldn't cover all of it. But it does. It, it is in that same vein of making sure that we are getting the money back into the community. So thank you very much for that. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to supporting the measure in a moment uh, when we get to a vote. I. I uh, I think Supervisor Chavez is uh, absolutely on the right track calling out these issues of air quality as uh, needing to be addressed as part of the going forward uh, success that we hope to have. Uh, I am, um, I mean, the cost is always a question. And so if there was a way to blend 14 and 11 when we get to 14, that might be a way to honor the spirit of 14, which is to uh, essentially make clear that we're reinvesting those fines in, in the business community uh, and to some extent, to the extent the fines are recovered, uh, actually mitigate the uh, impact on our federal allocation so we could do even more. I'll, uh, I, I would just ask the maker and the seconder on this item, item 11, to incorporate consideration and comment by the staff on that possibility 
when the report comes back. Uh, that's not a direction. That's just a, hey, could you think about it and come back to us with your recommendation? Uh, and then the one other question, and I don't know if Supervisor Chavez would like to respond to this uh, through the chair or whether it's more appropriate for staff, but my limited knowledge, and it is limited knowledge of uh, how this uh, process works is that the cost of the filter itself, which is estimated in the referral to be $2,000 to $2,500, um, is typically just sort of part of a larger cost associated with more expansive construction uh, for a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. And so I, I don't know if the notion is that um, we would uh, simply provide the filters so that when people did the HVAC work, they were going to use the filters, or whether these are viewed as standalone, separate and apart from uh, HVAC systems. So I should probably stop talking and let the proponent uh, share a little bit more of the thinking about what um, what that might look like. Supervisor yeah. Chavez, we'll have yeah. you answer Supervisor Smithian's question, then Dr. Smith, we will get to you next. So. Um, so Supervisor Samidian, first of all, I, I really appreciate the thoughtful approach. And I think yet having staff do a report back, um, you know, on, on a number of these items makes sense. I, I think that's all to the good that we understand better um, what our options are and what we should invest in. I will say that I've talked to more specialists on HVAC than I could possibly tell you. And so my my um, and, and, and the answer, and I feel like I've had this conversation even with my father when he was a, a, as a carpenter, it depends. And so one, one um, thing that I think would be really helpful is if we could really let the staff even dive in deeper to the most appropriate way. What we shared with you was recommendations we got from um, folks who work in the field. And I will just share with my colleagues, you may recall that when we moved forward with the Healthy Nail Salon program, that one of the things that we did is we made investments of $1,000 for and gave folks options of what they could choose based on the physical buildings that they were in, in terms of how to keep the air uh, clear. And so we have a little bit of history here. And so I, I think having the staff take a deeper dive, I would do a disservice to explaining a MRF filter, the HEPA filters and the smoke filters and and what it takes to get them embedded. And it and again, it sort of depends, but I'd like staff to get a dive at that, Supervisor Smithian. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I think uh, Supervisor Chavez might have just addressed my issues. Um, what I was going to um, point out is that um, there will need to be some significant research done by staff in order to actually come back to the board with something that's workable. Um, you've already talked a little bit about the legal issues that are related, and obviously there are operational issues and clearly financial issues where the money can come from. And as I understand the referral, it also asks us to involve the cities and other uh, partners in the fund. So uh, by saying, uh, doing a deeper dive, I'm interpreting that as meaning um, we should come back with a report uh, that is our best suggestion of how to proceed forward rather than committed to any particular process at this time since there's so much research that needs to be done. Thank you. I've got a comment, but Supervisor Chavez, he's responding to you. Yeah, I think um, I think that's right, um, Dr. Smith. And again, we do have there is actually a, a great deal of research that's already been completed on this out in our in the world because of the high level of interest with COVID nineteen, and we have experience with the Healthy Nail Salon program. That, that all said, I'm very interested in getting staff's perspective on the most appropriate way to proceed. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll just chime in and go back to Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, I'm very, very familiar with HVAC systems and in the process of designing one right now. And in the conversations we had, there were four different types of filtration systems. And they asked, did you want to do this one, which is the thin little one, or this one that's thicker, or this one that lets, lets less things in? And I said, you know what? I've got allergies, this, that, et cetera. 
let's go for the super duper ultra best one that filters everything possible, smoke, pollen, um, COVID, et cetera. They said, okay, then we would need to redesign your entire heating and air conditioning system because there would not be enough airflow going through that filter in order to properly heat or cool the areas. So it's a very in-depth and it differs on each location and size and volume. You can have a 500 square foot space with eight foot ceilings or a 500 square foot space with nine foot ceilings and the filter has an entirely different effect. Supervisor Allenberg. Thank you so much. Um, we've talked about the, the report coming back that, that looks at the legal perspectives and the operational. I wanna make sure also that we include reflections on, uh, from a public health perspective, since this is ultimately what we are trying to do is improve our public health. So um, with the agreement of the maker, I'd like to ask that the report back include recommendations on mitigation um, of air quality strategies that would be the most effective from a public health perspective. Uh, excellent, yes. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. We have three speakers. Um, Jill, if you'll bring them online for a minute each. Thank you, we'll get the timer up for you. Our first speaker is Robert Brownstein. I am unmuting you, please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, uh, I'd like to speak in support of this proposal. Uh, I'm very pleased to see the county interested in using federal and state resources for health infrastructure and particularly health prevention infrastructure. I think this should just be a beginning of efforts to look at ways to improve health infrastructure through federal sources. Uh, another possibility is to improve filtration in housing in low income areas where there's compaction, many families living in one unit. And of course, a much bigger potentiality is to work with our, dele our congressional delegation to get into the Biden infrastructure bills, resources that could be used at our South County facilities for skilled nursing facilities, LTSS facilities, and caregiver housing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Paul, go ahead if you could unmute. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and I say this with no amount of flattery at all, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, but I continue to be impressed by the way that you continually to center the conversation right back where it's supposed to be. I mean, right, bam, right there, because it seems like there's there's these undercurrents of conversations that I, I pay attention, very, very close attention. And so there's there's the ostensible conversation, but there's these elements that are right underneath it that are convoluting the issue. And so I appreciate what you just did right now because lives were lost. There's like this lust for this COVID money. That COVID money is coming to this area because the Rasa on the east side of San Juan was constantly working and making sure that Anglos were nice and comfortable in their homes while they had COVID on their clothes. They had COVID in the entire environment and they were taking it back to their homes. That's why this money's there. So there's kind of like lust for, you know, to, to get the money tied, it's kind of disgusting. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you, please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thank you very much for this item and how you talked about this item. Um, it's my personal feeling that uh, I hope we can learn to talk about the secondary help that aerosol vaccines can possibly play in our lives. And you tried to offer a language possibly today to talk about that and how they could work in HVAC systems. Uh, their work with the vaccine process can be really helpful to talk about its public health benefits of this item, to talk about uh, air quality. Uh, you know, I'm learning the terms that, that you want to use uh, for an item like this in the future of HVAC systems. I hope it's a language 
aerosol vaccines we don't have to fear in the future. You offered a, a language that was interesting how to talk about it. Um, just a reminder, thank you again for all your help and work and that uh, I don't think we have to fear using the term aerosol vaccine in the future. Thank you. Our next speaker is Forrest Peterson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Heather, honorable supervisors, uh, I was uh, I heard this conversation. I, I stayed on the call after the uh, the wage theft uh, earlier discussion. Uh, as a civil engineer, uh, mechanical systems actually falls under my expertise, so I know a little bit on this topic as well. I teach a dual enrollment program through Evergreen Valley College with Eastside Union High School District with their Yerba Buena Construction Academy. Uh, last year, uh, one of my student teams worked with Roger, who's the head of facilities of the Eastside Union High School District, and they showed the role of, of ventilation on uh, uh, cognition and showed that in the typical classroom, the levels of CO2, which is exhaled just from just normally just sitting there, is high enough that it will lower your test scores from an A to a B uh, or lower and that the, the ventilation is incredibly important. So the reason why I, I called in is I wanna recommend that if possible, try to focus the grants on, on after school programs or places where students are studying and doing homework. Thank you. That concludes our speakers, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And there's our screen back. We have a motion and by Chavez, second by Ellenberg. Seeing no other hands raised, I'll just chime in to say that uh, anything we can do to help using federal funds, I think is a good idea. I think Supervisor Ellenberg brought up, you know, this is one idea, item 14 is another idea. I do wanna say that the number one priority to beating COVID is getting everyone vaccinated. And I'm very, very concerned that the pace at which we're vaccinating people is going to slow down. And whatever dollars we can use to encourage people to get vaccinated I think is our number one defense against death. Um, I'll be supporting the motion. If there's no other comments, I'll ask Jill for roll call. Supervisor, Supervisor Lee, yes. Yes, just a short comment. I would like to first thank uh, Supervisor Chavez for bringing this extremely important uh, issue up, a uh, very creative solution that's uh, being proposed here. Uh, certainly be supporting it. And I would uh, like to, Look, not necessarily here, but of course our school districts, our schools needs to have the same type of uh, 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 ability to do so. So we might need to have a separate conversation with our school districts to make sure they have the funding to upgrade the HVAC system for our children, number one. Uh, and, and second, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing this report coming back uh, to see coming of a viable solution. Obviously, uh, funding is always limited, but uh, with the funding we gain from the federal government, I think it's really important to make sure that we are allocating uh, every penny of it to this. And I certainly do think uh, Supervisor Submitting's idea is great as well, whether it's coming from the fines or any other ways we could get this all worked out. I think um, this would be hugely beneficial for our community and for us to get back to normal. So thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we'll have no problem spending all of it. And I hope the schools get money as well from the state. All right, Jill, if you'll please call the vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We now move on to item 12, considering recommendations relating to ensuring county's eligibility for federal and state funding. And I'm gonna turn to Supervisor Chavez for this Thank regarding you. broadband. Yeah, thanks very much. This is in um, response to pending legislation in Sacramento, um, AB 14 and SB 4, which would extend and reauthorize the California Advanced Services Fund that would be managed or is managed through the California PUC. Um, Santa Clara County uh, could be potentially, um, not just us, but our other public sector partners could be potential recipients of future dollars from this fund by establishing the required consortium as outlined by the PUC. I, I'm hoping that this is a, I hope staff is making other preparations for how we can take advantage of the upcoming state and federal funding. We're looking at this and this could be a once in a lifetime opportunity to really support major funding for broadband and other infrastructure projects. 
I understand that currently San Francisco is doing bi biweekly meetings that include relevant departments and industry representatives on how best to take advantage of the expected Biden administration infrastructure bill that's not only for broadband, but other major projects. And um, the second item that I'm asking for is a, a dig once policy that will uh, support us laying the um, conduit underground whenever they're, whenever we're digging up roads. And just as a reminder to my colleagues that because of measure B and using um, some of our BLF funds, we're doing quite a lot of road repair and road building throughout the county. And it makes sense not to tear roads up more than once. I just want us to really, really prioritize that. Um, so establishing a dig once policy with the county um, could help us also expand broadband access. So these are um, a, to move in a, a referral to the administration county council to report to the board in June with options for consideration relative to um, developing a consortium. And then item two is to report to the board in June with options for consideration relating to the establishment of a dig once policy. Thank you. Is that a motion, Supervisor that Chavez? Is, that Thank is you. Line. Supervisor Ellenberg, did you want a second? I'm happy to second the motion. Um, and just uh, in preparation for today's meeting, I had to learn about HVAC systems and about um, trench joint trench agreements. Um, and I and I understand that an important piece, the consortium, I I absolutely agree with, and the dig once absolutely makes sense. But we need to make sure that there that this consortium or somehow that there's a joint trench agreement with telecommunication providers to make sure that we can actually use the trenches for for these multiple purposes. So I am sure that staff will come back with um, with those, de those details in their report. I just wanted to make sure it was on the radar. Thank you. I, I can tell you it's on the radar 15 years ago when we repaved Santa Cruz Avenue in downtown Los Gatos and I was the mayor. When the trench was dug, each entity put their own conduit in. There's certain things that need distances between other conduits, depending on what's in it. Some things are laid at two feet deep, some are laid at three feet deep, but everybody gets to put their stuff in there. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. I just uh, wanted to ask if the maker and the seconder would be amenable on part B of the motion to explicitly indicate that the staff will come back not only with options, but recommendations using that that language. Thank you. I see a nodding head. I, um, I, I understand and, and agree with the sort of fundamental premise of dig once, uh, but <clears throat> it's, it's a little situational in my experience. It's, it's not inexpensive. Uh, even if it's dark fiber, uh, it's not without cost. And it is a little bit of a long-term bet that there will one day be some utility for that dark fiber in the locations where it is laid. And it, it varies in my understanding uh, in its utility from location to location, meaning may not make a lot of sense on a county road to a very remote location if there are only uh, a handful of folks uh, who are beneficiaries. On the other hand, uh, just so you know, it's me, uh, the, um, you know, that's the whole challenge in some of our more rural areas. Having said that, uh, my understanding as well is that the technology is changing. You know, we're, we're talking about things like satellite internet, mesh networking, uh, that may or may not be preferable. So uh, that was, I should have just taken yes for an answer, I think, but I, as I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the willingness to incorporate the words, uh, recommendations, uh, uh, for staff, just because I think I, I want to hear from them what they think makes sense given costs and the state of the technology. Thank you. With that, I'm happy to support the, uh, support the item. And I, I will just say a shout out to my former colleague, uh, then State Senator Alex Padilla, now United States Senator Alex Padilla, actually wrote the legislation back in 2008 and 2010 that's referenced in the referral. And it made me smile because I remember at the time thinking what a uh, smart, forward thinking uh, guy, uh, Senator, then Senator Padilla, now Senator Padilla, 
uh, was and is. So um, nice to see his work sort of come full circle here at the local mm -hmm. level. Thank you. Thank you. It can never hurt to put extra conduit in a trench once it's dug for some future purpose. And Subra, I submit in, you're absolutely right. The cost to underground things is very, very, very expensive, which is why we still have so many telephone poles around our county. All right, we have everybody spoken here for the moment anyway. We've got four speakers. Jill, take it away. Thank you. For the record, we already have three people in support. Our first speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, uh, thank you to Supervisor Wasserman uh, for his last words on the previous item. The vaccination process is incredibly important uh, for our future. I, I'm sorry I didn't say that. <laughs> thank, thank you that he did. Um, uh, for this item, you know, I'm trying to learn, that, you know, there's a very distinct possibility there may be a large earthquake in the SF Bay area in the next five years. I don't know how accurate that is, but it's something to consider in what you'll be doing with these road building issues uh, and Measure B funds. Um, I think it's uh, important to, as always, you know, as important as the, bridge, the bridging the digital divide is, you know, the ideas, you know, that it kind of got short changed and, and it's getting kind of a bad rap because it's being forced on to us by government at this time. Why not really consider open public policy ideas that can really help bridge the digital divide issues and help with the digital divide issues, I think immensely uh, for all of us in the community. Our next speaker is Devin Conley. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. This is Devin Conley. I am the board president for the Mountain View Wisman School District. I'm also president of the Digital Equity Coalition and a member of the Santa Clara County School Board Association's Legislative Action Committee. Um, I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for all of the work that you have done already to close the digital divide in our community by supporting short-term solutions for our students across the county um, over the summer. And I am so thankful that you all are preparing for the funding that we see coming down from the state in the future and the federal government to expand broadband access. This is a once in a generation opportunity. And I wanna let you know your trustees all across the county, we are pushing so hard at the state level to get AB 14, SB 4 passed. Um, we also see AB 34 coming down the pipeline in the future in 2022. So. Thank you for the work. Please keep doing it. Godspeed. Thank you. Speaker is by Mona of Salberta. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Hello, honorable supervisors. My name is Mona of Salberta. I'm vice president of the Digital Equity Coalition and also a special education teacher um, in the county. Um, my parents and sisters reside in South County and our students across the county have all experienced uh, challenges with digital access during this pandemic, which you have all taken action on to support short-term solutions. In South County particularly, uh, my sisters who are trying to access distance learning have struggled with consistent, stable and high-speed access to the internet. It's vital that we ensure Santa Clara County is eligible for federal and state funding for increased broadband access to maximize the effectiveness of future funding for broadband infrastructure projects. And so really encouraging uh, to take these steps that will allow our county to access both vital funding and structures to continue to improve digital access and equity across our county. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Supervisor Chavez for, for, for bringing this forward because what we're dealing with, what we're actually looking at is the generational symptoms of redlining. That's what we're looking at. And it started that day in uh, July 14th, 1846. That was the start date. Okay, but through the generations, with respect to redlining and what happened in South Cipuedes is that it deprived the Chicanos of an infrastructure. And we're seeing the symptoms of that now. So I'd like to center the argument on that because 
these kids, these kids right now, they got mortgage companies, they got car finance companies, and they got prison guards unions betting on these kids because they're two grades behind. Two grades. And they know that the behavioral problems and the, and the intellectual issues that are going to surface within the next few years, it makes them primed and ready for a prison bed. This is a fact. This is. That concludes your speakers, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Joan. For some reason, I could barely hear you, um, but I heard you say concludes the speakers. We're going to take, we're not going to take a vote yet. Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Smitty, and your hands are raised. You're thank muted. you. I thank you. I just wanted to um, thank the Digital Equity Coalition um, for being here today and for all of their leadership. We've been connecting almost every other week for months, and they just have been amazing, these school board members. I just wanted to say thank you to them. Wonderful. All right. I think we're about to take a 5 0 vote. Is there any other comments to be made? Seeing none, Jill, will you please call the vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move on to item 13, consider recommendations relating to county impacts regarding federal immigration reform brought to us by Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. You um, yes. Well, as an immigrant, this referral is very meaningful to me and to many fellow immigrants living in our county. As President Biden has committed to overhauling our nation's immigration system within the first 100 days being in office, he has issued a number of executive orders, proclamations, and memorandums that seek to restore the rights of undocumented immigrants in our country, as well as to restore the hum humanity and dignity. This included, among many, revoking the ban of the people from Muslim countries, not defending the public charge ruling court, counting everyone in the U.S. Census, and stop building a medieval war <laughs> that was supposed to be paid for by Mexico, but also the important task of reinstating the DACA system and DACA program. Despite all these, we still have to create a path to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented immigrants across our country, including an estimated 130,000 plus living in our own county alone. This referral asks to review and analyze legislative proposals on how they may impact immigrants locally. This includes HR 6, HR 1603, H.R. 1177. I'd also like to include U.S. Senator Alex Padilla's Citizenship for Essential Workers Act, Senate S-747, as part of the staff review and analysis of federal legislative proposal relating to immigration. I would first like to thank our good friend Richard Hobbs from the Human Agenda for bringing this critical piece of legislation to my attention as well. Lastly, this referral asked staff to provide the board with information on existing and proposed funding to immigration legal services provider. Due to expected budget shortfall, many of these providers sustained reduction to their contracts. In fiscal year 20, the reduction was over $706,000. With the changing legal environment, the need for legal services for our immigrants is now greater than ever. These services strengthen the safety net for undocumented immigrants who have endured so much throughout the pandemic as high-risk frontline essential workers working in our grocery stores, our restaurants, and jobs where they were the first among many to be laid off. Even though they all pay Social Security, unemployment taxes just like all of us, they are unable to get unemployment benefits or stimulus checks due to their undocumented status. For those who has a green card, to apply for U.S. citizenship Cost seven hundred twenty-five dollars or more, especially in these days when people are unemployed, unable to get financial assistance. This is a huge burden for somebody to do, and all they want to do is become a United States citizen. And this is why funding for immigration legal services providers is so important and more important than ever right now. And I'd like to ask the board to provide the options for how to address these challenges and how much investment can be made based on the need in our community. And I would like to also thank our county's Office of Immigrant Relations in advance for the work on this. 
Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. I'm gonna take that as a motion to approve second. your items A and B, second by Chavez. Um, Jill, if you'll take us to our six speakers at one minute in each. Thank you, one moment. Our first speaker is Karen Schultz. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Um, my name is Karen Schultz. I am the executive director of Step Forward Foundation, which is a legal aid organization in Morgan Hill. Uh, I want to express my support for this recommendation because we've seen firsthand the impacts of the last administration. Uh, and we will continue to feel these impacts for some time due to the extensive changes, uh, such as the fact that 64% of current immigration judges were appointed by the last administration. And new proposals that are working their way through Congress right now will make demand for immigration services skyrocket. Without funding for affordable and free legal aid, desperate immigrants will turn to unscrupulous actors and they will suffer uh, even more. So thank you for hearing this recommendation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Yates. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Robert, if you could unmute, please. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Good morning, President Wasserman and Board of Supervisors. My name is Robert Yabes. I'm with Catholic Charities, South Bay Legal Immigration Services Network, and Santa Clara County Immigration Legal Services Providers Collaborative. I want to share some information about our young individuals who are applying for DACA. We have experienced a huge increase in the request for initial DACA. Two thirds of those who made appointments with our immigration clinics wants help. We have noticed that young applicants who have dropped out of school are now enrolling back to continue their education to complete their high school or GED degrees. Many of them, especially the ones who had family-based immigration remedies, were also able to apply for their green cards. Gaining lawful status are clients' gateway to federal, state, and funded health and employment benefits. Without lawful status, most immigrants must rely on county-funded health care Please help us help our clients fully achieve their dream to become full, full partners in economic recovery and growth. Thank you. Our next speaker is R. Conda. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, I'm Richard Conda, Executive Director of the Asian Law Alliance, and we look forward to working with Zelika Rodriguez and the Office of Immigrant Relations regarding these proposed changes that President Biden is looking at. Uh, we want to also point out that uh, our services are really safety net services, and we thank the board for, for, for supporting us in that effort. Um, immigration status is the gateway to federal state funded health coverage for adults through both Medi-Cal and covered California. Without legal status, many immigrants must rely on county funded health care and rarely have access to the types of jobs that include employer provided health coverage. There's also been a, a dramatic increase in um, from the Muslim community because the Muslim ban has been lifted. Many people are trying to find out more information and there's a lot of uh, need in that area. So we thank you very much for your support and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, to try to offer a bit of a anecdotal item, uh, hopeful anecdotal item for this item. <laughs> uh, the city of San Jose and Zoom, they're really, they, they've had a lot of difficulty in working out uh, language interpretation for their Zoom meetings. Their, Zoom is charging over 300 bucks an hour, basically, to, for language interpretation. I think there is a slight sign in there that this goes way back to the mid 80s with uh, English only translation that are services that, you know, the world had to be English only in this country. And I think it set a really bad precedent that we're stuck with to this day. I think we're trying to negotiate and work that out in San Jose. 
Um, I just wanted to remind ourselves of that terrible policy uh, that, and policies that were developed from that time that we're really trying to work through, make the efforts to consider it and how it can be a, a more inclusive, cooperative time. Uh, Our next speaker is Andrew Kane. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, Supervisors. Andrew Kane with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. I am speaking today in support of the referrals embodied by this agenda item. As Supervisor Lee said it best, and he was echoed by uh, Richard Condon, my colleague, when he noted that these uh, critical immigration legal services are safety net services. And as we continue to move forward towards recovering from the pandemic and focus our goal on an equitable recovery, it is incredibly important that we support these safety net services to help achieve that goal. In addition to the work that we do to help immigrants achieve lawful status, we also help them work towards getting work permits, which are necessary to access many of the state and federal benefits that have been talked about throughout the discussion on this agenda item. Helping a family with uh, undocumented temporary status to get permanent immigration status can lead to a significant rise in income and obtaining lawful status for all of our residents would increase county tax revenue by over $10, uh, $10 million. I thank you for your uh, continued support of our services and look forward to Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, thank you. Um, 1846, July 14th, that is when the Mexican became an immigrant in the country of his own origin. I mean, think about that. That, that, that the exploitation of the labor force has been since that time. Oh, it's morphed into different, different areas in different ways, but the politics and the exploitation and the money and the political leverage that can be had by maintaining the, the, the Mexican as an immigrant status and maintaining that and just playing with it decade after decade after decade. I've been through Prop 187. I was here, I was a citizen in California, man, when Prop 187 came around. You know, and so, you know, me just personally, I hope they strike. I think that's what needs to happen. I think, I think the immigrants just go ahead and just strike, just walk off the, uh, con the construction sites, walk out of the restaurants, walk out of the hotels and then see what this country does. Our next speaker is Christina Dos Santos. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Christina Dos Santos. I'm the Immigration Program Director at Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto, and I want to speak in support of the referrals in the agenda item. Immigration legal services are so key for safety in our community. As we know, domestic violence has increased during the pandemic with an estimate of a 20% increase worldwide. We've also seen that locally and also greater lethality and there's been domestic violence homicides recently in our county. There are immigration protections for just domestic violence survivors like the U visa for survivors of crime, Violence Against Women Act. Based on our experience, unless we're able to extend this help, immigrants facing violence at home are too afraid to call the police or leave their abusers because they fear deportation. We let them know they will not be deported by contacting the police. We help them get work permits so they can actually leave the situation. And we provide wraparound services like social work and custody orders for children and referral to shelters. Thank you so much for your consideration. That concludes our speakers. Thank you very much, Jill. We've got the motion by Lee, the second by Chavez. I'll be supporting as well. Is there any other comments to be made? Seeing none. Joe, will you take the vote? Whoa, whoa, hold on. Mr. Vice Smithian's hand just went up. Forgive me uh, for being slow on the uptake there, uh, Supervisor. Uh, I just, I wanted to underscore something that was said implicitly, perhaps, but not explicitly, because uh, I have gotten questions from constituents. And, and I think the wisdom of the referral from Supervisor uh, Lee is that, um, you know, people said, really, do we need to do more or spend more on this when things have gotten better? And the answer is, yes, it may be counterintuitive, but the fact that there have been changes in the system not only creates a need to respond to those changes, but uh, also creates opportunities that we want to take while uh, they're on the table. So that's the first observation. 
The second thing is I would just ask if the maker and the seconder are amenable, if we could ask staff as when they come back with the report to try and give us some hard data on the level of need for these services and what the capacity is or has been. And I, I absolutely share the view that we uh, need to do more under the current circumstances. So I don't want the request to be misunderstood. Uh, and, um, but I, I, I feel like that's a, a largely anecdotal conclusion I've come to based on talking to people in the community and in this particular field. It, it really would be helpful if we could get uh, something uh, in the way of uh, um, current demand for services versus current supply to grossly oversimplify what I know was a complex ask. So let me just turn to the maker and seconder and ask if they're amenable to including that in the request. Supervisor, yes, me. Yes, yes. Me. yes. yes absolutely. Thank, thank you. I, I just think we'll candidly will be better positioned to make these asks in the future if we have some hard data to uh, use as we make the case. Thank And thank you again, as I say, I think it's a, a very wise uh, step to take. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, your hand still raised? Thank you. I, I just wanted to make one comment. First, I wanted to thank Supervisor Lee for bringing this forward. I And I concur with what Supervisor Simidian just said. The other thing I just wanted to emphasize is that I, I'm really excited about um, the leadership we have in the office of OIR. And so I'm really interested in understanding um, her analysis of both what the need is and also how it's how we uh, better integrate the, um, not, the work's already integrated, but better explain the connection between our safety net services and this body of work. I think that's actually a, a, a piece of work that needs we need to do a little bit a better job um, explaining. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Jill, go for it. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. With that, we move on to item number 14, uh, approval of referral to administration report to the Board of Supes, May 25th, with options for distributing COVID-19 public health order enforcement fines and penalties. And this was brought to us by Sup Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Chavez. Why don't you two start it off? Thank you very much. Um, I'll, and I'll begin by thanking Supervisor Chavez again today, this time uh, for your partnership on the referral before us right now. And I also wanna take a minute to reflect publicly how our county has addressed this pandemic for over a year now, because it's impressive. We were the first county in the country to issue a meaningful stay at home order. We opened childcare for our essential employees within a week of that first order. We scoured the globe and worked with partners to produce PP, to procure PPE. We ramped up testing to levels we had not imagined were possible. We stood up isolation supports for individuals who would have otherwise not been able to stay home following exposure to the virus. We contributed $7 million to purchase laptops and hotspots for children. We enacted residential and commercial moratoria to protect our community from some of the worst of the economic fallout. We invested millions of dollars in rental assistance and $6 million to support small local businesses. We have waived more than $6 million in fees that would have otherwise been collected from small businesses. And we've invested tens of thousands of dollars in education, communication, and connection to communities. We've stood up one of the state's most impressive vaccination distribution systems, and we quickly turn around doses to our residents when we have sufficient supply. Less than 1% of our doses have been wasted, a statistic well above the state average. So to all of our county staff, bravo for this work. You have saved countless lives. So when I read press coverage of the outrage over supposed millions of dollars allegedly collected in business fines and accusations that our county has been hostile to small businesses, it really gives me pause. Yes, Santa Clara County did roll out an enforcement effort of the public health officer's safety protocols. That was done both in the name of public safety 
and in the name of fairness to the vast majority of businesses that were complying with the rules that admittedly worked to their economic detriment. And I stand by our administration on this. We never had the intent to drain millions of dollars from the small business community. We are well aware that it is going to be a tough economic recovery for many, many businesses, and that being fined was a hardship which is exactly why our administration has been working extensively with our small businesses to cure infractions and eliminate or reduce fines. It was reported that nearly $5 million in fines have been levied. The truth is that as of March 1st, less than half a million dollars has been collected as a result of hard work in conjunction with the business owners. There's more detail in the legislative file uh, for this referral that notes the percentages of county businesses against which complaints were filed, the number of violations that were identified after investigations, the percent of violations that were cured prior to fines being levied, and the remaining percentages that were ultimately fined. I've said this many times before, but I wanna reiterate once again, I, along with my colleagues, have been a strong advocate for our small local business community since the onset of the pandemic. Small businesses are the lifeblood of our community. And that's why I'm pro proposing today, along with Supervisor Chavez, that we take the fines that have been collected from businesses, <coughs> pardon me, that breach the safety protocols and put them back into the small business community in the form of grants. In order to do this quickly and to make very clear that the fines were never intended to be county revenue generators, Supervisor Chavez and I are recommending that administration identify a community fiscal agent that has infrastructure in place already to administer a grant program, work with that agent to identify eligibility requirements and transfer the funds for quick disbursement. And I hope to have the, the full support of our colleagues today. Thank you. That was an extremely complete introduction. I'll take that as a motion from Supervisor Ellenberg. Supervisor Chavez. Second. Thank you. We've got a first and a second. Joe, would you please allow our oh, Supervisor Sumidian. Thank you. Just a, a quick connector for this item to uh, the earlier item. Could we ask uh, explicitly that if the maker and seconder are amenable, that staff consider the use of these fines in uh, a program like the one that was contemplated in item number 11? I need to have that considered as, as one of the options. Yes. Thanks. Yes, that Thanks. Was a yes and a yes, I think. Yes. Oh, there's three yeses, so I'm going to take yes for an answer. Supervisor Sumidian, any further comments? Uh, I, I take the hint and the yeses. I'm, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Jill, one minute, please. Our first speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for your words. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Um, it was spoken on the previous COVID item that how can you develop air quality programs for small businesses? I thought that was a really interesting language. And you know, you're really trying to help out. Thank you. Um, I'm a bit on the other side that all through all this time, I wish Santa Clara County took a bit more of a lead uh, that differed from the state a bit and had you had your own a bit more of your own initiative and that you didn't quite follow through with that. Uh, look to Fremont Unified School District and what they're doing right now. They are not opening their schools because it's very possible that with what's going on in Southeast Asia right now, we may have a slight increase through the end of April and May and into June. So be wary, be ready. And uh, boy, just thank you for your work overall. And I hope we're sensitive to all sides of the issue. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dennis King. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Dennis, if you could unmute, please. You're on DK. Dennis, one more time, please, if you could unmute. Seems like we're not able to connect Dennis, Mr. Chair, and that concludes our speakers.
Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm sure Dennis was going to give support. Any other board uh, comments? Otherwise, I'll make a couple and then we'll call for a vote. Um, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I'll be interested. I'll be supporting it because it's a referral that goes forward and administration comes back and reports. To my understanding, the original intent of the dollars collected were to help offset the dollars lost by our weights and measures department. So I am interested in administration's report back as to how this affects their plans one way or another and options going forward. Um, I would ask the motion maker and the seconder, I believe that's Ellenberg and Chavez, to consider that the monies not go to people who have violated. Um, also, that the fines collect, that this is regarding the fines collected, not just the ones issued. I think Vice President Ellenberg brought up a good point about there's four or five hundred thousand dollars collected out of almost six million that have been issued. And I believe it's the motion makers intent and the seconders that all that we're redistributing as grants is the dollars actually collected. I just wanted that that clarified. That is correct. If additional dollars are, are collected, and those would go back as well. But if we don't collect another dollar because we've worked out all the fines, that's that's just fine as well. Super, I'm on board and the seconder is nodding her head, Supervisor Chavez, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, with that, no other hands up. Jill, please call the question. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank Members, you. that brings us, thank you, Jill. That brings us to item 15, approve the referral to administration uh, relating to the current status of unhoused pregnant residents. This is brought forth by Ellenberg and Chavez. And just a heads up to everybody, I hope to get through this one, then county executive and county council. Um, and then we should be around 1230 and we'll break for lunch. So with that, I'm turning to Supervisor Ellenberg and Chavez, item 15. Thanks, President Wasserman. And again, uh, Supervisor Chavez for your support on this referral. And uh, thank you to the rest of our colleagues for considering this request. I'm bringing forward this referral with a sense of urgency to clarify what housing supports and services are available to vulnerable pregnant individuals and families with infants because it is currently unclear what housing supports are available to this population. I had been under the impression that this issue was being largely addressed by the placement of pregnant people into motel beds that have been made available through emergency COVID housing, uh, room key and, and home key specifically. However, I have since learned that these individuals were not being prioritized for housing because the CDC did not recognize pregnancy as a high risk for housing qualification purposes. The HHP, our Valley Homeless Healthcare Plan, provides obstetric and other medical services to approximately 120 unhoused pregnant individuals per year, which is critical, but does not necessarily result in getting those people into housing. And in our county, the VI SPDAT does not prioritize single pregnant individuals for housing because they don't count as families. Considering how long it takes to be placed into transitional housing, it's likely a baby would be born during the wait. Further complicating that, sometimes parents lose custody of their children due to a lack of housing. So if a pregnant person can't qualify as a family before the baby is born, gives birth to their child, but then loses custody because of a lack of shelter uh, or treatment bed space that will take them and the baby, um, not only is that a systemic social problem, but that person still wouldn't qualify for family prioritization under our VI SPDAT um, system. So I hope that, that it is clear to everyone that pregnant residents and those caring for infants should be prioritized for non-congregate housing due to their specific health and developmental needs. Looking more largely, we know that the impact of homelessness jeopardizes the health, early development, and educational well-being of infants, toddlers, and preschool-aged kids. Children who experience homelessness as infants are more likely to experience lifelong health problems, hospitalizations, and emergency department visits as they grow, and this should never be a childhood experience. 
It's critical that we begin to identify the need for services in our county and to invest in early interventions that will provide greater supports to families. Failure to invest in the housing instability of infants and their families will likely result in significant downstream costs for the county, including in emergency healthcare services, developmental supports, and involvement of families in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Uh, with that, I, um, I'm happy to answer questions, uh, take any comments, and that is a motion uh, to approve the item. Thank you, Supervisor. Second. Oh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just, I wanted to ask if the motion uh, asking for the report back could specifically ask staff to comment on what I'll characterize as any lessons learned from the non-congregate sheltering work that we have done that we should replicate or continue in the future. I feel like we've just been through a very uh, demanding situation. We're still in it, unfortunately, for many. Uh, I, I think we learned uh, some lessons about what we can and should do. Uh, and I just wanna make sure those get captured as part of the report back that uh, is being requested uh, here. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Secondary, you agree? I mean, yes, and I, I just wanna add one thing. So first of all, I wanna thank Supervisor Ellenberg for digging in and learning more. That's very, very illuminating. And um, some time ago, we actually did a referral to take a look at VDAT, SPDAT, and how it treated women in general too, in terms of vulnerability on the street. And I, I just would remind staff about that and see where that is in process. But on this particular item, um, I really appreciated the, um, the questions that are on packet page 40. And what I would also, um, as staff takes a look at this, it, it would be important to understand the size of families because I, I and, and whether or not we're seeing single, single parents of, you know, men or women. Um, and just, you know, and I'll think a little bit more about how we think about families writ large, but I just really appreciate Supervisor Ellenberg, um, you bringing this forward and I appreciate the questions by Supervisor Semidia. Thank you. Thank you. We've got uh, one speaker, Jill, go right ahead, please, at one minute. Our first speaker is B. Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman again. Uh, hopefully to try to be quick for this item. Just a simple reminder of the importance of uh, ELI and BLI housing ideas. And what I think is most interesting at this time is the ideas of mixed income and to really consider new options uh, for mixed income. I think it, the time is ripe uh, for, for that consideration and how to uh, ask uh, different ideas from state facilitators, how to allow mixed income ideas and to really consider it for the future of affordable housing ideas. Uh, it can help a lot at this time and accomplish a lot. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. And thank you, Jill. Supervisor Smitting, your hand is still raised. Supervisor Smitting. Sorry, that is a uh, hand that was not lowered in a timely fashion, Mr. Chairman. No worries. All right, we have a motion and a second. We've heard from public speakers. Jill, will you please roll call a vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Travis. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. <laughs> All right, members, we're going to do um, County Executive and County Council now, and I'm just giving Supervisor Simidian a little heads up. I think the only thing we could finish before 1230 would be item 23, which was going to be moved to consent but you asked that it be heard. So I'm uh, hoping we can get that all done and uh, finish at 12.30 and just giving everybody advance notice so they can plan accordingly. Dr. Smith, report from County Executive. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can. 
I wanted to give the board a little bit of an update about what's going on with regard to the budget. Um, the recommended county execs recommended budget will be uh, delivered to you uh, 1st of May, um, hopefully a little bit earlier. We're in the last minute um, section or part of the process where we develop all of our language and make sure that we do all of the proofing. Um, the most uh, significant thing I want uh, the board and the public to know right now is that as we balance this budget, we're unable to predict exactly what the regulations and rules will be for the utilization of the um, rescue funds. So anything related to the rescue fund allocation will come in the revised recommended budget during the June uh, time period. So when you read the recommended budget, you won't see much with regard to the rescue fund. There were some allocations which we felt confident we could make such as testing and healthcare processes, but the rest we needed to get some more background on. Super so uh, it will be a balanced budget. Uh, we will not have any layoffs associated. Actually, um, basically, all the departments will have additional services added. We're trying to take the opportunity of the great action that the board took uh, to balance our structural deficit over the last year in order to reset the organization, reorganize um, structures, and reorganize operations um, as much as we possibly can to become more efficient, more effective all in the context of a recession that's peculiar and a pandemic that's uh, costly um, and an economy that's teetering. So uh, that I want people to be prepared for and we'll obviously discuss in a lot more detail when the budget um, is, is brought before you and when we discuss it. So thank you very much and- uh, Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. James, report from County Council. There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of April 19, 2021, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Members, let's move on to 23. Supervisor Smitty, I'm going to have you open up. You did, did not wish it to go on consent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I I'm uh, happy to support the recommended action. And first, I want to uh, call out uh, as part of a, um, a larger uh, conversation uh, that I appreciate the fact that the staff, uh, I thought, was very uh, thorough and diligent about responding to issues I raised in a letter on this subject that was part of the packet a while back. So thank you for that. The issues I raised about what I hope to see in the study uh, were in fact uh, incorporated. It, it has occurred to me, however, now that we're looking at the proposed scope, that while we're talking about operations in the context of the larger fire safety discussion that we've had, and I'm thinking particularly in terms of some of the um, very good issues that I think Supervisor Chavez has raised along the way, what we, what we don't have here is the uh, ability, I think, uh, to assess what I'll call the the prevention and resilience issues that are part of the larger discussion, particularly about wildfire. Uh, and I I I know that staff uh, moved uh, quickly to try and make sure we didn't delay, and that uh, that had some impact on the total scope of the budget in terms of the procurement that uh, we could do. But I'm, I'm wondering if, in addition to moving forward today, we could ask for some supplemental services that address issues of prevention and resilience as well, without going over the cap that would then require us to rebid the project. So I want to be really clear. I don't want to delay the exercise. I just want to broaden it uh, to be somewhat more uh, comprehensive in its scope. So with that, I'll make a motion and 
uh, with that direction if there's a second. Second from Chavez. Thank you, Supervisor Committee and a motion second by Chavez. And Cindy, uh, Supervisor Chavez, you got your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that's a very good um, addition, Supervisor Smitty. And, and one thing that I would just ask is that, you know, my expectation um, is two, two part. One, I, I know we're going to try to move efficiently. And what I would ask is that two things. Uh, one, that we get an off agenda once the, um, the, the scope is, is um, settled. And that the that there be some benchmarks, and that, that way, if there are other emerging issues that that come out of the study, we're able to respond to those in real time. I, I appreciate the speed issue, and I also think that there may be other issues in addition that that pop up that should be examined. And so that's why I'm seconding the motion and and support the direction. Is that fine with you, Supervisor Smitty? It, it is, and I, I think um, I see uh, Mr. Herzig uh, with his mask on there, I believe, and I just uh, I want to make sure that he's got the clarity he needs in the motion to move forward, stay on track, but expand the contract as directed. Yes, I do. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you. Welcome, Gary. So we have a motion and a second. Jill, would you please uh, bring on our, our um, speaker? Yes, sir. So first speaker is B. Beatman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, hopefully my Zoom won't cut out. Um, thank you for this item. Um, you know, I've given you my own weird warning and worry, <laughs> my own weird worries that uh, of a possible earthquake in the next five years. There's also, you know, very much of a potential of wildfire uh, and, and sea level rise. And those are the three big ones I think Santa Clara County has to really worry about in the next five years. And that's going to keep our budgeting and our questions into a certain focus, I think. And I hope it becomes easier to talk about. It has been to a certain extent. I hope I'm able to add to that without uh, panic, uh, you know, and, and hopefully learn along the way. And uh, it can be a good learning process for all of us at this time. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, Jill. So motion by Samidian, second by Chavez. I don't see another supervisor's hands raised. Wait. Well, we're gonna Supervisor Lee. I keep forgetting about your actual hand. All right. Yes, thank you, uh, <clears throat> President Wasserman. Um, I, I do want to ask a question regarding the community engagement um, to make sure that they are certainly uh, inclusive and accessible. And whether or not these uh, notices going out will be in other languages, in languages other than English. Yes, we will include that in uh, uh, at least four languages. Sure. Uh, thank you, so, so the, uh, the the organizations that you'll be reaching out to uh, re regarding um, these, uh, I'm just suggesting uh, groups like the uh, Asian Pacific Environmental Network, Outdoors, uh, and uh, various representatives from our Native community. So I just want to make sure that those being called out to uh, make sure that reach reach out to it's like a sample of uh, um, organization of peoples of color. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Supervisor submitting your hands raised. Thank you. Only to clarify, I, I, I think implicit in prevention and uh, resilience, the notion of protection is inherent, but I just, I wanted to add that. So uh, in case I wasn't uh, appropriately specific, it was uh, clear for staff what, what they were being asked to do. Much appreciated. Thank you. Sounds like it is. No other hands raised, either electronic or human. Jill, will you please take the vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. All right, fellow board members, we are going Supervisor to- Supervisor Wasserman, may I interrupt for a moment, please? Yes, Rhonda. Before, before, I'm sorry to interrupt, but before we- um, go to lunch, we would like to respond to Supervisor Ellenberg's request um, for the translation of um, 
the speaker that spoke in Spanish. So yes. what we're going to do is we're going to replay what she said, and then our Spanish interpreter is here. So All Jeff, right. why don't we do that now before we break? Thank you. Unmute. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Olivia García. Estoy aquí apoyando a la ley AB 257 para beneficio de nuestras familias porque es muy importante tener un seguro médico que nos proteja para nuestra salud. Gracias. And our interpreter's translation. Hello, good afternoon. This is Olivia García. I am supporting the law AB 257. Uh, because I believe it is very important to provide a, um, uh, a health insurance to protect our families. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have that translation. Thank you. And with that, I will say it's 1230 and we are breaking for lunch. And I will see all of you at one o'clock sharp to resume. And we are going to resume with item number eight, which is going to be heard along with 21. Thank you all, have a good lunch.
That's good. Do we have mic check? One, two, one, two. It sounds normal to me. Thank you.
Excuse me. Bless you. Thank you very much. Madam, belated. <laughs> Madam Vice President. It's one o'clock. How are we doing? It does look like you have all the supervisors. We have everybody there present. We're happy to do roll call when you're ready. All right, let's do roll call. Supervisor Lee. Good afternoon, present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you very you much. Have quorum. Thank you. And members, um, it was suggested and agreed upon that we will hear item um, 21 along with item 8. So we now open up normally with Dr. Cody. Good afternoon, uh, Supervisor Wasserman and Good other morning. members of the board. Um, this is our our traditional COVID update, and I'm joined by the, the team here will update you on where we are in the pandemic. Uh, quite a bit of update about uh, COVID vaccination as well as testing, healthcare, um, outreach enforcement, isolation, and quarantine. Uh, so just to begin, uh, I would say that after a precipitous decline and then some flattening, um, our, the decline, the era of the decline seems to have ended. Um, we're seeing a little bit of a gentle uh, bump up in case counts, which we're keeping a very close eye on. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> uh, but you can see that as the case counts have come down, uh, so too have the disparity, the disparities in, in case rates um, by county section. So we're no longer seeing the dramatically higher rates uh, in East San Jose and Gilroy. They are um, coming together a bit more. Next slide. Um, uh, similarly, the disparities by race ethnicity um, have also been um, have also been decreasing, although uh, some disparities do still remain. And in the next slide, uh, you can see that the deaths uh, are continuing to decline. Um, and in fact, we're now seeing the fewest uh, cases and deaths among long-term care facility uh, residents that we've seen uh, really since very, very early in the pandemic. So, so that, that is uh, really good news. Next slide. The um, number of patients in the hospital uh, is flattening, although still a gentle, gentle decrease. Uh, Dr. Kamal will comment more on that uh, soon. And in the next slide, uh, these are the where we are in the blueprint. Um, and we just today, about an hour ago, um, as is tradition, the numbers are no longer embargoed. So I can share with you that we are still in the orange tier, um, but our numbers are a little bit higher. So our our um, unadjusted case rate, so if you follow that, um, the, the dotted line, our unadjusted case rate is six and a half, and our adjusted case rate is 3.2. So we're up from an adjusted case rate of 2.4, but we're still in the orange. And in the next slide, you can also, uh, so this is, we're still getting the maximum discounts uh, for our adjustments uh, because of our testing. Our testing rate remains well above the state median. Um, it's declining across the state 
and really across the country. But I would say here now we're we're holding steady in our county. And Dr. Fenster Scheib will give more of an update uh, on our testing. So the next slide you can see where we are with the positivity rate. This also has picked up a bit. Uh, our positivity rate is now 1.2%. Um, so we're back to where we were uh, sort of two, two weeks ago. Uh, in the next slide, the testing positivity rate for our lowest HPR quartile um, has also ticked up again. Uh, so that is 2.2. Um, a bit, so we're back in the, uh, I think that puts us in the orange uh, on, the, on the state blueprint. Uh, and that concludes my update. And I'll now pass uh, the presentation to Dr. Fenster Scheib uh, for an update on COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Cody. And okay, we've got our first slide up. So this, um, starting off talking a little bit about our current course as we are seeing it now and, and some of the challenges. So um, we're doing very well in, in our vaccination and we'll see that in a second, but I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention the variables that are really going to impact um, the rate of our vaccinations in the county. And <clears throat> just to run down them again, our vaccine supply, uh, which is improving, uh, but again, uh, into the future, we don't really know how that will continue. Uh, we still have major disparities and equity gaps. We'll see more about that in a minute. And we know that there exists vac vaccine hesitancy in many populations and many parts of our communities, which really has to be addressed. Um, the variants, again, um, are, are definitely an issue as we start to see more of those. And it's a race against the variants in getting people vaccinated. Also, um, the issues around people showing up for their second uh, dose is a variable, although th that number is pretty low at this point. And then the issues around uh, vaccinating uh, younger individuals. And we are still awaiting uh, an approval for the Pfizer vaccine to be used in the 12 to 15 year of age group. And um, Pfizer has asked for an amendment to their EUA from the FDA, and we expect that any week now. So if all of that um, were not a factor, all of those were not factors, we could reach full vaccination coverage by late June. Just looking at our um, estimations here, we have, again, everybody is eligible, 16 and older. Um, and right now, those with one dose, um, we're up to 58.3%, so that's great. Um, that equals a total number of about 671,000 people to reach that 100% goal of everyone 16 um, plus to be fully vaccinated. If we just assume our current rate of vaccines, and again, that could vary dependent on many factors, um, but we're currently at about 27,000, that would put us um, at about 25 days com uh, to complete where everyone is receiving at least one dose and then an additional 28 days for everyone then finishing up with their second doses um, three to four weeks later. Again, that's the best possible um, event, and I, and I don't think that's going to happen given all of those other variables that we talked about. But I just wanted to know, show you what, what type of uh, trajectory we are on. Next slide. So this is a, a picture of our dashboard, and you can see that on the top left, we have done 939,000 um, first doses, and we're soon approaching 1 million. That will be something to celebrate in a way, um, probably in the next couple days. Um, again, 58.3% of our population having received at least one dose, and also nearly a third of our population uh, fully vaccinated. So that's great. And then you can look at the bars again. The blue bars are the first dose, the green bars are the second dose, and the pink bars are the Johnson & Johnson, which again, we have on pause for the moment. I just point to you that really tall bar there on April 15th, we did nearly 40,000 vaccines in one day. Um, so at a 27,000 per day, that's a seven day average. So again, some days are lower and some days are lower. Next slide. Um, we thought you would like to see also kind of looking at vaccine uh, coverage by county and you can quickly see the, the darker the darker greens are the higher rates 
or the higher um, percentages of people being vaccinated. And you can see that the, um, the, the Bay Area here is doing quite well. And then you can see the rest of the state and how it's faring, but the Bay Area is doing quite well. Next slide. And this again is the vaccinations by day. And you can see um, at, out at the end, um, the total doses that are, the, which is the seven day rolling average in gray is really uh, spiking up. That's because again, a, a lot of those are first doses. That's the blue line, the blue squiggly line going up. The purple bars are that Johnson & Johnson. So they were on a nice trajectory, but with the pause, um, they are now again, dwindling to, to none, basically, because we're still on hold. We expect that um, the uh, committee of the CDC will be meeting on Friday of this week, and um, hopefully they will come up with a plan uh, to, to address the issues around the pause of the, vac of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Next slide. And then this is basically the same graph, except it's just showing the county health system and again, you can see the tremendous spike that we are seeing also in first doses, all of the blue bars. And, um, and, and so those numbers are increasing very nicely given the amount of additional vaccine that we have um, received. Next slide. And this is basically from the dashboard, but again, breaking down by age group, the total percentage of those vaccinated, and then further looking at the um, breakdown by race and ethnicity. And again, the first part is the 16 and older, uh, which we've talked about, but when you look at the total average at 58%, when you start looking again at the breakdown uh, by race and ethnicity, you can still see um, the Latin Hispanic population being uh, much lower. We're still, we're working, we're all working very, very hard to close that gap, but it continues. I would point out that um, just recently, April 1st is when we opened to 50 years and, and older, and we have um, made it to seven, almost 71% of people 51, 50 years of age or older. So that was, that's great. But again, still some, dis still disparities that you can see on the slide. Next slide. And this is just a trend uh, graph over time showing you the same issues around uh, the various demographics of um, the race and ethnicity moving forward in time. You can see um, the, the dates of 4-1 and then 4-15 when we opened it up, the top line, the Asian population has really kind of um, gone very quickly in getting, their, uh, getting the population vaccinated. Um, and then you can see the others at a lower level. Again, concern about the Latino population, which is the lowest green line at that same 30%. Um, and the gap just doesn't look like it's closing very much. In fact, it looks like it could be slightly larger. So again, we're working very hard at it. And I think, um, again, more discussion on that. Um, of those 67,000 that I mentioned, or 670,000 to finish the uh, everybody being vaccinated over 16, uh, nearly 300,000, about 292,000 of those are in the Latino uh, community. Next slide. This is always a very interesting slide showing you um, the a weekly vaccine given by various providers in our community. And you can see the first off, the strikingly large blue bar, which represents the county health system, again, in the, with the advent last week of getting a lot of the HRSA allocated vaccines. And then at the bot, at the lower than that um, of note, that light salmon colored bar are the retail pharmacies. So they are really picking up. The green bar is Kaiser. Um, the total for that week, I asked them to run the numbers for all of the providers for last week of the 12th was 183,000 doses given in oh. our county by all providers, 183,000. Next slide. This is a look over two weeks, basically looking at um, a geographical um, coverage of our vaccines. Again, the darker, the darker blues and the next color blues are the higher percentages and um, at, at the, the darker blues being 50 to 79%. Um, and you can see the improvement over time. The, the, uh, the map on the left is as of the end of March, and then two weeks later on the right. And you can see that there is increased coverage in South County, 
on the west side, some, and and then the a little bit on the north side, but the the east side again with some improvement. But again, you can see still that the numbers are not as high as some of the other communities. And then finally, the last slide is an interesting slide that um, our data people put together. This relates to vaccinations at Levi Stadium, and it's basically looking at how far people are willing to drive to get there and how far they have come. The green dot basically are representing the people that have traveled five miles or less, the orange uh, people that are traveling 10 miles or less, and then the yellow um, is 15 miles or less, or 15 miles or less. So basically people are coming from all over the community. Those red dots outside of the graph itself, outside of the map itself, um, are people coming from out of county because they work, in, hopefully in Santa Clara County. Um, okay, so I'm I'm done with my slides, and I will turn them over for an equity update to uh, Rocio Luna. Thank you, Dr. Fenstershy. So our our mobile vaccination efforts continue to focus on reaching the medically vulnerable and communities hardest hit by COVID. We're still filling gaps in needs uh, of residents in skilled nursing facilities across the county. And of course, for uh, residents that meet eligibility criteria for in-home vaccination. Our place-based walk-up uh, no appointment clinics are, are continuously scheduled in locations with high positivity and low vaccination rates. This week, um, as you'll note, we'll be at various places of worship and a few other places. We expect to continue to vaccinate egg workers, <clears throat> mostly in South County, with seasonal workers expected to be in our county beginning in May. Next slide. This graph illustrates that our mobile vaccination efforts uh, focused on uh, those hardest hit communities are effective in reaching those folks that live in East San Jose and South County to the geographic areas that have experienced high rates of COVID. Next slide. And finally, this, uh, this slide, uh, this map basically shows the concentration of our mobile vaccination efforts, which you'll note have been primarily in South County and East San Jose. I'll now pass it over to Mr. Darrow to tell us more about our outreach efforts. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Good afternoon. Um, I, so I'm gonna provide a brief update on our field outreach campaign work as it relates to vaccines. I, I did wanna start with our residential outreach program, which is a coordinated campaign in collaboration with Groundworks Working Partnerships, Community Health Partnership, and now Community Solutions. This slide mentions a March launch date, but that is really just when our expanded and coordinated residential campaign started. That's where we, we've been monitoring in a more systematic way, the conversations that we've been having at the doors and focusing more on vaccine education and scheduling. The, the overall outreach work, of course, as you know, started long ago. It started last year and includes business and residential outreach, as well as engagement at, at many different community locations. So just wanted to clarify that. But but again, I did want to start with the sort of more recent expanded residential outreach work. Um, since March 9th, our teams have been canvassing seven days a week in our hardest hit communities and census tracts. And so in the first 30 days of that expanded work, our teams have knocked on more than 42,000 doors and talked to nearly 19,000 individuals. And in addition to general COVID education and vaccine education and scheduling, and some testing um, information. We also ask residents for their pledge that they'll be vaccinated when it's their turn and that they'll follow, continue to get tested as needed and follow all uh, COVID safety protocols. So more than 90% of the folks who we've talked to, if we can get to that part of the conversation where we ask for the pledge, more than 90%, about 92% are willing to sign that pledge. And so of course we're circling back with those who were not eligible when we originally talked to them, not eligible to be vaccinated. And, and trying to book those appointments. Uh, just a few other notes on what we've been hearing at the doors. Um, we're seeing quite a large number of folks now who are reporting that they have already been vaccinated or that they have an appointment scheduled. So that is good news. Um, it's actually in the past week, it was more than 50% who were in that category. Um, and you know, it, that, that, when you're talking to folks at the doors, it's always possible that there's a little exaggeration there if they, you know, some percentage of that is probably folks just saying what they think you want to hear, but I think a lot of folks have been starting to get vaccinated, of course, as Marty was indicating. 
Uh, for the most part, the number of people who state that they're not likely or they're undecided to be vaccinated has been re a relatively low number. It's about 8% of the people that we've talked to. But we are starting just this past week now with expanded eligibility, we're starting to see a little bit of hesitancy, I think, among the younger adult population. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be fear or kind of concern based. It seems to be a little bit more apathy or just not wanting to take the time to get vaccinated. It's not a huge number of people, but it is a theme that we're starting to see. So we'll need to be monitoring that and addressing that. Next slide, please. This slide shows where we focused our residential outreach. The darker green areas show the census tracts where our teams have knocked on the vast majority of doors. So in some cases, all of the doors in those census tracts. And then the lighter green areas show where we've covered part of the, that ground. Um, back on March 9th, we shared with the board our top priority census tracts based on lower vaccination rates and especially the, the higher COVID impacts. And so those were East San Jose and South County for the most part. Uh, as of the first month of this campaign, we've reached 63% of the doors in our top 30 priority census tracts. Um, it's important to note though that when we, at some of the time when we've talked to folks, we, we either haven't necessarily because of the supply shortage had vaccine appointments available or um, as you know, during that period, a lot of people were not yet eligible. So we are circling back this week to our tier one census tracts and trying to make sure that we can book appointments for those who, who didn't have access previously. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, the residential outreach program is just part of the work. Uh, a lot of other field campaign efforts are underway. I just wanted to share a few quick highlights um, that, that are happening either this week or recently. We're starting the do some uh, scheduling fairs at Catholic churches focused on Spanish language mass. We piloted this program this past Sunday at Our Lady of Refuge in East San Jose. And so this, this, and we'll be doing more of that. This is in addition to all of the clinic sites that we've been setting up at churches. I think uh, Dr. Luna was mentioning, I think there was six of those actually happening this week. So trying to work with the faith community and that has been a success. Uh, we're having ongoing vaccine scheduling assistance being offered now at the Story Road, the Public Health Story Road location on Mondays and Fridays uh, from 10 to 4 p.m. Our South County door-to-door -door COVID testing is launching next week. We've been doing, in partnership with Nueva Vida, we've been doing this in East San Jose for quite a long time now in partnership with uh, our Promotora partners at Meta, but that'll be in South County as well. Uh, we have a vaccine registration assistance um, event. At what we're actually going to the food distribution event that Buena Vista Mobile Home Park is holding in Palo Alto uh, tomorrow and, the, and Thursday. So we'll be helping schedule folks at those events. We've been conducting regular call center events with Telemundo and Univision um, to assist with vaccine registration. So we have our call center on ready uh, when people call in after it's been promoted by those media outlets and we're scheduling folks through that mechanism. We are training 30 new phone banking staff this week in partnership with the Public Health Institute. They'll be calling uh, individuals in our highest priority areas. We will provide those lists to the Public Health Institute and they'll be making those calls. And then we, we all also always wanna make sure that no one leaves our mobile vaccine sites uh, without a, an appointment or at least an option to book an appointment. And when we, you know, those are walk-in sites uh, usually. And so we have seen at some of our sites, you know, wristbands get, we run out of wristbands. And so we wanna just make sure that we have scheduling staff on site at all times to be able to book people into other options. And then finally, our business engagement team which has been focused the past few weeks on COVID and vaccine education and scheduling at food service locations is now as eligibility expands, expanding the type of businesses that they're doing deep outreach to so that they can be booking vaccine appointments as well. So personal care services, uh, smaller retail outlets, laundromats and other businesses are gonna be a, a real focus this week. Um, next slide, final slide. And then as you know, the county had, had established these priority appointment slides, slots. Just wanted to flag that um, our outreach does seem to be continuing to reach the communities that we're trying to reach. This slide shows the breakdown uh, based on race and ethnicity of who is getting into those appointments. And it's about 55% of the appointments being booked are among our Hispanic or Latino community. So it's about 13,000 appointments booked total so far. So. 
obviously there's still a lot of work to do. Marty outlined those numbers earlier, but this, this is one piece of how we're trying to close the gap. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Fenster Scheib to talk about testing. Thank you, Brian. And I just run through a few slides to update you on our testing. In our community, you can see that our testing numbers are sl slightly ticking up a little bit again. So it looks like we've stabilized. Um, our, as Dr. Cody mentioned, our positivity rates um, have really, really dropped, but are just starting to uh, edge up ever so slightly. We've, we've actually been down to just at about 1% or slightly under, and now we're um, up to 1.2, 1.3%. So that's something to watch. Next slide. This is basically just showing you the testing numbers uh, by geographical location. Uh, you can see the east side and south county numbers have dropped considerably about the same levels. Um, all other counties. Dr. Marty, Dr. Marty. You're, Marty, you're getting hard to hear. Yep. Oh. Huh? That's okay. Good. I'll talk, I'll lift up my mask and move out of the way of everyone else and um, continue. Is this better? Great, yes, perfect. Okay, so um, yeah, so that the east side and south county numbers have dropped. The rest of the, the rest of the county numbers, it looks, it looks like it's really increased. What, what it looks like it is though, what we're seeing is that up in the Stanford area, they're doing a lot of testing of faculty and students um, on a pretty regular basis. Uh, by the color lab. And so those numbers, I think, represent um, all of that testing that's going on at the Stanford University. Next slide. And this is, again, positivity by, by location again. Um, everything is pretty close. There's that all the rest of the county other than East and, and South County being at about one and then um, higher again, as we've always seen in the east side and the south county. However, the numbers, the percentage positivity is certainly much lower than it has been um, in the recent past. Next slide. And um, we usually show you a, a slide of just the fairgrounds, but we, we basically combine fairgrounds with our other community sites, including our city sites and our pop-ups to give you one picture. And, um, and again, the numbers have dropped off um, in general, but have somewhat stabilized. The percentage of positivity is uh, really still ticking up slightly at 1.3. Next slide. And that's the um, schedule for the next week, for this week and the rest of the next week. Uh, just reminding everybody there's plenty of testing that's available. It seems like people are still testing, but they need to really be encouraged to continue to test as they're waiting to be vaccinated. So we don't want people not to continue to be tested. And then also to continue testing, even if they're vaccinated, but are out in the public or are working on the front line. And again, the fairgrounds is operating seven days a week and Tuesday through Friday hours till 6.30 p.m. Okay, I'm done and I will turn it over to Dr. Simone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fisher Scheid. So in terms of healthcare preparedness, our COVID hospitalizations are stable. As Dr. Cody said, we're at approximately 100 uh, patients in the hospital and are seeing pretty much no change in the last week or so. Next slide. Um, in terms of new hospitalizations, that number also has been going up and down. We did have a small spike for one day last week, but looks like that has not been sustained. Furthermore, the length of stay, which had been trending up slightly, now looks like it's stable. And once again, that's one of the metrics that we could use to determine whether hospitalized patients are sicker in any way, although there are other reasons for that as well. Uh, next slide. And other metrics of severity also look uh, mostly flat. Uh, the percent of all cases that get hospitalized is still in the neighborhood of 6% which is lower than the 10 to 12% we had seen earlier on in the pandemic. And the percent of all hospitalized cases that go into the ICU had trended upward um, somewhat alarmingly, but once again has come down. So all in all, we don't think there is any significant change in these signals to indicate more disease severity. 
However, given what is going on in the Midwest, given what's going on worldwide, we're going to continue to monitor these very closely to make sure that we are aware of any changes that occur. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. Next slide. We continue responding to complaints and concerns that are filed in our portal at sccovidconcerns.org. And as of April 11th, we've received over 9,200 concerns, and we have been continuing to resolve the vast majority of those through phone, email, warning, response, uh, where only a, a small number, 30% or so, uh, lead to an on-site inspection. We've issued 754 notices of violation, and consistent with the past few reports, the top three reported sectors continue to be uh, food retail, retail trade, and gym and fitness. Next slide. And as you can see, the total volume by day coming in, the good news is that we're uh, still relatively low in the number of concerns that are coming through. Um, but on the left-hand side at the bottom, you can see that food retail continues to account for a much higher volume than even retail trade, uh, which is where a lot of our most vulnerable workers are working. Uh, next slide. And I'll turn it over to Pong Cal. Thank you. Next slide, please. I will be providing the status update on the isolation and quarantine support program. So from the start of the pandemic through April 15th, 2021, the INQ program has helped nearly 2,217 persons, including persons without a permanent home to isolate or quarantine in hotels. We've provided supportive services and over $892,000 in groceries and other necessities to help over 4,200 households to safely isolate or quarantine at home. And we've distributed over $9.3 million in direct rental and financial assistance to nearly 4,500 households. Next slide, please. And um, this graph here shows that the program trend continues to mirror the number of cases countywide on a seven day rolling average. Next slide, please. And since we last reported to the board between April 1st and April 15th, we have helped 27 households to safely isolate in a hotel. We've provided assistance to over to 143 households with in-home support services and we've supported 125 households with financial assistance. And all of these households received assistance within the first 24 hours of when the re referral is made to the INQ program. Next slide, please. And this graph shows um, the one of our partnerships with the social services agency where we refer um, referrals are submitted to SSA for additional services. Um, these referrals are submitted directly to an eligibility worker, and um, he or she will then follow up to help clients apply for Medi-Cal, CalFresh, CalWorks, and CalFresh. Um, next slide, please. And finally, we are also partnering with the City of San Jose and community partners to provide emergency rental assistance program details to our client. And I will now turn it back to Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith. We're happy to take any questions that you may have. Oh, Dr. Cody. Yes. Okay, good enough. I, I heard her say transferring back to Dr. Smith, so I was waiting for, for his voice. <laughs> well, I'm right. happy to, if you have questions for Dr. Smith, he's also of course, no, that's, happy to answer. No, that, that's <laughs> fine. We keep our doctors separate. All right, looking at any board members with hands raised. I don't see any at the moment. I see Supervisor Ellenberg. We'll start with you this time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the staff as always for, for the very thorough report. I wanna um, first just share some, some quick generalized anecdotes. I've been hearing both from lots of constituents and then just people that, um, you know, that, I'm, that I'm friends with or somebody knows somebody. And to a one, every person has described what a positive, smooth, easy, experience uh, getting a vaccination has been, regardless of the of the site, of whether it was appointment or a walk-in, um, just consistently, everything ran very smoothly. Every person was very kind. It was very organized. I'd moved through it in a, in a very comforting way. So I just want to um, ex 
condense lots and lots of compliments into those statements. And thank you very much. Um, literally, I have not heard from anybody who had a negative experience uh, going to get a vaccine. Um, I'm very glad to hear that the new federal doses um, coming into the county are allowing for many new uh, first appointments in the past week. Uh, I don't know if this is for Dr. Fenster, Fensterscheib or, or for Dr. Cody, but what steps are being taken uh, to make sure that we have enough supply three to four weeks from now for the large number of second doses that will be due while still keeping uh, first dose opportunities available? Okay, so they took me. Sorry, <clears throat> I did all. I'm happy to hear from you, Dr. Smith. <laughs> um, well, as the board knows, we did get a substantial shipment from through our HRSA connection because of our FQHC qualifications, and we continue to get <clears throat> uh, pretty much our standard allocation from the state. Um, in terms of making sure that we have enough for second doses, we've on, been on the phone actually today and yesterday with HRSA to confirm their commitment to second dose allocations. I don't have a final answer on that, but it seems likely that they will um, commit to providing those second doses. Um, we also are working out the logistics with the inventory that we currently have to make sure that everything, all the second doses are covered. Uh, we still have, as you know, the J&J &J on pause and we have a relatively small <clears throat> allocation still in our refrigerators of that that we're holding obviously until we get an answer, but that also works into our calculations. So we're, tenuously held together at least for the next uh, week and a half to two weeks, um, presuming that we do get the second dosages. Um, there's also news on another front that we're getting communications from the TPA that some areas of California <clears throat> are having more hesitancy than others. <clears throat> and because of that, some counties are ending up with larger reserves and they're looking to recapture those and redistribute them. So we did get a question from the TPA, TPA uh, about whether we could take some more vaccine, which we certainly told them we could. Um, right. So we're trying everything we can to get as much vaccine, as many doses into the county as possible and to keep our system going and of course the biggest problem with um, the delivery system is the logistics and as you saw we're able to get up to 40,000 a day but that is a huge effort and we can't maintain that effort if we aren't sure that we're going to be getting the vaccine so it's a bit of a chicken and egg proposal. Right. Um just to make sure that I can answer the question um, when it's asked of me, knowing that our our HRSA allocation is dropping by two thirds, we, we are still confident that the people that got their first doses from amongst that three hundred thousand dollar supply, three hundred thousand doses supply, will get their second without compromising new first doses. Yes, uh, the issue there that, quote, saves us is that um, we didn't have sufficient time to ramp up our delivery system all the way up to the 40,000 a day. So we didn't use all of the 330,000 that we got um, as yeah. rapidly as we could have if we were assured that more was coming. So that leaves us with some in reserve to be able to use for second doses. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks very much, I appreciate that. Um, I want to hearken us back to contact tracing for just a moment. Uh, during, the, during the surge in the late fall and winter, uh, some of the contact tracing activities had to be adapted and prioritized. 
and we haven't discussed uh, case investigation or contact tracing for quite some time. Do we still, are we still doing contact tracing um, at any level? If we are, how might it be characterized and what, what is envisioned in the coming months or year uh, for this aspect of the response as more and more people are vaccinated? Thanks, Supervisor. This is Dr. Cody. Uh, we are still doing case investigation and contact tracing, um, much as the way that we've been doing it all along. Of course, during the winter, we scaled back to a, a lighter touch because the volume was so high, um, but now we're back to complete um, case investigation and contact tracing. Um, oh, wow. We do. We don't know. There's lots of conversations with the state about when when we might transition to a different model. I think we're we're not ready yet. It turns out to be quite useful when we do our case and contact investigations, and then later uh, learn that a case uh, was infected with a variant of concern. Then we've already collected a very helpful information. Of course, we never know that at the time of the investigation, but that turns out to be um, a, a new uh, use case for the case investigation and contact tracing that, of course, we uh, hadn't predicted uh, when we started a year ago. That's so interesting. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And it would be useful, I think, to get a, a report occasionally just on the, the success there, how many, what percentage of the people are you are you reaching? Are we improving on people um, being more open and willing to give their contact um, information? The, the things that you were reporting on months ago. Sure. Um, thank you. That would that would really be appreciated. Um, and then uh, finally, just a question about uh, recovery planning. Um, at the uh, last last report, in conjunction uh, with the the recovery efforts report, I'd requested an overview of health issues that may have been exacerbated by the pandemic and how that should guide board planning in the coming year. And I'm wondering if we, if the board can expect to see an initial review of those downstream issues or concerns at the May 4th meeting. Yes, we'll be able to give you some initial concepts at May 4th. Um, yes. <laughs> there you go, there you go. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's all I have, President Wasserman. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I thank you very much for the, all the amazing work. And um, I wanted to just say to Dr. Kamal, I, I really appreciate us keeping our eye on the um, health and hospital infrastructure. For thank you, thank you for that report. I, I wanted to start with a bigger question just for a moment about the variants and the trends we're seeing nationally and the work we're doing locally. I know when um, Dr. Smith or Dr. Cody, you get a question like this, we always tell people rush to the rush to get vaccinated because we're, we're um, in a race against the variants. Um, but I wonder if, as you're looking across the nation, um, if there are any lessons to be learned there that that we should be thinking about now or if what you're seeing across the country um, should or could be changing the way we're communicating with people locally about getting their vaccine yeah those are really good questions um i think that you're, you're right we are still in this race the, the variants versus the vaccine. And I think that the HRSA allocation uh, puts us in an excellent position uh, to, to get a few lengths ahead. Um, I'm really, really relieved by that. Uh, we're doing a couple things with regard to variants um, that are unfortunately uh, a little unique. Uh, and that is we are doing more surveillance. We have more capacity in our lab than many other local labs. So we're able to see and spot variants um, perhaps earlier. Um, and, and really what that does is give us information to better understand um, how they're spreading and, and how, wide, you know, how widespread they might be. It, it's imperfect. And that in turn, I think we can use in our messaging um, to, to encourage people to get, to get vaccinated and also to make the case 
for why, uh, why during this transition period, uh, we still need to wear masks and practice social distancing and stay away from crowded places, particularly indoors and all of those, why all of those measures are still important. Um, I think that the messaging uh, is more challenging now than it, than it has been uh, because, you know, a year plus in, it's very human to want to uh, relax a little bit. And in many respects, you know, in some, some scenarios we can, uh, and in others uh, we can't uh, because we don't have a population level immunity. So I think that the, um, a little long-winded, but I think the variant story kind of um, maybe can help people understand uh, why the prevention measures um, are are still necessary. All those layers are still necessary. You know, um, one request that I would make, um, Dr. Cody, just as you all think about um, reporting in the in the coming weeks, I do think there there is value in us being able to explain the, the variants that we're seeing in our community. And, uh, I, and I think you raise a really good point that there, just a really good point about how helping people understand that may, may help people who are still on the wait and see side, less interested in waiting and seeing how that, you know, I, I don't, we don't know that. I mean, I think we're trying, we know there's no one way to do this. We're gonna try lots of ways, um, but I'd be, I think that might be something worth you all discussing and determining whether or not there's value in us being able to share that information more robustly as both as part of this report, but also helping us think about our communication a little bit. So yeah, I just wanted to make, make sure you all know there is now on the dashboard a variant report. Um, so you yes. can see the, the numbers yes, as, as a start. I yeah, I think that's a really th thank you for that. And um, and we try, and I I really have been ex continuing to explore our website because there's just so many nooks and crannies in it, and we try to use that. I, I guess what I've been thinking a little bit about is if there's an infographic that we can use to, to just to help people understand why we care about variants. And um, but I'll give more thought to that as well, Dr. Cody. I appreciate that. One other um, area that I'm really interested in, um, and that has to do with how we're tracking who we're vaccinating. And there's a very good census, it's a data census track map that we have under our dashboard that has the COVID, va COVID vaccine vaccinations by census track. And what's interesting to me about the map, I think it's a very, very helpful tool but what's interesting to me about the map is that you can look, um, I think the highest uh, census track I've seen, it's a very small census track, has a 75% of the, the residents who've received, I think uh, with a, at least one vaccine, I think that's the highest one I found. Oh, well actually a 95% one too. Um, and it's census track 51160. I think our, the lowest census track I've seen has been probably in the, the high teens or early 20s, like maybe 22%. I, I raise that because what I would like to recommend is that um, for future reports that we use the census track map um, to demonstrate our where we are in our process. And one of the reasons I think this map is so critical is that I think it really helps refine where we're where we are really trying to to work and um, and make sure that people are getting vaccinated. As an example, I think the door to door and the community work being done in Gilroy really demonstrates, you know, that concentrated area. I'm sure, Mike, you've you've been looking at this too. Really shows the community work, the, the all the layers of the work that it really seen an accomplishment there and parts of East San Jose as well. And then there's still these census tracts that are just really hard to dig into. Um, but the reason I'm raising this is that one of the challenges with looking at the data that says this is how many Hispanics or Latinos we've vaccinated, so many African-Americans we've vaccinated, is that the other number is so high that I think we're going to have to overlay the 
in a, in a, again, in a more explicit way, the locations that people are coming from that are being vaccinated and not solely rely on the, um, these other numbers. And I wonder if you all have had that conversation too about the high number of others that are, that come up in our, our numbers of vaccinations. Yeah, we spent a lot of time uh, looking at the vaccination data, particularly uh, by race, ethnicity, and uh, and trying to understand for those coded as other or unknown um, why and what that might mean. And it's additionally complex, of course, because uh, people are getting vaccinated in several different systems. So there's a lot of different systems that are collecting it and putting data into care. Um, and we've noticed some patterns uh, around around that with some some systems um, uh, entering data in a way where we're actually missing a, a lot of information about race ethnicity. Uh, and I think this is actually a statewide problem. So um, we have to, as you know, do some work around to try to understand uh, who we're who we're reaching and where we and where we have gaps. Uh, and then on top of that, trying to visualize it uh, by geographic area um, is an additional uh, layer of complexity. Yeah, it really is. And I, and like I said, I appreciate the map um, that we have in the, you know, the census tract map, but I do think we ought to be using that and, and um, concurrently explaining where we are with race and ethnicity. Cause I, I think it's very, it tells a more complete story than seeing those two um, separate. Um, one last uh, point that I wanted to raise, um, and that is that we've gotten a lot of feedback from the advocates for the, um, you know, people with disabilities. And one of the concerns they have is that as we've been speaking about equity, we're not really lifting up the voice voices of those who are disabled. And what I would just want to recommend is that um, we as we look at our outreach programming that we're coordinating with the disabled community, what they're really interested in seeing is whether or not we can track the number of people who are disabled that are getting um, that are that are getting um, vaccinated. And I know we have some drive up sites and we're working on a lot of those different um, elements, but I, I would really like us to to speak with some of those advocates and better understand of what they think is missing and and how we can report out um, that information, if it's even possible to do, I don't know, but I'd like us to take a crack at that. Yeah, we'll have to talk with the advocates and see what we can do best. Um, the problem with CARES reporting is that it doesn't include that kind of data. So, you know, right there, it eliminates the possibility of getting that data from basically half of the cases um, but we could ourselves try to get some concept by doing surveys at our vaccination sites um, because we do obviously do have the opportunity to collect information and we're collecting information for the HRSA vaccinations already. So we'll uh, have to get back to you on that one. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the co complexity there. And um, I do wanna just make sure that that we're at least figuring out a way to acknowledge the, um, really to acknowledge the community. And and actually, um, I wanted to just close that, that with just a very sincere um, recognition of the leadership and work of the entire team. Um, I, I know, and I, I, I got an email from somebody saying, you know, you keep, you keep acknowledging um, people and there's still so much that's not being done. And I, I, and what it reminds me is that, um, you know, we're, this is such a race against some, so many things, right? The variance and, and apathy and fear and disinterest and all of those things that were really, that all of the, those thoughts and emotions that, that our community has, but I really just want to acknowledge that um, I am ever amazed at what um, you all have been able to do and am really, really grateful. And, you know, even these reports, they're, they're very exciting. And I know every time you come forward, we, we say, and there's another thing. 
but I do want to just say thank you. And one thing that I was struck by is there was a letter to the editor about us not doing anything relative to people who were homebound. Um, while just a couple weeks earlier, we kicked off our homebound program. Um, and it's a reminder to me that we need to continue to over communicate. I know it feels redundant sometimes, but you know, as much as we can continue to push the messages out and make it, you know, make it possible for people to get vaccinated and figure out how to do that, the better I know we, we all know we're going to be. But I just want you to just want to say, I, I know it's hard not to get tired. <laughs> and we've all been at this for a while, but, um, you know, keep it up. And the, the results are really amazing. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Supervisor Thank Lee. you for that input. Appreciate that um, a lot. I think uh, from a staff perspective, the one thing that we're really probably not as good at as we'd like to be is bragging about ourselves. So appreciate it when the board does. Good deal. Supervisor Lee, if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I definitely echo that point of what a great work our uh, team and led by you all. Um, Dr. Cody and Dr. Tenshak for all that great work. Um, and I just want to re re <laughs> say that again, it's, uh, it, it's rare that people say good things. Uh, and we have actually been receiving emails from folks who've been vaccinated either at the fairgrounds or uh, over at the Levi Stadium. Actually people are saying, wow, you guys are really amazing how you can do this a logistic effort. So I just wanted to reiterate that and uh, make sure to get back to the folks who's working every day to make this happen. Um, one of the questions I want to uh, come back to uh, is regarding the uh, issue of the, the disparity. Um, and I know we've been doing outreach uh, in various community in different languages based on our previous referral. I just want to uh, double check to see uh, if, if that effort do continue like on TV ads or uh, radio ads and whatnot to make sure that uh, we are working hard on getting the word out, number one. Uh, number two is also uh, how um, we are able, because based on the, the diagram, I mean, the, the sorry, the geographic uh, layout it really looks great that like say the most impacted area like Gilroy or uh, East San Jose, clearly uh, those numbers have been significantly improved in the past months. So I just want to double check to make sure that we are still hitting hard on those uh, uh, areas, uh, especially in terms of uh, outreach uh, and the other thing is about uh, the, the times, whether we're able to add more days on the weekends and also evening hours for those who are working so that uh, they will still be able to get more uh, uh, ability to get vaccinated uh, without an appointment. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. This is Brian. Um, we have been implementing uh, many of those uh, concepts that you brought forward, um, that was brought forward in the referrals from you and Supervisor Chavez. And uh, in addition to a lot of the work that was already happening, I know our PIO has been really active uh, doing paid ads through different um, language media, working with Univision and Telemundo, um, Vietnamese and Mandarin radio, local Spanish radio advertising, uh, doing some small dollar advertising as well. I know they were exploring that, um, working with smaller outlets like El Observador and, and others. There's been a lot of effort to try to diversify the, um, the different ways that we're communicating, uh, particularly with the constituencies that we most most need to reach on our vaccine messaging. So I, I know that many of that those efforts were in the works um, and and had were being expanded. So that's uh, that, that's definitely a huge focus. And also on your, your question about uh, extended hours, I know the mobile vax team has been um, planning to try to expand to to create actually an evening team is, is what we're trying to do. Oh, good. And uh, yeah, and, and, and I know the, you know, some of the sites, as you know, have weekend and evening hours now, but we that's just been a, it's been a comment that we've heard many, many times. We know it's a, it's got to, we gotta have to get as many of those hours as we can as we try to work and reach more working people. Right. No, exactly. And, and I know we've been doing really good on the, um, on the website to get people to sign up and that's been phenomenal. I just want to make sure that we are doing the same thing as well in terms of increasing the number of vaccinations for those who are uh, first come first serve for those who uh, have you know, a problem getting the, uh, the appointment. So I want to make sure that those got beefed up in terms of numbers as well. Okay, 
Um, one other question uh, has been asked is uh, about getting these uh, mobile vaccination um, pop-up site or clinics to college campuses. Uh, have we done any of those? Hi, hey, Supervisor Lee. This is this is Dr. Cody. We we have certainly had inquiries um, from uh, the college campuses. Um, what what our strategy is is to uh, invite them to use our mass back site, particularly Levi's. Um, and so, if on the campus side, they can help to organize students, faculty, and staff assisting with signups or transportation or what have you. Uh, and then we provide. Uh, the vaccine at one of those sites. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows us to reserve our other capacity for going to the more difficult to reach uh, populations. Got it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, if they had university, they certainly didn't have problem understanding English, or at least uh, uh, using the internet, right, to make the reservations and whatnot. So I think yeah. that's actually a smart way of uh, using the resources. Um, one uh, other question I have is regarding the uh, Beta segregation uh, for the A Asian Pacific American uh, community. Uh, about a couple months ago, we were able to get some of the details to show that the Vietnamese and Filipino communities were hardest hit uh, among the Asian community, Asian American communities. So, so we were able to do some uh, interventions. I don't remember seeing that type of um, uh, segregated data uh, recently. So I just want to check in to see is is this something that we could you know report out again in the next few meetings? just to see if uh, those communities have been getting better uh, numbers in terms of vaccinations? Uh, we can we can come back next time and try to give more of a report. Um, remember that there are data that we have for the cases and then da di a different data set for the vaccinations. Um, I believe last time we were sharing data regarding the cases, uh, what mm -hmm. we were seeing. I think um, uh, the data uh, among the vaccinated population is a bit more difficult uh, because of the, because the data aren't entered into care in the first place. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure we can give an update on cases. I, I'm not certain about vaccinate about the vaccinated population. Okay, good. Um, but we'll see what we can do. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for at least attempting or trying it. I really appreciate it. Um, the 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 bad news last week, of course, is the fact that they had to stop Johnson Johnson vaccine uh, for the time being temporarily, and of course, the long term effect of that is that might increase the amount of uh, vaccine hesitation uh, of that. Right. So um, there are words I guess Dr. Fauci is saying that it's very possible this could be approved as a Friday, you know, and all that. So I know we have some doses still sitting around, and you know, obviously not being deployed. Uh, once the word gets out, right, that let's say the Jensen vaccine is, uh, is, is approved again, uh, those could be very quickly be, uh, be implemented immediately to our various sites, correct? Uh, yes. I'm going to let Dr. Spencer Scheib comment further. Yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. We expect, uh, again, I hope, some type of decision on Friday when the ACIP meets and I mean, they have a lot of options for it. They, they could restrict um, the utilization of that dose that, that, of that vaccine to certain segments of the population. So we'll see what happens, but then we can utilize it. Um, and then there'll be the issue of uh, people's perceptions. No matter what they say, there'll be issues of perception. But just remember, at this point, it's only about 5% of all our vaccines. So it's a very small component of our overall program. Exactly. So it's not affecting us uh, at all in terms of our, our ability to continue to um, get the vaccines out. So that's great. Um, one other area I would like to ask questions on is on the issue of vaccine verification, which obviously would help us uh, open it sooner, whether it's uh, uh, launch events or even restaurants and, and businesses. Um, some call it the vaccine passport, but I think it's just a verification of what we're talking about. Uh, I know the federal government is not really uh, adopting anything like that, and I'm not so sure the state. Uh, I've seen there's this thing called the uh, V-Safe uh, program uh, online, and I've registered for it because I looked it up and it's relatively painless to do. Um, is this something that we should encourage individuals to also sign up for, the V-Safe program? I believe it's, it's run by the CDC or, or so at least the, the federal government, right? Yes, that's our understanding. 
<clears throat> and we, you know, we've explored locally the concept of a vaccine passport, but um, of course, it's not something that really is very effective just done in one county. So we're looking to the CDC for direction about how to proceed. Um, I know there's, well, we've all read and are aware that um, there's activity going on in the administration that might end up with a vaccine passport uh, model, but at this point, um, we're waiting for more direction. Okay. And and uh, my last question in this series, I guess, would be: um, we know that the different states only have very different numbers. Uh, for example, Michigan is like one of the worst states now in terms of their numbers. Uh, versus uh, us here, we've been very fortunate that we are relatively flat, even though it's increasing a little bit lately. Um, is there anything we are really doing for folks arriving from uh, those, those areas on the airport? What are we doing to remind them regarding the 10 day, uh, you know, quarantine and things like that when people arrive from uh, uh, on the planes coming to our areas? Um, there is a uh, CDPH travel advisory uh, mm -hmm. for folks traveling um, out of state. Uh, and there's also a little bit of a different message for people who are vaccinated, and this originates with the CDC. Um, and so uh, I think that, that as, as we all know, we, there are so many trade-offs at play. And for people who are vaccinated, um, there needs to be, uh, partly as an um, incentive to interest people in vaccination to understand that you can live a little bit differently uh, if you're vaccinated. And that's one reason why now vaccinated people, for example, who are exposed uh, uh, don't have to isolate and vaccinated people who are returning from travel, um, you know, don't necessarily have to quarantine uh, and test. Um, although I would say that traveling to a place with lots and lots of transmission, particular variants, um, it's still not a bad idea. Right, absolutely. And then certainly the, the wearing of the mask is still extremely important, even though after they got the two doses of vaccination, right? The, oh, the masks are, uh, they're going to be in our lives for a while. Yeah, mm -hmm. very, very important layer of prevention uh, as we're rolling out vaccines and even for people who are vaccinated. Right, exactly. And and, and as you said, those of us who uh, are fortunate enough to have vaccinated, it's good and we'll live our life a little different, like getting a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> <laughs> the question I have right now, President Wasserman. Thank you. Oops, I think you're muted. Now I'm unmuted. Thank oh. you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I wanted to uh, ask staff uh, if they could follow up a little bit on the uh, increased incidence of hesitancy that they've encountered, particularly with respect to the younger uh, residents that uh, uh, apparently exhibited some hesitancy and, and see if we had any sense, either hard data or even just anecdotally, what that hesitancy is about. What's, what does that represent in terms of concerns that we should be thinking about addressing as we talk with folks in the community in the months ahead. Yes, Sorry. Supervisor. Uh, I, we um, right now are out in the field with a survey being done by EMC to try to discover more objective detail about what the hesitancy is about. Uh, right now, we don't have objective facts, but we have lots of anecdote that suggests that certain different age groups in the population have different reasons. Um, as Brian pointed out, apparently the uh, younger adults are in a uh, mindset that's not really sort of hesitant, but just in, indifferent. Um, certain populations, uh, are suspicious. Um, there is not 
um, a consistent reason why people are resisting vaccinations, but we expect that the kerfuffle that's happened with J&J, as well as the news from an international basis about AstraZeneca has some effect on some populations. So we'll have more objective detail later and we'll be able to bring that at the next meeting. Thank you. I uh, I was just about to ask uh, what the timeline was. So knowing that it's coming to us relatively soon is helpful. I I um, forgive me if I state the obvious, but I, I think it's important to keep top of mind, and that is that um, as uh, I believe it was Supervisor Wasserman mentioned earlier, we're we're going to get to a point uh, where our challenge is not uh, so much moving the vaccine out as it is. Um, making sure we get to the sort of last folks who have yet to be recipients and where that's a function of either indifference as uh, you characterize it or hesitancy. I, I do think understanding that well so we can respond with, you know, factual information uh, and um, that that will help people sort through their choices is gonna be very important. So I'm, I'm really pleased to hear about the survey. And um, I, I do think uh, as you describe it, it also sounds like it's gonna require some targeted communication uh, as, a, uh, as we try to address uh, concerns or attitudes that are specific to different parts of the community. Let me uh, pivot to an issue that uh, Supervisor Chavez raised earlier, which I, wanted to raise as well. So I appreciate the fact that she did. And I also committed to a, uh, folks in the community I would raise. And that is the issue of uh, folks who have what might be characterized as either uh, disabilities in some cases or um, pre-existing conditions in others. Uh, I was reminded in a recent conversation that back in February and March, the state uh, issued eligibility criteria indicating that come March 15th, uh, that uh, based on assessments, as I understood it, by healthcare providers, that folks who had either developmental disabilities or certain other severe high risk disabilities uh, or even um, conditions that uh, might not be characterized in that way, but that were clearly quite serious, uh, whether it was uh, sickle cell or heart conditions or cancer, um, would would have eligibility uh, back uh, mid-March. Do we have, going back to your answer, Dr. Smith, it, it wasn't entirely clear to me, do we have any way of assessing how well that sort of loosely defined set of folks uh, has been served in terms of the vaccine they've gotten? No, we really don't have any objective way of doing that. And as you know, then the state promptly changed their model from disability related eligibility to now everybody's eligible. So um, it's going to require some forensic surveying uh, later on to try to figure out if that change in March had any real effect on uh, vaccination. I suspect it probably did not because it coincided at a time period when there was a paucity of vaccine available. So um, there was such a short period of time between the <clears throat> eligibility that was specific to those with comorbidities and then opening up completely to everybody that um, I suspect it had very little effect, but we have no way of knowing that. Well, I uh, thank you. That's, that's a helpful clarification. Can we, um, I'm wondering if in addition to the approach you referenced earlier, which is to perhaps do some survey research among the vaccinated populations, maybe to sort of flip the sample approach, sampling approach and, and ask if the folks at someplace like San Andreas Regional Center who serves the uh, developmentally disabled community could, could help us determine what percentage of their clients, for example, have been served. I think that might give us a, 
um, a, a clearer sense of uh, how well that particular segment of the community has or has not been served. We'll communicate with the regional center and see if they've got some data. It's also possible at the state level that they might have some data that we could utilize and report back. Um, we'll have to do some research and find out. Yeah, and thank you for that. And I, I think, you know, um, this goes to the other uh, ways in which I think we've all said that there are going to be some segments of the population where it's just tougher for folks to access uh, the vaccine. And I am concerned that this subset of the community might be among that group. So uh, I just don't want to make sure we're not missing uh, a need out there that, that we could and should address, which then leads me to the next question, uh, Dr. Smith, or any of your uh, staff and the folks at public health, which is, um, you know, we, in the early days, as you referenced, Dr. Smith, we had some finite uh, slices of the population, folks 75 or up, 65 or up, then, uh, and uh, then, of course, the, the state made the judgment to, uh, at this point, say, you know, everybody uh, 16 and up is in the eligibility pool. Uh, I'm I'm a little anxious about the folks who were identified as early eligible, but who didn't beat the rush. Uh, I'm thinking of, you know, older folks. I, I had a constituent I reach out just within the last couple of weeks, uh, concerned about a 98-year-old family member who still hadn't had their shot. I just, I had an oh my God moment. Uh, uh, and, you know, we followed up and, uh, but do we, uh, are we in a situation where all the folks who fit that description are now truly, quote, in competition with everybody else for a, a, a vaccine appointment, as opposed to any um, set aside? We still have our priority appointments, and we have our outreach teams going out, and we've got our mobile vaccine um, program going on, which focuses on all those populations. But um, you're right in the sense that um, by opening up the eligibility to basically everybody above 16, we worry considerably that some people have been left behind. And I think there's pretty good evidence right now in the data that we just showed you that certain populations, particularly uh, Latinx population and the African-American population, um, and particularly in the older individuals in those populations, um, there's still catch up that needs to be done. And we're trying to figure out every way possible we can to get those individuals in to get vaccinated. Lots of impediments. Um, and obviously the people who are most easily accessed are the ones that are going to get the vaccine first, and that's a problem. Yeah, I, um, I, I was taken by the the description you provided of the challenge of ramping up. You know, I when I try to talk with folks about these issues, and I'm trying to keep it as sort of simple and straightforward as I can, I say, look, you need three things. You need a site, you need a, a team of folks to handle the logistics and actually deliver the vaccines, put shots in arms, as people now say, and you need the vaccine. Uh, you know, I know it's more complicated than that, but those to me seem to be the three sort of uh, bottom line uh, prerequisites to a program. And, you know, what I heard you say earlier is, well, we've we've identified sites and we've got a, a system now for delivery, but it's a little hard to ramp it up and ramp it down and ramp it up and ramp it down depending on the availability of vaccine. Did I get that part right? Yes, exactly. I mean, I think we've proven that our system can deliver 40,000 doses a day, but you can't just snap your fingers and have that available in one day. You have to get all the people there that are required to support it. And like you say, it's important to have the vaccine and you can't make all those appointments for a week or two weeks or three weeks in advance. 
you're not sure you're going to have the vaccine to be able to do it. So, uh, you know, there are three components that you're talking about are critical and they have to be coordinated. Um, so they all come together in the same place, the right person, the right time, the right support, the right vaccine in the right place. And, and I, I'm not saying this uh, to be critical of any of these organizations. I'm just really trying to make sure I've got it clear in my head. It sounded, I mean, I know there are lots of different ways to say, well, vaccine comes from here and it comes from there, but we, we have the state supply, which as I understand it, continues to be up and down and not something we can predict from week to week, yes? Um, it's not as predictable as we'd like it to be. It's been pretty much um, 70,000 or below a week. Um, and there's been lots of promises that it will go up, but that's not happened. Yeah. And then the, the federal numbers and, you know, again, uh, nothing but thanks and, you know, kudos to folks who helped make that happen. But, you know, we thought we were looking at 300,000 and uh, all of a sudden we've got 100,000 and S Supervisor Ellenberg did the math, you know, that's two thirds less. And, and we don't really know where we're headed there, yes? Um, as we speak, there's a phone call going on that started at 2.15 between Paul Lorenz and our um, pharmacist, uh, Nari Singh and HRSA trying to clarify what we can rely upon in the future. Um, so I think the answer to your question is we're unsure still. Yeah, I, I, I won't pain my colleagues by saying maybe I should keep talking. Uh, and uh, the, the third piece, which was an interesting development, uh, which I hadn't given a lot of thought to, is that we're in the sort of unfortunate situation of uh, being potential beneficiaries of vaccine hesitancy in other counties, if I heard it correctly. And that's also an unpredictable number, yes? Or do we think we have any sense of what that can and will yield? No, at this point, uh, we don't have any way of knowing a number specifically. What we do know in general is that certain parts of the state um, got larger per capita dosage allotments for a number of reasons, um, and that certain parts of the state are um, more either resistant to vaccination or not as capable of doing large volumes uh, to particular populations as we are. So we're seeing either excess appointments in certain locations or um, leftover vaccine. This time around, it looks like it's about 100,000 doses across the state. Um, could end up being a lot more, a lot less. Um, we don't really know. And is there anything you can share with our board about how you are accommodating or attempting to address the um, the need for our on again, off again, higher number, lower number system to respond as nimbly as possibly uh, to the ever-changing circumstances? It's a... Um huge personal or personnel <laughs> EL um, problem uh, with our DSWs and our employees, as well as a contractor that we've been using as professional uh, parts of the team. Um, and it's been pretty much a day-to-day, moment-to-moment, uh, calling people in uh, prepping for the next day, scheduling for the next day. Um, I guess that's the best I can say. It's a, it's a huge problem. We sometimes have far much, many more um, patients than we can handle, accommodate easily. We stay around and get it all done. Sometimes on some days there are more DSWs than are needed we reassign them back to another location or back to their 
parent organization. So it's a lot of shuffling. And last question, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Smith, it, it, does this uncertainty about uh, volume of vaccine available uh, explain why, at least in my office, we hear from folks who say, I don't understand, I made an appointment, they said they had an appointment six weeks later, uh, but my friend just uh, made an appointment uh, this week and they were able to get an appointment in just a week or two. Why did I have to wait six weeks? And the answer is because somebody just honestly didn't know how much vaccine they'd have and didn't want to make appointments that they weren't sure they could keep. Is that kind of the simple answer to a complicated set of dynamics? Um, hard to say exactly about that situation. Um, the things that go through my mind are that different uh, vaccine providers have different scheduling capacity at different times. Uh, and also it's true that um, the flux of second doses uses up appointments um, for first doses. Um, I guess the best answer to the question is um, it's challenging to get the vaccine into the right place at the right time. And so it is true that some locations are able to do first doses more quickly than others. Um, we don't luckily at this point have in the, within the county system uh, that much of a wait for first doses, but we do have partners in the, or in the county geographic county that do have long wait times. All right. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Jill, I see we have two speakers. Would you allow them in for a minute each? Yes, sir. One moment. Our first speaker is John Pedigo. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, I'm Father John Pedigo. I'm from Catholic Charities. I'm the Director for Advocacy and Community Engagement. I want to thank the, the board for their amazing work in promoting these vaccines. And I know that we've, they've made some great efforts in opening up these vaccines in neighborhoods in um, directly affected communities. I do ask that we look at evening and weekend hours and that agencies and community-based organizations that are working uh, be fully funded so that we can do the, uh, the, the, the nitty gritty outreach, the granular outreach that we're doing. It's very, very difficult um, to do what we're doing because right now uh, without, without the adequate funding and adequate staff. So um, if we want results, we're just asking you to make these investments in <clears throat> more time where the working population can get their uh, vaccines and that the organizations serving in these communities are able to uh, make, their, uh, make their work uh, more effective and more direct. Thank you all very much. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you. I'm learning a lot about uh, synthetic proteins and how they can have a, as a vaccination process can really help. And it's learning to trust that synthetic proteins can be a good vaccination process. How do you convey that to the people who are not or wanting to take it, or the vaccine or afraid to take the vaccine? That's, I'm a bit afraid. I'm learning about it now. Uh, it's a bit different than simple homeopathic remedies, uh, vaccines of say Johnson and Johnson and the AstraZeneca. The blood clots are an example of, of that. And so, you know, the synthetic protein by Moderna and Pfizer may be an interesting choice that is not so uh, fearful if you read into it and if you guys know how to talk about it and share that with the community. Please work on that. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. Okay, we'll go if we have any second rounders. We're starting with Vice President Ellenberg. Just two quick thoughts. Um, first, in response to something that Supervisor uh, Lee said a while ago about college students, 
can we distribute vaccines to um, college or university health centers for them to distribute? We don't have that capacity right now because of the uh, logistic problems with uh, Pfizer and the capacity problems with Moderna. Um, hopefully when we get a larger amount of Moderna or if the J&J uh, &J, um, problem gets solved, we'll be able to do that. But so right now we have that capacity. So it's about supply, not about the health centers not being authorized or, or able to administer the vaccines. I'm sorry, you cut out, say that again, please. Apologies, I just um, restating to, uh, for my clarification, it's not about um, the ability or authorization of the health centers to um, administer the vaccines. It's, it's just a supply issue. Well, there's a couple of layers going on. Number one, we can't redistribute the HRSA vaccine right. uh, to other locations. So that takes that off the table. Uh -huh. With regard to the state uh, vaccine, it could be distributed to qualified um, uh, providers um, and it's possible for a school system to become a qualified provider. But um, right now, in order to distribute some Pfizer to a qualified provider, they have to have the ability to deal with the super high refrigeration requirement. So that's not an option at this point. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. It would also require approval from the third-party administrator, which I doubt we would have a problem with getting, but mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there are bureaucratic problems with the whole process. Right, that's clear. And, I, and yes, the, the, the storage issue is critical. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make um, was in, in response to Brian Darrow's um, a description of targeted ads and 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 how we're giving different messages to different populations, specific messages to specific populations, which I think is terrific. Um, and thinking about the Gen Zers and Millennials, 20s and 30s folks who may not be vaccine hesitant, but vaccine, I think you described them as just disinterested. Uh, there's an article in the April 2021 Atlantic magazine about uh, young people in just that demographic uh, suffering from long COVID after being exposed, having minimal symptoms, if any, and then later getting sicker and really having debilitating symptoms months later. And it's a scary message, but I, I would ask you to just think about um, whether it makes sense to target ads to young adults with um, with the very real horror stories of long COVID, long COVID experiences by their peers. Thank you. Uh, very, very great um, perception and question. Um, we didn't mention that we have a contract with Crosby uh, Communication and they uh, just completed um, multiple uh, ad drops in multiple media mm -hmm. focused on the need for vaccination and uh, the need for otherwise protecting your family. So using the typical model of communication and politics with uh, the good guy approach first, the next strategy is the scare tactic, which I know is a little bit um, rude for me to say, but we do need to get the message out that we're not talking about just near-term infections, but long-term infections, as you point out from the article in the Atlantic. Right. And, um, and I would view it as comprehensive education, not, not scare tactics. These are realities and it's important for, for people, especially populations that feel that they are not at all vulnerable to really understand the full extent of, of how this virus can, can impact even otherwise young, healthy people. Yeah, your, your approaches are, Words are much better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I was just going to um, suggest that the that all of the um, the commercials that are being developed either for social media or for TV be on the um, the media toolkit because I haven't seen them. And the other thing is I would like to request an off agenda on the media buys. I think we've asked for that a while ago, so maybe it's coming. But I think it's really important for us to know um, for radio and TV and what's being purchased in our areas. Thank you. Thank Will you. Do. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, thank you. I uh, absolutely agree with what uh, Supervisor Ellenberg just mentioned regarding the false premise that many young people have that uh, they are invincible and they won't get sick. I mean, we saw those on those pictures of the spring break breakers in the last few weeks. Uh, the way they party, the way they truly believe that they're invincible uh, is certainly the concern. And I think we are seeing those numbers in Florida and Texas and other places uh, on many young people now are, are getting sick instead of the older ones. Um, so I think there's definitely a, a message that we need to get out there uh, to schools and campuses and uh, to community colleges and high school even to, to explain that uh, it's certainly young people are not immune. I think that's a very, very important point. Thank you. Um, and then here I am, I'm uh, about, I, I guess I, I mentioned this, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but uh, uh, last board meeting, uh, we had a few protesters uh, out there, uh, outside my door, uh, trying to educate me why COVID didn't exist and they haven't seen any dead bodies from COVID. Uh, I've used the term privately, but I'm just saying the, the COVID idiots are out there. Uh, I just want to make sure that we really are, are doing a good job of explaining the, the, the these effects. Uh, they are trying to send videos of say how wearing masks has negative effect to your health and all that stuff that's still out there in the social media. Uh, is there any way we, I mean, I've written a letter to, to Mark Zuckerberg on this issue. Uh, is there anything that the county can do to produce PSAs or, or try to reinforce these issues and, 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 and fight off these, uh, these just fake, uh, well, fake news is one thing, but I mean, fake news that could hurt people's health. Thank you, Mark. Our messages so far have all been positive messages, not trying to engage, you know, the, the false news. Um, but, um, you know, we're focused on trying to make sure we get the message to the groups that would be most receptive and not arguing in the press with others. So we're doing, we're doing positive things, which is great, but we are certainly not taking any efforts to debunk these uh, crazy theories. Not directly. Okay. Um, I'm mean, just saying, and I, I think that, uh, well, well, we'll talk about that later, what if there's something that's worthwhile for us to do, because at the end of the day, I think the, the vaccine hesitation is going to be our next barrier uh, as more and more people are getting vaccinated and there'll be those who, is refusing to vaccinate. I mean, either too uh, disinterested, like you say, to, to get vaccinated or afraid of needles or, or worse yet, it's just complete distrust of the government. Uh, one, one point I just wanted to raise, which I thought was fascinating, I was talking to Betty Young, uh, our uh, PIO side, is that uh, the Vietnamese Americans actually have a very good uh, numbers on getting vaccines. And that, the reason for that was because of the experience in the 70s when many of the immigrants first came to this country as refugees, they got, you know, got all the shots, they got all their health care to get their checkups and had very good experience and trust on our health system. And so when it comes time to getting vaccination, the Vietnamese community is extremely uh, uh, active and aggressive of going to get those signed up. So that trust to our government is so important. And I I'm, I'm really sad to say that with a lot of these fake news, that's exactly what's what's lacking. And uh, for us to get out, you know, for the for the herd immunity we're trying to accomplish, I can see that's going to be our next barrier. And I, I really do think there's more that we probably would have to do. Just I just bring that up, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian, did you have any final comments regarding item eight COVID? Hearing none, I'll give, uh, give my comments. I have three or four specific things. Um, 
first and foremost, all of you are doing awesome. Every single report I've received, similar to Supervisor Ellenberg, and I'm sure the rest of us, has been overwhelmingly impressed with the efficiency, the professionalism, the politeness, everything about the experience. And I've heard from six or eight different sites. So kudos to all of you putting it together. Kudos to all of you doing it. Um, my first question relates to this particular dashboard here. However, I can show that. And when I total each of the columns, as I mentioned before, it does not include the pharmacies yet. So in that dashboard, there are no pharmacies in the total. So we really don't know how many people have been vaccinated. Then in my, what has become my favorite dashboard for the last month, this one here, which with the chart on the bottom, how do I do that? Where is it? Hold on one sec. There we go. This one here with the chart on the bottom and showing that we have vaccinated 939,000 people. That is an awesome number. Right now, we are not even allowed to vaccinate 400,000 people because they are 15 and under. So we have vaccinated 939 people out of 1.6 million, which is 58%. And that is downright awesome. My question for staff is, I just want confirmation that red printing above the solid blue bar, it has been there for three weeks. And it says, it says, uh, the dashboard could not be updated today due to state care problems. That doesn't happen every day, but this does. Due to issues with the California Immunization Registry data system, the number of vaccines administered is currently underreported. So Dr. Marty or Dr. Tong, I've been telling people based on this chart that we vaccinated 939,000 people. I had scheduled a press conference for this Saturday that I was gonna invite all supervisors to to raise the flag in honor of our having vaccinated the one millionth Santa Clara County resident, which at this rate was going to happen Thursday night or Friday morning before noon. Now, because of the passing of former Vice President Mondale, our flags must be down as he lays in rest and no flags can be raised until next week. So I'll figure out something to do, but I'm, I'm going to, and all my supervisors, one millionth is coming this Friday. One millionth is a milestone. It is a big number and it's out of 1.6. It's not just 50% of our population. It's, it's gonna be up around 60, 70%. So my question to Dr. Marty is with that red that says due to CARES system, and due to the fact that we don't have any idea what Walgreens and Costco, Walgreens, Costco, CVS, et cetera, aren't we well past a million people, Marty? Uh, I think I'll jump in for Marty on this one. Um, it, it is confusing to look at the CARES data and the inventory data and um, I'll throw a few more wrenches into the works here today. Um, CARES data is the California uh, Immunization Registry data, yep. which is collected by California from all providers based on what providers put into the system. And it's required that every provider enter their vaccination records into the system, but they're always delayed by at least two to three weeks. And the processing uh, done by the system centrally adds additional delays. And to make that even more complex, the state just recently uh, decided to um, utilize a different reporting structure that is now called iris used to be that they used what was called snowflake these were data collection systems that took the data from cares and reported it out the two systems don't mesh correctly um, 
also their um, accuracy in the short term is questionable. After a number of weeks, they actually measure up, but um, it makes it really hard to tell exactly how many doses have been given up to date. Then the first chart that you were looking at, which is the inventory chart, is our local data, not related to CARES, but created by us doing a survey of the providers to tell us how much vaccine they've received. So that number is also different than what you see with the CARES data. Yep. And Dr. Smith, so I, 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 let, me, let me just interrupt here. I, I don't want to use a whole lot of time. The second chart right here, we show 939, and we also say this is currently underreported. So yes. are, 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 are we close, probably, to, close to a million? Yeah, we're, we're probably close to a million plus or minus, we're, we're definitely higher than 939. We okay, can't that, tell that was, you how close. That, that was my only close. point. Yeah, that was my only point that I wanted to get out here um, to do that and to tell Dr. Marty, even though our positivity rate is up a little bit, 1.2, 1.3, it's the sample size, Dr. Marty. It's like a batting average. You know, when you've had 600 at bats and you get a hit, it doesn't move but your sample size now is far smaller than it was three months ago because vaccinated people are not getting tested. So whenever you have somebody test positively, it has a greater effect than it did three months ago when our testings were double what they are now. So Dr. Marty, Dr. Tong, Dr. Cody, Dr. Smith, Brian, everybody else out there and all the thousands of people under you, you are doing a fabulous job. As far as I'm concerned, we are close to 1 million people in Santa Clara County having been vaccinated. And one that's only out of that 16, 1.6 were allowed to vaccinate. So we are doing great there. The positivity rate going up is misleading because your sample size is smaller. And if one person tests positive today, it'll jump by far more than it did three months ago when you were testing twice as many people. So everybody, you are doing a fabulous job. Your numbers are fabulous. We are giving out the doses as fast as we are getting them. And federal and state government, give us more, we'll get out more. We are well on our way to a very, 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 very wonderful May and June and normalcy. And I will close with that. Uh, Supervisor Sumidian, we tried to reach you previously. Are you available now? Did you have any closing comments? I, I am, I do not, I did not, and thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we had, uh, there was a motion made by a supervisor to include 21 in eight, in number eight, the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. Uh, any comments on that, please? Good afternoon. Uh, this is a report from Celine Ho, who gives us a report on the homeless healthcare program. And just to reemphasize how important this is, it's because the, the county participates in the HRSA grant through our Valley Healthcare Homeless yeah. Program that we're able to get vaccine through HRSA. So, so Celine is uh, the person who made sure that that happened. Super, go ahead and report out. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. Um, I just wanted to give you a, a quick update on our vaccine numbers. As of last Friday, um, April 16th, we've completed 1,660 vaccinations uh, with 488 first doses, 333 second doses, and 839 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, we continue to use our backpack medicine team to go out to the encampments to do the vaccination as well as vaccinating um, at, our, uh, at our own clinic sites. Um, in addition, we also have our annual review of the sliding fee discount policy that's attached um, in your board packet for your review and approval. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Celine. Um, Vice President Ellenberg. Celine, thanks so much for the report. I'm really glad to hear that there's a continuing increase in the number of VHHP patients uh, that are being vaccinated. 
At the March meeting, I had asked uh, what you're seeing in terms of vaccine uh, hesitancy, and you had indicated that it's variable across locations uh, where the vaccines are being provided, um, and that an op agenda would be um, would be made available to us. So, just want to remind you that that I'm still looking for that. And also curious to know whether you have any observations on vaccine hesitancy that, that you can share today and whether the pause on the J&J &J vaccine um, is causing any, any greater worry, e either amongst the people that received the shot or those that are still waiting to get vaccinated. Yes, thank you for your questions. Um, in regards to the vaccine hesitancy, you know, we uh, we do see some variance between the encampments and the shelters um, that we're going to for vaccinations. At the shelters, we're doing a lot of outreach and education with the shelter providers ahead of time um, in order to prepare them to let them know that we're going out for the vac um, to vaccinate their residents. Um, so in the encampments, there are some hesitancy that we've seen anecdotally. Um, with some of the um, members there that will talk to other um, encampment residents and say, don't get that vaccine. And then it, then mm -hmm. that information kind of spreads. Um, but we are also doing outreach um, with our uh, community outreach workers to go out to kind of prepare them. We have some flyers that are specific um, to our homeless population that we distribute as well. Um, we actually are in the process of um, analyzing a patient survey um, that was just administered uh, a few weeks ago that also speaks to if they are um, planning to get the vaccine and if not, why. And so we'll have more information about that for you at the next um, board meeting. Great, in thank you. Yeah. In regards to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, mm -hmm. you know, we started out with Johnson & Johnson only at the encampments. And obviously now we're using the, um, the two dose um, vaccinations. Um, with that, you know, we're keeping careful track of um, follow-up for the second dose um, to make sure that we can track them. Um, we can, you know, to, in order to administer the second dose. We've also set up a uh, BHHP hotline in case we go back to the, to the encampment site and they're not there, they can call our hotline so that we can help them um, schedule their second dose so that they, they don't fall through. And do you have any data on that yet? Are you getting people back for their second vaccines or, or is it too soon because you were doing the J&Js and have now just done first doses correct. of Pfizer we, or Moderna? Yeah, correct. We just started doing the uh, Pfizer um, last week at the encampment, so they're not due for their second yet. Okay, so so in a month from now, we'll we'll ask you how, how that went and if that's a system that appears to be working. Yes. Great, thanks so much, Celine, I appreciate it. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, Celine. Um, just to follow up on the second question, um, if you're asking people who are homeless to make a, if you're making a second appointment for them, does that mean essentially two weeks from when people get vaccinated, you're physically going back out to the, lo the same location? Yeah, so, so for the second doses, we don't make appointments. We just go there. We let them know that we'll be back 21 days or 28 days, depending on the vaccine, at the same location. Sometimes they'll let us know that we're, I'm not going to be here um, in this area. So we'll let them, uh, we'll provide them with our, our phone number um, so that they can call us so that we can help them to schedule their follow-up um, dose at the, one of the community sites. Got it. So the first strategy is show up in person the, whatever the appropriate days from Pfizer, what's the number? I believe Pfizer is 21 days. So 21 days from, yep. got it. And then, and then if they, if they let you know, they're not going to be there, then, then you'll work with them on another strategy. Right. Got it. Okay. Uh, Celine, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll move the report. Um, I'll, I mean, the, the recommended action to approve the operational report and then to approve the sliding uh, sliding fee discount program policy and fee schedule. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. I need a second, Supervisor Lee. Thank you very much. Your comments, sir? Yeah, thank you. I was exactly the same question with uh, Supervisor Chavez, which is uh, the second dose uh, difficulty of the transient community, of course, is very difficult. Uh, thanks, Celine, for explaining the fact that you are coming back exactly for 21 and 28 days, uh, depending on the vaccine, but of course, 
as we know, uh, that's difficult and and, uh, uh, and 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 given even the phone number uh, is very likely that you know, some of them won't even call back or, or, or accessible. So I, I'm just trying to find out if there's any potential strategy that we if they don't call back. Um, what what other efforts are we even trying to do to outreach to them again uh, in the future? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, fortunately, when we're out going out to do the vaccinations, it's with our backpack medicine team. Right. Um, and so the providers are also providing the primary care on site. Um, and they're likely to go back to those um, to those same areas to find those individuals as well. Okay, good. Yeah, that, that would be uh, very much needed. And, and um, yeah, no, I, I just am, am very um, uh, sad that the Johnson Johnson vaccine has been pulled uh, for the the threat. Uh, so hopefully, assuming that it does come back online, that's only going to make it a lot easier since those are just one and done, right? One dose makes it much easier, no follow-up required. Uh, and so I, I hope that that does come to fruition and make your job a little easier. Uh, and of course, that you probably will need more information in order to um, debunk any uh, any uh, uh, concern people might have regard with, with, with regard to one vaccine versus the other. So um, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a motion and a second. We have one speaker. Jill, could you bring that speaker on, please? Sir, one moment. Our first speaker is B. Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. My Zoom may cut out on me. I'm sorry about that. No problem. Uh, thank you. I'll try to go here. Um, First, thank you for the words of uh, Supervisor Chavez and the idea of uh, that, you know, it's okay to, to offer over communication about an issue. That's really important to myself. Um, you know, I'm trying to learn what is the language, how can people trust and feel safe with the uh, synthetic protein process of the, the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, uses. And um, yeah, I, how can you guys learn to work a scientific-based approach to really explain to me how can I feel safe with that and feel that the synthetic protein process is proteins itself just assembled together by, by humans? And that's a really interesting idea on how to work and, and, and how can that be trusted in the future? How can you work so we can trust that idea? Good luck on those efforts and thank you. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, Jill. Will you please take a roll call vote on item 21? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to item 18. Receive report from Social Service Agency related to COVID-19 food program response and CalFresh outreach. Back three. Who do we have, Angela? Yeah, how's it going, President Wasserman? It's going all right, thank you. Okay. We're getting, um, we're getting good work done. Um, so do I, am I supposed to share my screen? Um, or does someone, let me see if I can pull up the document. Oh, here we go. Jill or Rondo would be the only one. Is that, can you guys see that? Yes, we can. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, okay, so let's see, let me move on to the first slide. Um, so when COVID-19 shelter in place went into effect March 2020, food insecurity skyrocketed, which was immediately reflected in the applications for CalFresh. Um, CalFresh applications doubled in April 2020, hitting a peak of over 8,000 applications, more than double the pre-COVID normal volume of approximately 3,000 to 4,000 applications per month. CalFresh applications have remained high for most of the past year throughout COVID, leveling off briefly in the fall to what we consider pre-COVID norms, but then peaking again in December. Um, in February 2020, there were a little over 84,000 individuals enrolled in CalFresh. As of April 2021, there are um, a little over 100,000 individuals enrolled in CalFresh, so about a 20% increase. The federal and state government responded to this nationwide trend, oops, sorry, um, the nationwide trend by increasing the CalFresh benefit. The, there is the emergency allotment supplement, which will continue through the end of the federal and state emergency declaration. 
um, and also a temporary 15% increase to the max CalFresh food benefit allotment that will um, stay in place through the end of September 30th, 2021. That's authorized through the American Rescue Plan. So let me fix this. Um, so an example of the difference um, that those two programs made is prior to COVID, the CalFresh benefit for an individual could have ranged from $16 to $204, or for a family of four, it'd be $16 to $680. With the EA supplement and the 15% temporary increase, an individual will receive at least $234 and a family of four at least $782. So it does make quite a bit of difference. So one of the primary goals of DEBS is to increase participation rates in CalFresh, meaning to maximize enrollment of those eligible to the program. The department has ongoing outreach, collaboration, and process improvements um, efforts in pursuit of that goal, and we ramp those up in light of the COVID pandemic. So I often feel questions about how to tackle the low participation rate um, in California and locally, and that's a very complex question that I would, as a gross oversimplification, break down into two areas. So unfortunately, there are many people who are not inclined to seek assistance from CalFresh or public assistance programs due to lack of understanding, miseducation, stigma, or even fear. Angela, and, excuse, and my, Angela excuse my interruption for a minute. Supervisor Simitian, your hand is raised. Did you have a question about something she said, or did you want to speak? Same applies for Supervisor Ellenberg. No, once the presentation is finished, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg? You were muted. Was that the same? I think it was. Yes, that was the same. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, Angela, please continue. Of course, yeah. Um, but so in the first scenario where it's really about mis miseducation, stigma, and fear, that's where we would really collaborate with our CBOs and other partners who have reach and trust into the community. The second scenario really is about easing barriers to application and recertification for those who are willing to seek assistance. And essentially, we're just trying to make it easier for people to apply for and stay on CalFresh. Um, so in that scenario, we mo mostly focus on outreach to existing clients that are not enrolled in CalFresh, and we look for innovative ways to reduce barriers. And some examples is reducing bureaucracy, paperwork burden, and looking at ease of um, access to offices, digital divide, other issues that are similar to that. We leverage CBOs who have uh, reach and trust the relationships in the community. In partnering with CBOs, we conduct uh, CalFresh 101 to educate on high, um, high level CalFresh regulations and eligibility to train CBOs to be application assisters in the community. And the portion of CalFresh application submitted to by CBOs has increased from 15% in 2018 to 62% in the first two months in 2021. So we've seen a lot of success through going through that model. Um, Move on to my next slide. Some other things that we've been doing, we always try to look for additional ways to do outreach. So I just wanted to call out these two things um, regarding the school meals match that um, Supervisor Allen brought up. We partner with Second Harvest to do the school meals match, and we are in touch with the Santa Clara County Office of Education to do outreach to increase the enrollment ahead of the next school match process. So I did want to call that out and thank Supervisor Ellenberg for making that connection. And then also with regard to um, outreach at the vaccine sites, um, Leslie Cloud would connect us to various liaisons at the vaccine centers throughout the county. So just to start, we are doing out outreach materials in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, and those should be available this week at the mobile vaccine clinic. So I did want to thank Supervisor Chavez for opening that door. So we're very excited for those opportunities as well. Nice. And then lastly, with regard to the second area that I mentioned earlier, easing barriers to access to CalFresh, DEBS on an ongoing basis, we do attempt to have um, innovative working relationships with groups like um, Technology Solutions Support, TSS, and Code for America to streamline uh, removal of barriers to applying for and maintaining ongoing eligibility to support um, eligible recipients retaining CalFresh. So um, in the legislative file, I mentioned Matt, Matt Unrath from the California Policy Lab just completed a 15-year study in which he had two major findings. And that was that the households leave CalFresh when asked for paperwork, and most households who exit CalFresh are actually still eligible. 
So this causes what we call churn, and that's when eligible households leave CalFresh, but they re-enroll within 30 or 90 days. So UNRAS policy brief had several recommendations for counties and the states and the feds, and DES has implemented several of the recommendations in this paper locally, and we're actively participating in efforts with the state on state level efforts. So as an example highlighted in this slide is we implemented telephonic signature in 2014, and we've seen um, consistently reduced churn rates as a result of telephonic signature. So that's what this, this slide is highlighting. The churn rates for 30 and 90 days in 2014, 18, 19, and 20, and just comparing Santa Clara's rate relative to the statewide rate. So you can see that we've had quite a bit of success there. So we're um, just wanted to highlight that. Other efforts to streamline and make processes more user-friendly and less burdensome, we utilize phone, email, as well as postal reminders to participate some uh, participants about upcoming paperwork. We've also partnered with TSS to implement a user-friendly online document submission portal for clients to make it easier for them to um, submit paperwork to the department. Um, in addition, CalFresh is advertised to Medi-Cal recipients and Medi-Cal applicants can apply for CalFresh while they're completing their Medi-Cal application and actually any programs they apply to for the department. Um, DEBS has also been selected to participate in two of the state's work groups for simplification of CalFresh recipient reporting. That's AB 79, Section 89 for reporting simplification and also the state's efforts to eliminate the SARS-7 report for the elderly and disabled. But um, despite all of those efforts, the CalFresh program rules and regulations are defined by federal and state regulations. So the federal poverty level assumes a much lower minimum wage and cost of living than the local levels here in Santa Clara County. There's also some specific aspects of CalFresh regulations, um, and we called out a couple of them in the legislative file, uh, purchase and prepare, and sponsor deeming that can be complicated and have impacts for multifamily and multi-generational households. And those are living situations that are more prevalent in low income and immigrant communities. And um, those things can impact benefit level and eligibility. And they can be very complicated concepts that can just per perpetuate misunderstanding so that when people who um, might just not be familiar with CalFresh policy, it can dissuade people from applying. So um, the main thing that I would just really, I like to stress is I, I try to just really make sure that the community understands, you know, just apply, talk to a CBO assister and um, start there. You know, I really want people to not be intimidated by the process and I want them to talk to someone who's knowledgeable because if you're in need, that's what the department is for, to really just assist you in, in getting what you need. Um, but really the main conclusion is, while we've made positive forward movement and outreach and participation, the question really is, where are the opportunities? Because we're clearly not where we want to be. And um, really it's continuing strategic outreach, existing efforts of general outreach to the public are good, but further understanding of who is on other aid programs and why they're not enrolling in CalFresh, we need to convert them, we need to convert them into CalFresh participants. Wait. So, um, you know, those groups are really presumably likely eligible because they're on other programs and they're willing to enroll in government programs. So why aren't they enrolling in CalFresh? So I think that's the main opportunity we have to increase our CalFresh participation. So in particular, I know that um, Supervisor Stamidian had some specific questions on that point, and I certainly share your concerns. We're in the process of looking deeper at the trends that you pointed out. So um, definitely looking forward to collaborating with you on some outreach efforts, and we are prepping and looking deeper into those trends for the off agenda report that we are anticipating getting back to you before the end of this week. So I've definitely started to look much deeper in race, age, gender trends, specifically in District 5, but really across all the districts to understand that better, because I do think we have some really good potential outreach opportunities to collaborate on. Um, in terms of advocacy around efforts to ease access and reduce burdens and bureaucracy for applicants and recipients, the um, state did move forward the um, AB 2413, More CalFresh, Less Hunger, Less Hunger Act that was passed last year and is in process of executing that. So I do think but as that moves forward, there, there is definitely opportunities to leverage your support to help execute and move forward that act. So um, really happy to see the support of the board and definitely will be looking forward to um, involving you more to move forward those all those advocacy efforts. So that's sort of the update from us. Um, I hope definitely welcome your questions and I hope that we um, offered some insight into our, all the good work that's being done and the huge opportunities to leverage your support. So Great. definitely Thank welcome. You,
That definitely shows progress made. Thank you very much. We'll start with Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, and I appreciate the report from staff and uh, from uh, Michigan in particular. I I want to uh, highlight for a moment a, a challenge that is specific and particular to my district, and I, I want to be very clear with my colleagues and with the public uh, that I'm I'm not talking about a disparity uh, that is across the general population. We all know that uh, each district is different. Each district uh, has a greater and lesser need, and I think one of the things I've been so pleased and proud of our board for is that uh, we've all been willing to say where the need exists, let's go there without regard to whether it's in uh, our district or a colleague's district. That said, as I mentioned just in passing at a prior meeting, I, I had the opportunity to sit down and give a very careful look to the quarterly statistical report of public assistance programs, which I'm holding up uh, because uh, we all got it. Uh, and uh, as I looked at it and started to crunch some of the numbers myself, uh, here's what I was struck by. In District 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are very different places, the take-up rate for CalFresh was 35 to 40% greater than it is in my district among folks we have identified as public assistance program uh, recipients, beneficiaries. So I'm not talking about the general public uh, and I'm not talking about populations that would be uh, apples to oranges comparisons, more prosperous, less prosperous. I'm, I'm noting that in each of the five districts that once we uh, pull out the number of folks who are on public assistance of uh, any kind, that there is remarkable consistency in terms of the percentage of folks on public assistance who are accessing CalFresh benefits. So in District 1, it's 26%. In District 2, which is a very different place, it's 26%, excuse me, 27%. So 27% in District 1, 27% in District 2, uh, even though they're very different places. 26% in District 3, 26% in District 4. So uh, remarkable comparability in terms of the percentage of folks who are on public assistance, who we have identified as folks who have qualified by virtue of their need. And yet when you get to District 5, that number drops down to 19%, which is to say that we have a take-up rate that is 35 to 40% less in District 5 than in all of the other four districts. And if you apply that calculation to the number of folks on public assistance, it indicates that there are probably in excess of 3,000 folks who can and should be receiving CalFresh benefits who are not in the program for one reason or another. And, you know, the sort of painful shorthand we've adapted and uh, or adopted rather in my office is to say, we're leaving federal funds on the table while people can't put food on the table. And that's that's just a source of concern when you're talking about 300, excuse me, 3,000 people who are going without who are likely qualified. Now, it may be that there is some reason for that um, uh, discrepancy, that difference, but again, this is a function of looking at folks who are qualified for public assistance, identified as public assistance recipients, and a number that is uniformly uh, appreciably higher in the, all four of the other districts. So I raised that at our prior board meeting. Um, the social services staff has been good enough to talk with my staff in the intervening time. I've certainly talked to Dr. Smith about it. Uh, but I, I need to ask for help from our staff. And uh, so I'm going to uh, move approval of the recommended action, which is simply to receive the report today, but with direction to staff to uh, follow up very specifically 
on uh, identifying the basis for that discrepancy, which is unique, again, to District 5, and uh, doing whatever is appropriate and necessary uh, to move those numbers up until uh, such time as they are comparable to all four of the other districts in the county. And I would ask for a second to that motion. Second. Thank you. I'm muted. Now I'm not muted. Okay, Supervisor Ellenberg. I think Angela wanted to respond to Supervisor Smidian. Respond, Angela, please. Yeah, um, Super Smith, just some initial thoughts. That's actually exactly why I'd ask for a little more time to respond in the off agenda. And we hope to comment on that in the off agenda back to you. Um, but yes, I actually am digging and what I'm trying to do is disaggregate some of the um, race, ethnic, gender, and um, age discrepancies. And I absolutely do see that. And exactly what we want to do is you have it spot on, um, not that you need me to tell you that, but that's exactly what I want, want to look at because that's exactly my premise is that the individuals that are already on aid uh, why aren't they on CalFresh, period, across all the districts? And then in your district, seeing that additional gap, that's exactly the question we need to answer. And what I'm trying to see is by disaggregating race, ethnic, ethnicity, gender, and then thinking that deeper by race, is there any patterns we're seeing? I, I don't want to get ahead of myself and comment today because we're, we're just digging this out up. I just got it the other day because it took a little time to pull those reports. I am already seeing it's fairly consistent across all the districts. There's a little bit of anomaly, but your district actually does have some different trends by that data that I'm seeing, but I wanna analyze a little bit further before, before I draw any conclusions, so I don't wanna be too early. But from that, what I'm thinking from there is, uh, you know, obviously all of it, we need to raise all of it, period, because it's not where we want it to be. But even within that, I think there's some targeted outreach by age and ethnicity that we can do because your district specifically some of those are bringing down your numbers. So that's what I meant by, I wanna work with your staff to understand the demographics in your district um, that are just different that we can target to get that gap closed. And then of course, that gap closed across the entire county, but particularly the gap closed in your district. That's what I wanna um, adjust in the off agenda. And that's why I just wanted a little bit more time till Friday so we could do a little bit more of that analysis. I hope I'm not being too Thank you. vague. But that, that's what I wanted to be able to address. Through the, through the chair, I thank you. Yes. I very much appreciate the follow-up. And Ms. Shing, I, um, first of all, I have to kid you back and say, anytime you want to say I'm spot on, please come to the meeting. That's uh, <laughs> good. Uh, and, and I'm getting a head shake from Mr. Wasserman, apparently. But the other thing I want to say is, no, I very much appreciate your desire to make sure that um, the agency does not uh, sort of put forward a, uh, a, a, a notion or a prescription until you've had a chance to crunch the data and feel like it, it rests on good analysis. So thank you for that. And thank you for doing uh, that to, to get there. Uh, I, my office and I, of course, are happy to help uh, with outreach in any way. Uh, and, it, you know, it, uh, now I'm going to break my own rule and speculate a little bit. I don't know if it's because we have a number of smaller communities and it's sort of harder to do outreach by virtue of that, if it's the fact that we have smaller concentrations of people who are on public assistance, and so it's harder to do outreach by virtue of that, or whether it is some other set of uh, circumstances uh, totally unrelated to those two phenomena. But I look forward to learning more with you, and um, most importantly, I look forward to pushing that number up because as I say, I uh, by my calculation, there are, are as many as 3,000 people out there who uh, should be able to qualify who aren't in the program. And uh, these are federal funds that we're simply not accessing because we haven't figured out uh, who to reach and how to reach them yet. Thanks again. We'll get it done. Thank you. And Supervisor Ellenberg, we now have one speaker. Do you wish to speak first? Uh, sure, I'm happy to ask my question first. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so thank you, Angela, uh, for the report and in particular for the inclusion of enhanced outreach and coordination with the school district data match so that we can be sure that families are enrolled both in both enrolled in CalFresh and automatically qualified for school meals. The report notes that uh, work with the work within Debs uh, to share information on with on CalFresh with Medi-Cal enrollees. Have Santa Clara um, Family Health Plan and Anthem also been engaged to support outreach to their members? 
Yeah, we definitely work with them regularly. I know we meet with them, and uh, forgive me, I can't remember which, I know for sure, sure Santa Clara Family Health Plan. Margareta might, I know she's on also, she might know off the top of her head, but I know there's at least two or three different health plans that we meet with annually specifically for that purpose of brainstorming um, outreach and coordination. Um, and I know Santa Clara Family Health Plan is one of them. I can't remember what the other two or maybe three are. Margareta, Margareta just health popped health on, so maybe she can help. Uh, we have two. One is the uh, Santa Clara Family Health Plan, and the other one is Blue Cross. That's the Anthem Plan. Great. That was my question. Thank you so much, both of you. All righty. Supervisor Chavez, and then Supervisor Lee. Thank you. I think, I think, um, thanks very much. Uh, just to, for, so first of all, Angela, thank you. And, you know, Supervisor um, Ellenberg and I asked for this to come to the full board because I know this is a high, there's a high level of interest around food security for the entire board. And I'm glad to see so many people engaged in the topic. Um, I wanted to go back and ask for two pieces of information. And then I have a few questions for you. One is, could you send the board the application that that folks fill out to be to get um, CalFresh? And then, second, um, the the application or the the action and the that that folks have to um, uh, submit to to re-sign up. That would be helpful. And then, just to go back to the Santa Clara Family Health Plan, and um, you know, one of my requests would be that we take a partner like this, um, Santa Clara Family Health Plan, Healthier Kids, or just a lot of nonprofits that are really deeply talking to our families all the time. And through COVID-19, a number of our partners who provide a primary service have all of a sudden gotten into the COVID-19, go get your tests, go get vaccinated, and are actually signing people up for vaccinations right now. What I would like to request is that with the Santa Clara Family Health Plan and or the Healthier Kids Foundation, a number of these partner organizations that are doing phone calls to sign people up uh, and all of that information you can get from, um, from Brian and Rocio, I would like us to ask if, if they would be willing to make the same kind of phone calls to get people to sign up for CalFresh because I think the coordination and sending information out is great. I think people knowing that someone's gonna help them fill out this form is, is better. And I know there's a process by which a partner helps fill out the form and then they forward it to um, your department to have it proper, you know, a process through um, a, a uh, and I'm sorry, what, what is the, um, the, the staff persons that are working on this, the classification of, of employees? Well, oh, uh, eligibility workers? That's right. So they're eligibility workers, yes. Um, and and I'd like us to do a, a test to determine the best tools to get people signed up. Because I, and I just want to say the numbers are going in the right direction. And I have to believe that a big part of that is that because of COVID-19, we're able to reach out to many, many more people and we're having many more conversations, but I think this goes back to the point that Supervisor Simidian raised earlier about um, what are the barriers that we need to, to break through. And I really appreciate that you're using evidence-based, an evidence-based approach. So you're all do, moving in the right direction, but we have all these human beings that are on doors, on phones, and we should really take advantage of that um, in the best way possible. And including, for example, that we had a number of folks who required um, housing or food access during COVID-19, those communities would be, um, the, and, I, and I would talk to our, our housing department to find out how appropriate it would be to reach back out to them and the, the most appropriate way to do that. But these have all been spoken to by a, a contact tracer, had at least somebody help them get connected to getting rent relief or food or a P PPE or cleaning products. So we have meaning more relationships with folks that I'd like to see us uh, determine whether or not we can, we can um, you know, change our relationship to make sure that if they need these resources they're asking for them. And then here's my, uh, my question, my last question. When we look at where we should be, Angela, 
what's our what's our goal? You mean in terms of um, CalFresh participation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, I think that right now the state is about seventy percent, but I think that I would say the sort of like uh, best practice is we would strive for like eighty to ninety percent. Um, the last uh, state metric that San Francisco was measured at was from 2018, and I believe we were somewhere around 50%. Now, I say that with a caveat because that metric that we, we are measured on, actually all, this, all this, the counties are measured on, is a little bit, we, we would say is a little controversial in terms of the accuracy of how that's measured, because they use a particular report that all the counties submit that um, isn't necessarily, the methodology isn't necessarily something that the counties would agree is is highly accurate. Um, that might be controversial for me to say. <laughs> so we have discussed about whether we could use a proxy that we would feel is more one timely and two more accurate. Um, and, and also, I think, you know, yeah, I think when you yeah. figure that out, it would be really important to educate us about it so that we know how to measure our success as a county. Yeah, I um, agree. Yeah, and that's, and then, that's something that we definitely. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to, yeah, just a big, a really big thank you because I think this really is going in the right direction. I appreciate your leadership and kind of clearing away the cobwebs. I really appreciate the staff. I know these are, you know, that there are lots of materials we need to get from people, but I, I for one would really like to know where, what our goal is. And then I think it would help us understand the steps that need to be taken uh, to address it. So thank you very much, Angela. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wilson. First of all, yeah, thank you, um, Angela, for a very uh, good report. Uh, learned a lot about reading the uh, studies, uh, which was surprising for me, uh, at least, to know that um, so many people who are <clears throat> not recertifying is because of paperwork issues or and they are still eligible. Um, and I think that's uh, where Supervisor Sharps came in. It's like really want to understand the paperwork itself to look at it on the recertification, why it's so difficult. Now, there's this thing called the telephone signature, which sounds great because all it means is you get them on the phone, if we can get them to say yes, 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 you know, no, no, those, those questions, that was certified, which is which is really good. Um, personally, I, I really like DocuSign. You know, when the email comes in, I just click, 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 I'm done. Uh, I, I wonder if that might be an alternative as well, in addition to telephone that we could offer uh, on the recertification process so that some of these documents could be done easily having to be pre-filled out for them, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's actually a direction that we're, um, not we, but just the industry is going towards. And I believe I, I heard that um, Code for America is doing a process that's through Get CalFresh. That's exactly that concept where they can send, we could send the research that's pre-filled out and the client would just need to say yes and just change the things that have changed. Um, so that is a, that's the direction that hopefully we're going towards. We're not there yet though, but it's exactly the type of things that we're hoping to move towards. Okay, no, that, that's great. I'm glad you're doing it. And if people don't turn it back in, I mean, I know like DocuSign, I'll get another uh, attempt like a day or later, too late. So, so they keep reminded, right? So so uh, I don't forget. So I just want to make sure that we also make those multiple attempts to, uh, to, to do that. Now, in terms of outreach of the elderly and disabled, um, they're, they're, they say that the interview was waived initially, but they didn't you know, return their uh, recertification application. When that happens, do we do an outreach, like actually visit their homes to, to see if we could get that recertified or just contact them by phone call? How does, how does that work? That'd be a question for Margareta, Margareta you on. What, what is our outreach process? Our outreach process is to, contact, to um, try to contact them by phone. We don't have a manpower to go visit every uh, recipient that does not return the paperwork for the a lot of visitations, <laughs> but we do uh, we do for all recipients that don't uh, respond to their certification either interview or paperwork. We do automated uh, phone calls and text messaging, and then also we try to uh, contact them uh, via a live person. Okay, good. Uh, do, do you contact these guys by email? I mean, some of them do yeah, have email. Yeah, we do email as well. Yes. So, Okay, yeah, so I'll suggest, and then and hopefully if you could get that pre-filled paperwork done in the future, I think that would be huge in terms of getting it come back. I think that would be a huge help on that. All right, and of course, uh, we do have language outreach, I presume that- uh, Yes, yes, definitely. And we have a lot of language certified staff that speak the language of the constituents. All right, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. 
All right, this was received report. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is still up. Your hand is now down. All right, we will consider, oh, excuse me. We have one speaker for uh, one minute, please, Jill. Sir. Our first speaker is B. Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. All right, thank you. And uh, I guess how to describe it is something anecdotal. Uh, I'm really interested how the ideas of uh, to offer funding to large, large scale farmers, Remember, not just receive report on this one, but uh, Supervisor Smidian. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, can I have some time back uh, on my sure, time? Sure, add back? 10 seconds on there, Jill. Thank you very much. Um, to offer something uh, hopefully helpful uh, and anecdotal, uh, you know, uh, large scale farmers, uh, you know, in, in Monterey County, in the Central Valley, if they learn to accept uh, funding sources from state agencies, they can really practice, uh, you know, really good health practices with. Uh, you know, their employees and, and farm workers. And for healthy farm workers and to create those good practices, you know, that ends up creating a good healthy food product that is then delivered to ourselves in the cities. And then we can distribute that and we just have a, a healthier system developing. So there is actually some things that, act, you know, can develop out of COVID-19 that are hopeful. It's learning to figure out what is the good and what is the needed uh, things out of this COVID era and uh, good luck how we discern all of that. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, Jill. And with that, that concludes item 18 as being received. We now move on to item 19, which to, was received report from social Excuse services. Me, chair, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Supervisor Smitty. Um, I, there was additional direction with that uh, motion to receive the report. I'm not sure we voted on the motion, which given the direction, I think perhaps we should. Did I miss something? No, I, I agree with you. You gave direction. And I know um, that uh, that was taken down. And I think you are right. If your motion is to, um, to accept that direction, I'll be happy to second that. Do we have any further discussion? I think you're correct, sir, by submitting that does require a vote. It's an action. I think I second. But okay, Susan Chavez, you want to second it? You, no, no, it's all right. I, 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 I'm I, fine. I just wanted to be helpful. Sorry. You were helpful. So we have Supervisor Smidian's motion that included his direction, Supervisor Chavez, who seconded that. There's no more speakers, no more hands raised. Joe, would you please take a roll call vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We are now moving on to item 19, which a supervisor asked be heard also with item 30. 19 is simply to receive report from the SSA, Department of Family and Children's Services, relating to the continuum of care services. And 30 was the salary ordinance amendment to delete and add positions in the social services agency. So one is a non-action and 30 will be a vote. Okay, let's open it up and I'm gonna guess Daniel. Good afternoon, supervisors. Daniel Little, director of the Department of Family Children Services. Good afternoon. Open up my PowerPoint. So good afternoon, I'm gonna provide a, a brief update on the continuum of care. Um, and then in the middle, provide some recommendations for the welcoming center uh, separately. Um, and at the end, I guess uh, we can take, I'll take questions on item 30 regarding positions. I'm sorry, you said at the end what? Um, at the end of the presentation on the, on the continuum of care, um, then I'll just leave it open for questions regarding item 30 on, on those positions. Okay, thank you. So, the FCS and its many internal and external partners <laughs> collaborated on implementing a strong continuum, including staff from Behavioral Health, um, the Spark Clinic, the Child Advocacy Center, CAFSA, and Seneca and Uplift as our service providers. 
Areas of collaboration include the welcoming center and its services and training, expanding the number of therapeutic homes and services provided by community agencies, and the ways to best distribute information regarding new service options and, and programmatic changes to resource community. And what we're going to be, I'm going to be discussing today is the, specifically the contract for the welcoming center. Due to delays in obtaining state licensure for the welcoming center, the center has not been able to receive children. Because of this, we have not been able to make um, an informed decision on the effectiveness of the welcoming center model. So we're going to propose extending the current contract with Seneca through fiscal year 2023. That would come in a contract amendment um, through the June process. Uh, this time would allow for a thorough and appropriate evaluation of the model and will provide information on transferring the welcoming center model back to the county staff program. And before we do this, there are really two key questions that we want to address through that evaluation. Um, one of them goes to the optimal staffing configuration. So what's the number, the appropriate number of staff per shift? What's the appropriate background classification training? And then second is the actual program model. DFCS and, and Social Services Office of Contract Management will integrate the evaluation process and expectations in the next Seneca Welcoming Center Service Agreement, including the role of Juvenile Justice Committee and SSA's External Evaluator Resource Development Services. Additionally, DFCS has confirmed the Juvenile Justice Commission's role to inspect the Welcoming Center. And JJC will chair a continuous quality improvement committee with DFCS that is aimed at improving services. Additionally, the JJC will be involved in the planning and coordination of the RDA evaluation. And just to add some additional information, um, a question that I get uh, kind of routinely is, um, what would it take and, and why can't we bring this back to the county today? Um, and, and my response is I believe that we can and we will do that. Um, I also want to make sure that we're not repeating programs of the past and expecting different results. Um, and I think the recent Child Advocacy Center is an excellent example of how to build a world-class program by building upon a stakeholder expertise. The CAC has one kind of key advantage to the Welcoming Center in that there was a national model um, and an accreditation process. This provided a general framework that could then be built upon, make it our own. The, CA, the CAC model has evolved and improved over the years to ensure continued high levels of care to children. By contrast, the Welcoming Center is a new model with limited examples with which to build upon. By partnering with Seneca, their expertise and experience can help us not start at square one. Seneca can be partners to see what works and what doesn't for our community. At that point, we can then work on a transition, transitioning the program back to DFCS. while also identifying what other partners would be beneficial to serve children. I'm also not 100% confident that the state would have created a specialized licensing category for us if it had not been Seneca as the primary operator of the county program. Our entire continuum from the Welcoming Center model to the enhanced treatment placement have garnered statewide attention. Casey Family Programs recently published a paper outlining Santa Clara County's work to discharge all youth from group homes and, have now, um, and how we've begun building this new continuum. And then Assemblymember Stone, with support from the Child Welfare Directors Association, introduced AB 808. This bill will create additional pilot sites around the state uh, built upon the continuum of care that we've developed here. Um, and lastly, I do see a connection between the Welcoming Center and the Child, Ad and the Child Advocacy Center. Seneca has partnered um, to provide on-site clinical support as needed to the Child Advocacy Center. Um, the Child Advocacy Center really provides support to children who have experienced unthinkable trauma to facilitate forensic interviews and medical exams and to help create immediate safety. The Welcoming Center provides support to children who have experienced trauma based on a transition from a parental home to due to placement disruption. And the Welcoming Center also provides immediate support to create safety for children. And a quick update on our uh, enhanced treatment home capacity. Um, we're currently at 15 uh, treatment level homes. We anticipate by the end of the month being up to 20. Uh, and then at the end of May being up to 24. So that's a significant increase in the treatment home capacity. And as a reminder, these treatment homes are, are the direct replacement for the actual shelter beds that we were using at the old rate. So the children that previously would have been in the shelter beds um, that were waiting treatment placements, now we're able to use these uh, treatment placements uh, we're building through these, through these contracts. And then, as I had said, we're still waiting on licensure from the state. Um, in the last communication we had with CDSS on Friday, 
they assured us that it's with their legal team um, and they're still within their kind of 30 day time frame to get licensed from their um, mid-March uh, email to us. Seneca has, has met with uh, the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood outreach, the Winchester Orchard uh, Neighborhood Association. And we've also had uh, the Welcoming Center in Seneca do a number of um, virtual and in-person walkthroughs um, showing the, the, the Welcoming Center. And with that, I would take any questions regarding the Welcoming Center or the Continuum of Care. And as I've mentioned, if you wanna ask questions, I can answer questions regarding the ad group as well. Thank you, Daniel, I appreciate that. Oops, we've got an echo going. Now the echo's gone, thank you. Um, first, let's hear from two members of the public and then we'll go to supervisors. One minute each, Jill. Thank you. Our first speaker is B. Beekman. I'm unmuting you, please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman. Uh, I hope we can have a little patience for myself on this item. Uh, you know my work with accountability with technology and open public policies, and uh, I think it can build real good ideas of sustainability for our community and future. I think it's a great thing to teach children to, you know, steer them away from the juvenile system and, and show them that, you know, there's something positive and hopeful about how our community works. It's with that in mind, uh, with so many COVID uh, items today, I, I'm trying to learn to ask, you know, there is, since there is, you know, there's a molecular st structure that's experimented with that can help with, you know, uh, the vaccination process, you know, it's a man-made thing, but it's, it's incredible. It's protein system can help a lot. Is that system, does it have a bit of microchip technology in it as well? Can you answer that for me, to me? And if you can, that's learning how to help the community. They need answers to those sort of questions. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maggie Cocaine. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I am Maggie Cocaine. I am a foster parent in South County. Uh, last year, there was really very clear direction by the board that this would be a one-year contract. And based on that direction and doing the math, if the contract ex is extended until 2023, that sounds like the welcoming center won't open until July of 2022. So what are we doing in the meantime? How are we doing with overstays? What are those numbers? I think the board and the public should be aware of that. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, Jill. And it looks like we have a couple of supervisors. Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, Daniel, the um, one question I have regarding the rake, um, this happened before I joined the board, uh, and I'm glad to see that uh, the rake is no longer there um, in this welcoming center. So first question I have is regarding the this licensing issue. Um, how close are we getting the license uh, at this point for the CDSS approval? Thanks, Supervisor Lee. The, the latest the, uh, estimate we received from CDSS was mid-March. They told us they were about 30 days out. Um, that's about the, that's the closest we've, we've come to getting any kind of a date um, when that could be done. Uh, the last time we reached out last week, um, it, it was just that the, con the uh, licensing packet was with their legal staff doing the final reviews and would let us know. Okay. Um... So it could be any day now, basically, right? It's very close, correct? Yeah, and we're ready. The, the center itself is ready to open as soon as we get the, um, get the license in place. Okay. Um, the, one of the challenges that remain is in the build out of the new model uh, include the need of more homes, um, engagement with the youth who continue to uh, refuse the placement uh, and ensure they have some type of step down transition plan for the youth uh, to parents, family, or permanent homes. Um, what type of strategies are being currently developed to address these challenges? Yeah, good question. Thank you, Supervisor. Regarding the um, recruitment and retention of foster parents, we did just begin a pilot with the state to do um, specialized targeted recruitment, especially for youth um, that may have more significant needs, more significant trauma that requires different training. So that's one avenue we're doing on the specialized recruitment. The other piece is we are ramping up our family finding efforts. So we have a family finding leader coming in 
uh, later this spring, or early summer, that's going to be doing a, a cross-departmental um, kind of reboot of family planning. Because one of the one of the solutions nation, nationally that we found is really use of, of relatives, um, it's, it's, even if not caregivers, but a support for you. Um, so you see options, see kind of a light at the end of the tunnel for when they're in a foster care system. Um, the other component is with that, I mentioned AB 808. Um, if that passes, that will actually create a more structured kind of step down model within the continuum. But it would add a, a, a additional elements that we currently don't have within our continuum. Um, Behavioral Health also has a, um, a partnership with, with the FCS and they've created a uh, transitions coordinator. So that person's a clinician that's trained with the trauma that you've experienced um, in foster care and the importance of, of transitions um, specifically between foster parents and, and, their, and their biological parents and to ease in that transition and prepare you and families for that. So that's something that's going to be focused specifically on youth that are in this continuum that we're serving some of those uh, most at-risk youth. Um, I think lastly, because we're replacing typical congregate care, even some of our treatment level congregate care with individualized homes, um, that's shown to help with the with stabilizing children and improving permanency rates as well. So by using a, a short-term residential therapeutic model that's based out of a foster home versus out a congregate care setting, um, then we're hopeful we'll see at higher levels of permanency and less disruption for those children typically would have resided in congregate care. Great. Um, so um, we certainly have a lot of um, lessons learned from the rig of how that was not successful. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the, the time you can give me the, the answer, but maybe if you can give an off agenda report later uh, to highlight the lessons learned of what's wrong with rig and how this welcoming center that we're developing is so different to solve those issues that's been highlighted. Uh, that would be very helpful to understand the differences. Hey, Mr. Budge, I, I can we can submit in an off agenda, but I can give a, a brief a summary sure. right now. The okay. main difference between uh, the welcoming center and the rake is the rake was a mixed program. It had a receiving center component so that children, when they were first removed, would go there, and that's where their initial assessment would, would occur, um, initial engagement. There also was a, a physical shelter model there. So there were shelter beds there, and children could be placed within the rake. You had the mixture of populations of children that were um, kind of in between placements that were really placed there as a shelter. And then you had new children that were coming into our care, or children who had experienced disruptions, all intermingled at the same location. The difference is the welcoming center doesn't have the shelter component, it really is just the engagement. Um, so the sole role of the welcoming center is when a child has experienced significant trauma based on a removal. So when, when our child has to be removed from a parent's care, um, you know, there's the there's the trauma that they've experienced in the form of child abuse and neglect, and then there's the additional trauma of that separation from family. The other trauma that children can experience is if they're in a, uh, a current foster home or another kind of placement, and that and there's a disruption that can cause trauma as well. So in those two situations, while DFCS is looking for the next best, next available placement that's going to meet that youth's need, the welcoming center that would be there to help engage that child. Um, find out kind of what their needs are. So then when DFCS is doing our placement searching, we'll have that information right then. But, it, but the main difference is it's not a shelter, so the children wouldn't be retired in there. Right, and they do not expect to stay there for more than 24 hours, basically. That's correct. Yeah, right. Okay. Correct. Thank you very much. Is that it, Supervisor Lee? Yes, thank you. You betcha, Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan, uh, for the, the report. And I want to also appreciate uh, the Seneca staff for the tour that they gave me last month uh, of the Welcoming Center. The center was warm and inviting. Uh, the staff was knowledgeable and certainly eager to show us the progress um, that they've made in making the, making the center an appropriate short-term placement for children and youth. Uh, Dan, thank you for directly addressing um, the contract extension issue. That was going to be my first question. Um, I hear that you've been waiting for the state licensing since last year. So I, I, I am sympathetic to the challenge that this presents not only to Seneca, but to us as a county. 
Uh, the report mentioned that you will be proposing to extend the Seneca Welcoming Center contract through fiscal 2022-2023 to allow for an appropriate program evaluation to occur. Um, and I know that the board, prior to Supervisor Lee's arrival, gave direction for a one-year contract, and this certainly feels like a two-year contract. Do you anticipate opening uh, in July 2022? Thanks, Supervisor Ellenberg. Mm -hmm. I think that we would be ready to open um, as soon as we can get the provisional license. Um, and then to provide enough, in, enough time for us to do an evaluation to then see what do we need to build internally. I'm um, going back to some of those key points. What would we need to develop for our staff? Um, mm -hmm. How do we want to train our staff? So I think those are the two questions that we need to make sure that we answer. Um, and then I think to make sure that the welcoming center model itself and how it fits within the continuum actually accomplishes what we need it to accomplish. Um, what, I, what I'm trying to avoid is, is replicating kind of what we've done, which has created additional issues, I think, both for staff as well as clients. Um, so you know, developing something soon that we can then see how does that fit within the, the county system. Mm -hmm. It, it it does make some sense, and it sounds like we're between the licensing issues and the COVID issues, we are almost inevitably um, pushed into a, a three-year timeline here. Um, the report also stated that an evaluation must occur before DFS uh, DFCS staff could be trained to prepare for a DFCS-run welcoming center program, which I am pleased to see because I do certainly appreciate a robust evaluation project. But the argument that some community stakeholders are making around outsourcing, receiving assessment and intake is that there was an urgent need uh, to go with a place that was ready, experienced, and able to start taking in uh, children. I'm, I did notice that you haven't offered any tours yet, um, virtual or otherwise, for the resource families. And I, I'm confident that our foster care families would appreciate being included in these discussions and to be offered an opportunity to take a look around as they are the ones um, who spend the most time with the kids that come in and return to, return to our system. Is that something you can incorporate with them to, to work out with them? Absolutely, Supervisor. I'll connect with Seneca. Um, actually, I meet with them later today, and I'll, and I'll ask them to start working on uh, setting right. up. Right. Thanks. Work. And then finally, with respect to item 30, and this is why I wanted to hear them together, um, President Wasserman, um, the deletion with regard to the deletion of the unclassified social worker and the senior children's counselor position, can you talk about what the impact on staffing and supports um, will look like at the Welcoming Center? Absolutely. I'll start with the um, unclassified. Um, mm -hmm. the two unclassified positions were, were codes that DFCS received several years ago in attempt to kind of get in front of our recruitment and, and training of new social workers. So the thought was um, we could hire people into an unclassified, and then as, as traditional positions opened up, staff could transition over. We've actually gotten much more efficient in our hiring. So we have typically um, a regular position available that somebody that can get right into and then get into training. So these two positions, the two unclassified, actually haven't been used since November 2019 and April 2020. We've never needed them. When we, when we have a regular position available, staff, a new, new employee are going to pick that versus a unclassified position. So they just, they just haven't been I'm used. so sorry. Your sound is a little bit unclear. Let's see if this is any better. Nope. Not really. No. I can, I, it, we, I can hear it. It's just um, kind of sounds like you're talking through a pipe or something. Okay. I'll try to move closer. Thank you. The, the unclassified positions were added several years ago in an attempt to onboard staff more effectively. Um, since that time, we've actually built in our own efficiencies in our onboarding process. We haven't had a need to use those unclassified. We've always had a regular position that people could, new employees could, uh, go into to start their training. So those two unclassified positions have been vacant since uh, late 2019 and early 2020. Mm -hmm. Because a new one, somebody applying for a position with DFCS, um, you know, they have the option of, of putting in the application for the unclassified 
may have the option to put their, their application in for the regular full position. Staff or new applicants are always going to pick the one that has the full protected position versus the unspecified position. The senior uh, children's counselor has been vacant since September. Um, and, you know, that is, that is one that we, that has been kind of in play regarding some budget, um, budget reduction. So we hadn't filled it. We have been able to cover the work um, that was, that was uh, vacated by that. We had two additional positions that were impacted by the um, voluntary separation program. that we're actually adding back in through an administrative ad relief. So we're, we're gonna be, we're gaining back two positions at the uh, Keiki and the Welcoming Center, or Keiki and the Scatter site that we had lost through the So you, you said that people are covering for the senior children's counselor position that's been vacant for a while. Uh, now that we are in less of a dire budgetary position, is that with, with funding available, is that a position that you would seek to add back? No, I mean, looking at the work that we have there right now, we're able mm -hmm. to cover it. Um, and, and based on, you know, the, the two supervisor positions that we want to add back in, um, if I were to rate and priority would be significantly higher priority. Mm -hmm. um, those are two positions that we had staff present um, several months ago regarding losing positions and, and staff being worried that we were going to uh, dismantle several teams. Mm -hmm. So I would, these two supervisor positions for me are, are very crucial in our operation. Okay. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate all of the information. Glad to hear the supervisor positions are critical. Um, supervisor Chavez. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you for the report. And I just wanted to also acknowledge it was helpful to have all of the background report timelines as well I, in, in the report. That just reminded me a little bit of the kind of the tracks that we're on. Um, one thing I wanted to do is I, I wanted to say um, to you and Dr. Smith just how excited I am to see us getting close to that. 20, almost 25 number of therapeutic homes. I think that's where we thought we needed to be right around 24, 25, and then do an assessment to determine, um, you know, the, the, whether or not we were right sized. And I, and I really appreciate both Seneca and Uplift really helping us uh, get to those numbers. So uh, congratulations and thank you all very much for getting us there. Um, one thing that I, I really want to emphasize is that we also did a contract with Seneca on the family finding front. And I, I wanna make sure as we're reporting out on the licensure and the programming of this site, that there's a very deep understanding of the of family finding and the, the, speed at, the speed at which we're able to make those connections, the strategies around those connections, so that we are in fact, if we are in a situation where we need to remove children from their family that we're, that as often as possible, as appropriately as possible, we're putting children with family, with other family. Um, so I really wanna make sure that we're not, that we're really moving on that. And as I was looking at the evaluation positions and I appreciate uh, Supervisor Ellenberg raising those, um, I wanna make sure that what is included in the evaluation is the family finding component, as well as the other operations of the, um, of the welcoming center. Um, I, I too, I, I, um, Dan, do you mind giving me your thoughts on what I just said? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, Supervisor. I think that's a family finding component. Um, and I think because we have that um, kind of woven through several contracts, but I think that we can't forget about that. It needs to be at the forefront. And anytime we're looking, talking about trauma that children have experienced, and we're talking about the placement. Um, that family should be at the center of that discussion. So I, I agree with that. And I'll, and I'll double check with our team on the evaluation to see how we can incorporate something about family connections in that. That would be great. And I, in future reports, um, I'm very interested in the connection between the Child Advocacy Center, the Spark Clinic um, being moved to um, El Camino, I mean, I'm sorry, O'Connor, and the um, and how the, how, you know, the possibility of the welcoming center being on this location. And I know um, uh, Dr. Smith has really, you know, has this vision around this, um, this center for, ch you know, excellence for serving children in this area. And 
I think part of that is, again, removing the number of trips that families need to take to access services or children need to take. So I just wanted to make sure that there was some discussion within the next few months at Children's Family Seniors Committee just about the process by which that's being considered. Um, if it is, great. If not, why not? Just so we better understand that direction. Um, thank you for that. And then, the, Dr. Smith? <laughs> Could I jump in on that? Yes. Please. Um, I don't think it's actually been brought up in, to uh, social services or uh, Daniel yet, but um, it does strike me that since we're making the O'Connor campus a um, center of excellence for children in need, um, that when we get to a point that we've evaluated the welcoming center and structured and planned and programmed one that will be run by county employees, I'll uh, pick a site on the O'Connor campus to do that so that we keep it all in one location. But that's just a sort of distant thoughts right now. Thanks, Dr. Smith. And part of what, what got me thinking about it is that, um, you know, I, I, think, I think this was actually something you raised earlier, but I would just say as I think about centers of excellence, I, I think about real opportunities for learning. And, um, and there's some such key overlaps with the bodies of, of work that I think there may be some, you know, some learning opportunities there. And the other is that I know that um, we're also in the process, and this is actually the reason I was raising it, of really looking at a, an overall master plan for the health system, you know, for the BMC campuses and for, the, for all the campuses. And I just wanted to make sure we at least put a bookmark in the O'Connor campus for this uh, body of work. Consider it bookmarked. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so uh, one other thing, I, I two other things, I'm sorry. Uh, one, Daniel, could you could you talk just a minute about this, the um, stabilization services in terms of like once that once the welcoming center is open, given the role that these folks are playing in that body of work right now, what who then takes on that body of work? So, yes, supervisors. So Seneca has um, a contract for immediate stabilization services. That that's what I'm assuming you're referencing. Um, that that is a um, similar to if if people have seen wraparound, but much more intensive. So the idea behind the ISS is when a child then is placed into one of these treatment level homes, that ISS is available to make sure that the child is stable that that home has what they need. Um, and then is able to respond that should there be a crisis that you know, currently may, may, uh, may cause a disruption, that that ISS team can go in and do a de-escalation, do kind of short-term um, support to get, to get everything regulated, uh, to make sure again that the family is able to support that child to their best ability. So ISS is a, one of the, and Uplift has something similar, uh, placement support services, PSS. Both of those are our key to ensuring that children that we have placed in a in a foster home level that maybe in the past would have been in a congregator, um, that they're in a foster home level that we're able to support them when they have acute um, episodes that require more intensive support. So, um, yeah, that's helpful. I, I think, I think uh, Dan, I, as I was thinking about the the overlap here, it was hard for me to decouple or the, the responsibilities and longer term better understanding who that team is going to be. So long term is that team Seneca staff as well, but right now we're using the current staff to do that body of work, or is that county staff or is it a combination? Right now it's, it's Seneca staff and then the uplift contract has one for uplift, uplift staff. Um, so I think the, the plan moving forward is still to have that with the contractor. Um, and they, as they have been kind of historically here. Because that, that's part of um, supporting a child's transition to the next um, phase, whatever that is. Supporting the, the kind of the clinical, the, the therapeutic transition. Got it. 
Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, the other thing I just wanted to comment is on the on item 30. Um, I, I think that at, at when we do when you do your next report out at Children's Family Seniors Committee, I would just recommend that we do an update on the on the um, the African Ancestry Program and the other programs that folks are concerned about making sure are kept intact, just as an update that in fact we are keeping them intact. I can actually provide an update that Ujirani African Ancestry, we did um, get a code through an administrative ad that we, that's been filled. Great. So these, these two left today were the last two supervisor positions that we needed to get filled to keep those things intact. Perfect, thank you very much for the report. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. <laughs> Chair. I uh, will be very brief just because uh, most of the comments or issues uh, that I might have raised have, have been raised. I wanted to weigh in, however, just because uh, I, I wanted to underscore that while my remarks or questions will be brief, um, and that is not uh, to um, in any way diminish the level of concern that I have or have had. This has been a long time conversation and challenge and um, the import of it, uh, I hope does not um, diminish over time. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was just I wanted to underscore the comments that colleagues had made today about uh, the importance of evaluation. And this was the issue that I focused on, gosh, many months ago when we were at an earlier phase in this conversation, because I continue to think that uh, given all the time, effort, money, work that's going into this effort to make sure we get it right, that once that's done, quote unquote, we, we need to do the evaluation to make sure that uh, it has in fact been done right, is being done right. Uh, I always worry about evaluation in the public arena because I, I think people see it as a cost uh, rather than um, think of it as a, a, an essential expenditure that um, ensures that we're using other public funds to good purpose. Uh, I also think that we can have some very talented professionals out in the field doing the good work, but they may not have uh, expertise uh, in evaluation, which is a different set of skills. And, and finally, I think uh, we owe it to the clients we serve to be willing to admit that something didn't work, which is hard to do in a public and political arena. But whether it's the elected officials or the professional staff, uh, we've got to accept that responsibility. So for all those uh, reasons and given all those concerns, I just wanted to, I think at least triple underscore today the importance of evaluation. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you as well. All right, board members, we do not have any public speakers. Item eight was to, excuse me, item 19 was to be received. Item 30, which two supervisors referred to, is a salary ordinance that requires adoption of the ordinance and a motion to introduce, waive the reading, and preliminarily adopt the ordinance as of April 20th, which is today, and direct it to be adopted with a final vote on May 4th. So moved. Make that the second. <laughs> Thank you. We have a motion by Supervisor Chavez for what I just said, and Supervisor Ellenberg seconded. Any further discussion on either items 19 or 30? Seeing none, Jill, will you please call for the vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And again, Daniel, thanks for your continued progress and, and all that you're accomplishing. Very difficult situation. Thank you. We now move on to item number 20 under advisement from February 25th, Children, Seniors and Founders Committee. Oops, there we go. Uh, received report from Social Service Agency, Department of Aging and Adult Services relating to local area agency on aging and home delivered meals request for proposals. Speaking of meals, that was a mouthful. All right, Marianne, we'll start with you. Great. Hi, I'm Marianne Warren, the Director of the Department of Aging and Adult Services. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and Supervisors. Thank you for taking the time to have us today. So this is a follow-up to um, 
your request about becoming the local area agency on aging, AAA, and um, a follow-up as um, regarding our home delivered meals. So we have met with the um, California State Department of Aging, Kim McCoy Wade is the president. And um, it takes a couple of hoops to jump through in order to become a AAA. So um, we, um, in order for anyone to become the AAA, the local AAA source wise would need to be de-designated. And the state has outlined the de-designation process, which is um, either voluntary, which um, SourceWise does not want to do, or by revocation by the state. The county doesn't have much in it. And as you can see here, we have a number of reasons why a AAA could be, um, designation could be revoked. If they don't meet eligibility requirements, if their area plan isn't approved, um, if there's failure to comply with the approved apparent, uh, area plan, then um, or policies and procedures, then the state can step in. Or if activities of the AAA are inconsistent or in conflict with the um, state rules, including um, immediate threats to health and safety or flagrantly or deliberately failing to comply with the plan. So SourceWise has um, not met any of these de-designation requirements, but the state is uh, going to be auditing them because um, we, we, the county, filed an appeal to the Meals on Wheels contract and uh, we won that appeal. And consequently, the state will now be providing much more oversight and they will be um, providing more oversight on their nutrition program, as well as auditing uh, the TRIO contract, which is the one that we had applied for and lost. Um, and they're doing audits of fiscal years 2009 to 20 and 2021. So the goal is to provide technical assistance and help cure any inconsistencies before doing any sort of de-designation. So we're sort of in limbo while they do that, but they are also requiring that SourceWise re-release the RFQ for the Meals on Wheels program, which was what had sort of triggered this when we um, submitted our bid last year and were subsequently denied and subsequently appealed. So TRIO won that bid. Uh, the uh, new RFP for next year has not come out yet, but when it does come out, we will certainly be applying. Stop. There you go, Marianne. Yes, so, um, so we are just waiting to hear from the state at this point. Got it, okay. Let's hear from Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. Thanks for the report, Marianne. I, I really appreciate the work of our Department of Aging staff uh, to meet with the director of the California Department of Aging and others um, to have these discussions around the designation um, of the area agency on aging. It does seem very complicated, a um, little bit disheartening given the fact that this contract was signed in the 1970s and can't be overturned uh, more easily. Uh, I am pleased that they will be monitoring, um, that the CDA will be um, monitoring, um, auditing, and overseeing source-wise. This is a good first step. I want to point out that we are currently fewer than 75 days away from the expiration of the current Meals on Wheels contract between TRIO Community Meals and SourceWise, and SourceWise has not yet issued an RFP for a new contract, despite the fact that they have been ordered to do so. Uh, by the CDA. And SourceWise is currently being investigated for a pattern of disregard of direction from the California Department of Aging. And this shouldn't go um, un unremarked publicly today. I, I do believe that there are um, that there are concerns significant enough to, to warrant elevating this. I agree with the recommendations from the local CBOs that have also expressed concern about SourceWise's actions, uh, 
both with regard to this contract and over the years, and um, with the agreement or consensus of my colleagues today, I would like to request that the County Department of Aging, in partnership with our CBOs, continue to um, share information with the CDA, let them know of SourceWise's continued disregard and, and pursue aggressively the option of de-designation or alternatively, really as the distant uh, second, that the Board of Supervisors have the ability to participate in the selection of the Board of Directors for SourceWise. We have to pass that on to the state. I, know, I do know that the state would like to hear from you, the board. Then, then I would add uh, that direction today too, um, with the agreement of colleagues that that um, county council or our lobbyists put together a, a draft letter for the for signature by the full board. Thank you. And we can also certainly reach out. I'm sure each of us on our own to um, members of our state delegation, if if that would be helpful. Supervisor Ellenberg, why don't you make that as a motion? Supervisor Chavez can second it and add in whatever she wants to add on, and then we can uh, get this done. Got it. So moved. Thank you. Second. Supervisor Chavez, second. Second. Yeah. And one of the one of the recommendations. So first of all, I think the letter should include the the overall concerns that we've had and the number of years that we've had them, because while this contract is one area of disagreement, um, the disagreements between our board and and SourceWise have been many many years, um, and so one of the one of the additional recommendations I would like to make is that the letter um, also also include other options that the CBA should consider, including whether or not the um, both that we have a concern, but whether or not legislatively we need to take some action. Actually, that's probably not for the CDA, but I do think it's worth us talking to our legislative staff to help us consider what options we may want to think about relative to the the current um, construct of, you know, frankly, an evergreen contract that really doesn't make sense in this day and age to evergreen anything like that. Um, so I, I would also just recommend to, through the maker of the motion that we ask our legislative staff to consider options and that the legislative staff could bring that back to the full board for discussion. How's that sound, motion maker? Sounds terrific. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Lee, with electronic hand up. Way to go, Otto. <laughs> Thank you. I'm learning. Thank you. President Bosman. Um, I, I have to say that, um, Ms. Warren, I, I was mortified when I read this report and also the letter coming from our trust and nonprofit of what's going on with uh, uh, this situation for not a few months or years. I mean, this has been going on for decades. The lack of transparency, lack of uh, uh, accountability of, of this, this uh, in, in, in private terms, that would be called racket. <laughs> And, and so I know we definitely need to engage with our legislative side, uh, indeed. And maybe it's a question I should ask, how about the judicial side? Maybe this is a county council's question. Is there something we could do, maybe even think about a lawsuit to get out of this if, if somehow CDA is not cooperating? Because it is very clear to me that this whole thing is not only not working, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's, it's been getting to a point where I, I think we really need to get out more more aggressively. Yeah, we've previously opined on some of those issues and we'd be happy to provide you with copies of those prior confidential um, memoranda related to the legal structure and the options available to the county. Good. And it's my understanding the state is much more interested now than has been in prior years. Good, and then we certainly have strong uh, uh, relationship with our legislative body from my predecessor, Senator Cortese, uh, and I'll be happy to speak to any of the state senators and assembly members that uh, we have good relations with to, to make sure that this is something that we're not negotiating and we, we just need to get out of it ASAP and, and the sooner the better to help our, our seniors. Uh, so that's all I have on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. I, I just uh, wanted to be sure to speak up so that folks understand that the concern is uh, unanimous on our board, uh, or at least I think it's unanimous on our board. 
uh, as uh, other members of the board have referenced, uh, these are issues we've been dealing with for a very long time. Uh, the concerns first came to uh, my attention when uh, we struggled with prior leadership, in fairness, at uh, SourceWise uh, to get some cooperation with our Harvey Rose uh, audit team. And, and I, I mean this as a compliment to the Rose organization, they're hardly shrinking violets. So if, if they have a problem getting some cooperation, collaboration, uh, that means it just wasn't forthcoming because they're pretty determined folks. And uh, following that, and this is now some years ago, as I say, I reached out to our own county staff uh, who expressed concern. I then reached out to nonprofits working in the field around the county and got uh, similar expressions of concern. And when I asked why this had been going on as long as it had been going on, people were pretty direct in telling me they were afraid to speak up for fear that there would be consequences to their contracts. That's just a, a um, very disappointing thing to hear. Uh, I have uh, had a chance to speak directly to folks at CDA. Uh, I was um, pleased to see the letter from our nonprofits and I do hope, uh, I believe the motion now incorporates essentially a request to take action that they uh, recommend. So I'm pleased to hear that. I wondered if I could pull the maker and the seconder into an even more direct uh, request of our legislative staff. I, I think we may be at a place where we simply need a standalone special legislation to actually uh, de-designate and redesignate uh, an area aging body. It, it may be that the process is so cumbersome and 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 that frankly, you know, folks in the state system are sort of called upon to make such difficult uh, decisions that the better uh, course might be to simply do a standalone piece of legislation. So I'd like to ask if the maker and the second are amenable that we specifically ask county council and our legislative team uh, to uh, investigate and report back on that possibility as one route. Yes, I, I would be. That's what I. Thank you. And the last thing I want to say, and um, for the non lawyers in the crowd, I was struck as I was reading the staff report uh, that there was language almost as a afterthought, page three of three, packet page 68 that says SNP, uh, meaning our senior nutrition program, appealed the decision to the CDA. The administrative law judge determined that, quote, SourceWise's actions in awarding the 2020-21 Title III C2 home delivered meals contract to TRIO was arbitrary, capricious, grossly erroneous, and an abuse of discretion, end quote. Well, first, you, you don't get language like that from someone who isn't pretty taken aback, but perhaps most importantly, arbitrary and capricious is a legal term of art. It, it, I mean, you really have to go some to get uh, a judicial or, in this case, an administrative law judge to, uh, to articulate a finding that something was arbitrary and capricious. So uh, for those who are perhaps hearing this conversation for the first time or are new to the issue, um, this is uh, pretty damning language coming uh, out of the system, and uh, I thought it it, it deserved uh, mention. Um, and it it's um, uh, it's a situation we really do have to resolve sooner rather than later at this point. Thank you, and thanks to the maker and the seconder for incorporating the uh, specific language. I do just want to ask, Mr. Chairman, before we walk away, I I'm if my colleagues would like to just think out loud a minute about having our board be in the position of appointing the board of directors. I, I, I think what I'm hearing is a proposal that perhaps we would approach this almost like one of our boards and commissions. I, I'm just worried about us getting entangled in SourceWise's business, frankly. Uh, you know, it could be the, I, I know Supervisor Ellenberg was very clear about calling it a distant second, I think, if I remember her language clearly. But but I just think, um, boy, this is uh, this is a tangle that I, I'm not sure we uh, want to involve ourselves in. So, we're at supervisors, were you thinking of a 
sort of a more quasi-independent body where we uh, perhaps played a role in at least identifying who was serving on the body? Uh, that's what I was thinking, more like um, family health plan, first five. Uh, but again, I would I would far prefer that that we don't get tangled in and that we do something entirely separate. Thank you. That's a helpful clarification, at least for me. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike, you're on mute. Thank you. Advantages and disadvantages to a wireless mouse with a ball that you can touch. All right, we have a motion by Ellenberg, a second by Chavez. We've heard from the public. We've given direction. I see mo no more discussion. Jill, please call for a vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you Thank very you. much, Jill. That handles item number 20. 21 members was heard with number eight when we got back from our lunch break. So it's been handled. We move on to 22, considering recommendations from the Office of the Registrar of Voters. This is uh, Shannon. There's Shannon. Yep. Uh, Hi, good afternoon. Hello, Present Shannon. President Wasserman and members of the board, uh, Shannon Boucher, Registrar of Voters, and also attending is Virginia Bloom, one of the assistant registrar of voters, in case there's any questions that um, may need answering. Uh, we were asked to provide a cost estimate related to the implementation of Senate Bill 90 and Assembly Bill 1416. And as I stated in the, the report, the legislative file, just in summary, uh, the bills would add supporters and opposers information to each of the propositions listed on the ballot. And the additional text would increase the amount of physical space that is necessary for the question, or as we call it, a ballot label uh, that goes on the ballot card. So in order to determine if the additional text would cause an additional ballot, we looked back at you know, November of 2020 and November of 2018. So in November of 2018, with the amount of 17 propositions, that would have increased the ballot by two cards. You know, uh, like November 2020, we mailed a voter four ballot cards. So four cards equaled their one ballot. So um, for the November 2020, that would have increased by one with the 12 propositions that they had. So, um, you know, the number of cards that it's going to increase does depend on the number of propositions that will be on the ballot, you know, per election. Most of them are on November versus a primary election due to a change in law a couple of years ago. So we did the calculation and the estimates come out to um, $625,000 per card that is added to the ballot. So in November 2018, that would be a $1.2 million increase for the two cards. So, um, you know, these costs include preparing and providing the additional card to each voter, whether it's the official ballot we mail them or the sample of the ballot that is inside of their county voter information guide. So I wanted to provide you a, a short brief update on the legislative file because there was an amendment to um, SB 90 since we filed the report. So one of the changes was to now include local measures in addition to state propositions, uh, adding opposing and supporting information to each of the local measures. And another uh, a significant amendment was instead of, they were limiting it to the number of words, like 32 words um, in the first version of the bill, and now they changed that to limit it to 125 characters to describe the supporters and 125 for the opposers. Um, so they, they did make some changes, but uh, we have assessed this weekend and looked at format and layout um, and to review the amendments and the finding is still the same. 
that it will most likely increase by at least one ballot card. Again, it all depends on how many are on the ballot. I mean, in November 2018, if you look at local measures and state propositions, we had 49. So 49 contests just for measures that would take additional text. And that's part of why it increases the ballot card. November 2020, we had 30, 32 local measures and state propositions. So it's a lot of contests that are effective if you're wondering why maybe, you know, it uh, increases the card. So after the assessment that the cost would still be the same, um, I just do want to, with the way the bill is currently written, I do have concerns about the ballot creation timeline that can be affected by extending the time to finalize the ballot question and being able to meet our legal deadlines and especially including like sending out military and overseas voters, their ballots, which happen much earlier than mailing the vote by mail packets out to our voters. And that's because the ballot label or question is the first measured document that we get. So that question is the first piece and then come arguments and then come rebuttal arguments and tax rate statements. But that label, that question is the very first piece in the series. And by delaying a minimum uh, 11 days of us having the final version of the ballot label, which we would have 88 days before an election, the earliest we're looking at now would be 77 days with this. Um, that just does a domino effect to all of the rest of the documents inside of um, the measure process like that I had named. And you know, in November, 2020, we had over 11,000 versions of just official ballots, touch screen ballots, audio ballots, remote accessible vote by mail ballot. So it just that this ballot question that they're wanting to change is affects all of those ballots and everything. So, you know, the county voter information guide has a sample of the official ballot inside of it. Um, but the official ballot is what's being touched by this change. So I just wanted to provide you you know, some of those facts and actually the 11,000 ballot version doesn't also include the new five languages we um, received in Santa Clara County last year for facsimile ballot. So um, our cost analysis at this point as amended as written today, this morning would still be the same price. Still appropriate. Thank you very much. We have three members of the public to speak. Joe, would you please let them on? Yes, sir. One moment while we get the timer up for you. Our first you. speaker is Craig Dunkerley. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, uh, greetings, uh, 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 supervisors. Uh, yes, I, I currently am honored to serve as chair of the Citizens Advisory Commission on Elections. And I just wanted to alert the uh, board that uh, at our last meeting, we did unanimously approve a uh, resolution to recommend to the board that they endorse these bills. Uh, also wanted to offer assurances that uh, California Clean Money Campaign is very keenly aware of uh, the need to optimize uh, any impact that these bills may have on the ballot. I am surprised at the, at the update the registrar just gave because uh, a, a mock-up uh, that we made of the November 2020 ballot uh, sh uh, using the bill as it is currently written uh, did not show any additional pages being needed. A copy of that mock-up was sent to all the supervisors. I believe you have those. Uh, our other speakers will elaborate further. Thank you. Thank our you. next speaker is B. Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I guess in what is an old saying, you know, I'd really like to be able to run the voodoo down, so to speak. And, uh, but it can be hard to do that. And uh, I would like to really, you know, get out of the superstition that, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 vaccine may have some uh, micro, uh, micro cell uh, nanotechnology in it. Uh, I'm hoping that's not the case. I'm not fully positive, 
but I'm trying to find out and 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 make that hopeful and, and honest that it is not, but I'm not sure. The same with voting issues. I, it is my hunch and my good feeling that, you know, the past election actually was a fairly good process. I mean, considering the era of COVID we're in, people did remarkable. And how do we learn how to offer that to the community and learn to grow from that as, as a community, and as a country? Good luck in this work. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nancy Neff. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, supervisors, and thank you for con considering this endorsement. I'm Nancy Neff, a California Clean Money Campaign board member and a Peninsula coordinator. Also, I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Palo Alto, whose Action Council has endorsed the Ballot Disclose Act because this is a moral issue. It is wrong that wealthy interests can spend millions of dollars convincing people to vote against their own best interests, while nonprofit organizations whose positions would support those people's interests often do not have the money to get their message to voters. UU principles include justice, equity, compassion, and use of the democratic process. These common principles guide us to support this equal opportunity for trusted organizations to be listed as supporters or opponents on the ballot where voters are most likely to see them. All Californians have to live with the consequences of poor choices made by other voters, and these consequences always fall most harshly on disadvantaged populations. Thank you for your time and consideration of this matter. Thank you. Our next speaker is Trent Lanch. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, Supervisors. Uh, Trent Lang, President of the California Clean Money Campaign, the sponsor of SB90 and AB 1416. Uh, thank you very much for considering important, uh, supporting these important bills to ensure all voters know who supports and opposes ballot measures. Um, there, as, as described by the registrar, there, there's a new version of SB90 in print, uh, uh, which will soon be in, in print for AB 1416 also. It really makes substantial uh, decreases in the amount of space required. Uh, for example, the imprint bill changes, as the registrar uh, uh, pointed out, from 15 words to 125 characters. In her mock-ups, that would decrease it from 205 characters that they showed to only 125. The new uh, uh, counties may also make the font smaller if need be. Because of these changes, the mock-up we made to the November 2020 election shows no extra ballot card would be needed. And we'll be very happy to work with uh, the registrar in the county to ensure that our intent is what is actually mocked up in reality. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, Jill. Item 22, first supervisor's hand up is Vice President Ellen Burke. Believe me, I understand. I'm still on. Clicking it, clicking it. Yep. Uh, thanks. Uh, Supervisor Wasserman, uh, I want to thank uh, Trent, one of the, the speakers today, for spending time with my team to discuss the item and to ask our, and to answer our questions. Um, thank you also to all of those who wrote letters of support uh, for this item. I am inclined to support the request to send a letter to um, the state legislature in favor of uh, ballot disclose. I am certainly in favor of greater transparency in government generally, and I think adding supporting and opposing organizations to ballot initiatives moves us in that direction. On the other hand, I'm not a fan, I'm not a huge fan of unfounded, unfunded, uh, long day, of unfunded mandates. Um, and curious to know, uh, I don't know if our, our council or um, or um, Shannon is able to answer this, what funding sources do we expect to be available to cover any potential increased costs to the county should the legislature pass this bill? So I was looking and thinking about the same question, Supervisor, and just, I'm look, all I really have to go on is the very last section nine and 10 of the bill um, you know, Section 10 says no reimbursement is required by this act, et cetera. But it does say, however, if the Commission on State Mandates determines that this act contains other costs mandated by the state, reimbursement for local agencies shall be made. So I don't know legally exactly what that 
means? I'm going to ask county council <laughs> okay. exactly what that means uh, legally. James, can you talk about that as well, please? So as is commonly the case with uh, state legislation that imposes obligations on counties or other local governments, the legislature usually um, uses the Commission on State Mandates process to cover costs. There mm -hmm. are a lot of problems with that process, a lot. The big first problem is that you have to file a test claim with the commission and that can actually take literally many, many, many years at one point the commission had over a hundred year backlog of pending test claims. Mm -hmm. After a test claim is approved, it's usually approved only for what the commission considers are quote marginal cost increases and then require annual submissions of detailed documentation to justify the marginal cost recovery. And the legislature can nonetheless suspend reimbursement which regularly happens and indeed is commonplace with respect to elections related requirements. So I think the long story short is my recommendation would be that in a letter we seek um, that we seek an amendment that the state provide direct general fund support to cover these cost increases to counties to assist with the implementation. The state has done that for other election items in the form of grants in the past the counties. Uh, I think that would be appropriate and helpful here. And I think the state right now would have the funding available to help cover that. I don't think reliance on the Commission on State Mandates process is adequate, sufficient, or in the long run would be a viable um, mechanism for the county to truly recover costs. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And you anticipated my, my next question that, that might our letter be an amend, um, support if amended. Um, with, with exactly the language that you just suggested. Thank you, James. Um, also noting that if we do vote in favor today, we will be, uh, could describe it as the only county thus far or the first county um, to support these bills. Um, and I think that's, that's something to consider, to take into consideration as well today. I'll be interested to hear what my colleagues think. Uh, the clean money advocates, as we heard, believe that there will be no increased costs associated with the ballot disclosed proposal. And I am uh, somewhat reassured by their analysis. I guess we could uh, debate the question of cost ad infinitum, but we won't know the impact until we see the final language passed at the state level and the, of course, the exact number of initiatives on the ballot. And just for myself, I would say that overall, I support moving forward, even with a slight risk of increased costs in an improve in an effort to improve uh, transparency. Um, but I would, but I would like to propose that we frame our letter as a support, if amended, to include coverage of costs. And I'll make that a motion. And I'll second that motion. And um, if you don't mind, I'll. If Supervisor Wasserman, may I speak to the motion? Sure, just for clarification, that was a motion to support to support the bill as long as the costs are covered. Support if amended, yes. To, 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 include, to include clear direction of cost recovery, yes. Thank you. And Ch Supervisor Chavez seconded it. Please go ahead, Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you. I, I really wanted to um, just take a moment to, to thank the, you know, Trent and Craig and Nancy for the really good work and for thinking very critically about how to continue to make the electoral process transparent. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, part of the reason I brought this to all, to, you know, to my colleagues is that even if there is a cost, I, I, there's, a, there's such a value in making it easier for people to make um, their own choices. And I, I just am really, uh, really appreciative that that they that they thought of this. I just one other thing I, I wanted to say to Shannon and Virginia, you know, um, I I appreciate very much you bringing to us the practical implications of the changes because you know ultimately the mechanics of how we do elections are very critical, and the one question I would have is you made a, a comment Shannon about the timeline, and. Um, and I know that that the language comes in and then the arguments for and then the arguments against or maybe it's the other way around or maybe they come in at the same time I don't remember but is that is that timeline the issue that you're 
you're concerned about? Is that what is that the 11 days you were speaking of? Correct. Um, normally, uh, measure labels are due by E minus 88, 88 days before an election. So the final version would be in our hands by that Friday. It's also the close of candidates, you know, same day. Um, and then the following Tuesday, arguments are due. And then a week later, rebuttals are due. So, so Shannon, is there something you would recommend that we include in our letter to address the timeline issue? It would be good to have something that that the additional text was came in at the same time, like at the 80, E minus 88, when, when we get the question, can we have the text also? Um, because our key thing is that that ballot question. You mean the is, text in terms of pro and con, supporters and not supporters? Sorry, yes, the additional yeah. text, if we had that then, because now it can be due, what was it, about 11 days later? Yeah, what I, what I would just suggest is that I think, um, I think that, that having some, you know, a, a couple sentences that make a recommendation to look at the timeline to make this more feasible for local registrars of voters is what I would encourage our staff to include if the maker of the motion is comfortable with that. Uh, because I understand the point you're raising, Shannon, and um, and I would I think that makes sense, and I think we should make it easier to because we also want to make sure ballots get abroad and all the other things you're responsible for. So I'm happy to ask the maker if we can in include that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other supervisors wishing to speak on this item? Supervisor Smitian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, I just want to say, uh, unfortunately, I'll be a no vote on this item for reasons indicated previously. Uh, I do understand and appreciate the uh, what I think are very good intentions behind it. I'm just not convinced this is uh, the vehicle to get it done. Uh, but uh, thank you to those who put the time and effort in. And uh, as I said, um, for reasons I previously stated, I'll be an, a, a, a no vote, excuse me, uh, shortly. Thank you. I'll make one comment before calling for the question. Um, I voted yes on the original referral so data and costs could be gathered. I'm very convinced that our registrar voters, Shannon Bushy and Virginia, the numbers and what they brought forth are accurate. Um, I agree with Supervisor Simidian that um, this is not the right way to, to go about this and the costs are very concerning. And I'm also concerned about our ability to in fact get replenished. If there is a majority for this, I thank Supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez for putting in the motion that the state covers the costs and in far less than 100 years. Um, so that, that's that's very important as well. If there are no other comments, Supervisor Smitty, your hand is still raised. There we go. There you go, thank you. Uh, Jill, if you'll please call for the question. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. No. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. No. Thank you. Thank you. That passes three to two. Uh, that was item 22. 23 was handled just before lunch. 24 we're going to hear now. Received report relating to options for establishing a temporary shelter program in Milpitas. And it was asked by a supervisor, forgive me, I forget which one, that item 54 be heard with this at the same time. And item 54 is to also receive a report relating to a standardized community outreach process regarding permanent housing acquisition efforts. All righty, 24, excuse me, I'll turn my agenda over. We, I see Consuelo there. Consuelo, thank you for hanging around. All right, you're on. Good afternoon, Board President Wasserman and members of the board, Consuelo Hernandez here, Director Office of Supportive Housing. This report is a report back from two referrals that Supervisor Cortez issued last year and approved by the board. Uh, we provided a first preliminary report summarizing our actions in August. 
Um, since then, there's a number of activity that's been going on in the city of Milquitas, and we continue to partner with them to think about different ways to respond to the unhoused community in Milquitas. And this report back um, summarizes those actions and recommends that we continue that partnership with the city of Milquitas. Thank you. We have one member of the public who wishes to speak. One yes, one minute each. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Our first speaker is Alex Shore. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. President Wasserman, is there a way to speak after item 54 is discussed as well, or is this the appropriate time? Oh, no, you can speak after 54 if you wish. You just speak once on both items, so your choice. Yeah, just wanted to hear more of the presentation and discussion. To Certainly, Alex, we'll put you back in the queue. Thank you so much. Thank you. One second. Well, that concludes our speakers for this item, Mr. Chair. Okay, Jill, if you'll help remind me, we'll come back to Alex when we're done hearing from board members. We have uh, Supervisor Lee, hand, hand raised first. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, first of all, I would say uh, thank you so much, uh, Consuelo, and the uh, uh, Office of Supportive Housing team for their work on this uh, project and this report. Um, as uh, uh, my colleagues are aware, um, this is something that came through before I get on the board um, from my predecessor. Um, since coming on board, I've had my team track the prior initiatives like this. Uh, to understand the urgent housing efforts that's been stemming from uh, COVID-19 in addition to the needs. Uh, and I'm mindful of the points that the staff raised around property that the staff identified in collaboration with the MUSD, the school district, and the city of Milpitas uh, not being accessible to services on those two plot of land. And I also think um, it's just as important for all of us to engage with the members of the community through this process. Um, I understand and appreciate that the staff wants to work in lockstep with the city of Milpitas in servicing the house, the houseless uh, population that resides in the area, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I'm also aware of the fact that a lot of this work was done uh, before I came here. Uh, and moving forward, I'm hoping that we can all stay engaged and continue to move together uh, with our local community. Um, with that said, I, I'm, um, I'm asking for the following. One of which I would like to see is a bi-monthly report going to Hewlett uh, around the recent updates of the city of Milpitas that they have made with their homeless task force that they formed and their set of recommendations around the community plan to end homelessness, unquote. The implementation plan along with any coordination uh, efforts that the county has been undergoing with the city of Milpitas. And I would also like to request the Office of Supportive Housing through the administration to provide the board at this June 8th meeting with an assessment on options for incorporating the 14th recommendations on the public engagement as it relates to the housing development projects proposed by the local nonprofit Catalyze SV. Lastly, I would like to request the Office of Supportive Housing through administration to provide a board at its June 8th meeting as well with analysis of City of San Jose's 2019 audit report regarding development, noticing and ensuring outreach policies meet community expectations as a framework for designing, adopting and implementing the county's own policy and community engagement and set up a guidelines to ensure racially equitable uh, presenta uh, presentation through the government alliance on race and equity which the board previously has made the commitments to do. And with that said, I would certainly would like to move forward to receive the report. Thank you, and that's direction, so we'll need a vote on that. Do we have a second to that direction? Second, met with a question. Thank you, oh, go ahead, Supervisor Chavez. Just to, I, just to know what, to be clear, this is on item 24 and 54? Yes. Supervisor Lee? Yes, this is on 24. I mean, I know we haven't done the 54 presentation yet, but uh, I'll but be this, happy to do the same as 54 as well. So this covers both. Right. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll second that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, we'll go. We have two uh, members of the public waiting to speak. Thank you very much. Go right ahead, Jill. Our first speaker is Alex Shore. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Fantastic. Thanks, President Wasserman. And thanks, Board and Office of Supportive Housing. Alex Shore, Executive Director of Catalyze SV. Thank you, Supervisor Lee, for bringing up the issues of community engagement like you and so many of your colleagues. We care about creating a really inclusive and collaborative and productive community engagement process. We believe that that does not have to be lengthy. It doesn't have to involve 15 community meetings, but it has to involve good quality community engagement. And we, like you, wanna see a community that provides the housing for everyone who needs it. And thinks the county is making huge strides to do that and would love to be involved in whatever way we can in supporting the county in creating the best community engagement policies, practices, and processes to get there. So appreciate the support. Happy to answer any questions the board may have on our perspective on community engagement and ways that we might be able to help as we start talking with Supervisor Lee about it. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Loretto QD Brigade, Silicon Valley. I'm unmuting you. Please. Un Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, thank you so much everybody for having me here today. I'd like to indicate my strong support for any services programs, as well as possible infrastructure that will serve our unhoused neighbors here in Milpitas and also countywide, as well as underprivileged families here in Milpitas. So uh, I still think that the Thompson Street or court is the best uh, place to put through either a temporary housing or a uh, possibly a unhoused navigation center. Uh, but anywhere in Milpitas, I think we need those services. Loretto Kitties Brigade Silicon Valley with uh, hopefully in house has been servicing our Milpitas and housed here providing loaves and fishes, hot meals and other necessary items. So we'd like to continue. Uh, we are supporting the Dignity on Wheels by setting up tents and providing necessary items as well, and also with abode services and other nonprofits. So thank you so much. We'll be working with you. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, Jill. Um, Supervisor Lee, I, hand, I see your hand is still raised. A, a concern I've got as far as the outreach, the, the guidelines for outreach that, that San Jose has, and I think it's, I think that's what you're suggesting. Um, I'll just say, and in my experience at all, has, has caused some bottlenecks, has caused projects not to get done as expeditiously as possible. You know, you, you can't please all the people all the time and measuring twice and cutting once, I understand, measuring 10 times and cutting once, you know, might, might be overkill. I, I would suggest to you and Supervisor Chavez, perhaps there's some sort of compromise or perhaps we ask Consuelo at this point what she thinks is reasonable to get the pulse of people. If you do too much, it's good to do outreach. If you do too much, you never get anything done. So it's kind of a it's kind of a tough place to be in. Um, Consuelo, any thoughts about that? Yes, thank you, Board President Wasserman, for the opportunity to share. I did want to clarify that the original board referral related to the outreach had more to do with how we communicate and convey property acquisitions to the board offices. Okay. Um, and it wasn't meant to be an exhaustive or extensive program design for community engagement um, because every city is different and every property is different. Yes. For instance, most recently, we've been working with the city of Mountain View on a potential acquisition of a hotel where that action hasn't actually come to you for a decision. Um, and very early conversations with the community have been a little confusing for them because it's unclear whose project it is, for example. Yes. Um, and, and in other instances, our preliminary work does make sense. 
Um, and so I just wanted to provide that context for the board that the, the response that we've prepared for you under item 54 is in response to how we communicate with you. Um, and really, um, you know, this was one of the recommendations that came out of Hewlett is working directly with each of the board offices to leverage the relationships that you have in your respective districts. Wonderful. I'm all in favor of that. And that was a very um, politically correct answer. Good job, Consuelo. Supervisor, <laughs> Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you. I, here's what I would like to recommend is that I think the difference, um, the difference is that we, we are playing a very different role because we're an investor in for most of these projects. In few uh, roles, we're also a co-developer. For example, the hub is an example of where we're you know, we've got a different level of involvement. What I would like to recommend if Supervisor Lee is okay with this is that I think the the, the strategies that, that are being shared both from Catalyze and even including the city of San Jose, um, in some instances, I think could really be best practices in terms of notification and how far out, out, out they go. And in some instances, I would argue that it hasn't been our process, but the cities the, that we're working with not having a robust process that actually does cost us time, Supervisor Wasserman, because I think that the there's some, some confusion. And I do think we have to also th think more about our role. So what I would like to recommend if Supervisor Lee is okay with it is to put these forward to our staff for consideration. And, and I think Consuelo is exactly right to be customized based on the the type of project and frankly the experience of the city because some of them haven't built a lot of any kind of housing let alone affordable housing so thank you yeah. we've got uh, sounds like a friendly amendment from supervisor kissinger um supervisor lee what uh what is your thoughts you okay with that well i i, I certainly agree i just want to make sure that what i meant uh, with the Good. city of jose's audit report is basically look at what they do and try to see if there are, you know, best practice or things that we could adopt or add to our program for outreach that would uh, work. So that's, that's all this is just uh, incorporating any good practice on our neighbors in San Jose that uh, we could do. So, so I think we're seeing the same thing. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm on board. Any other uh, comments from Supervisor Chavez, your hand still raised? Nope. You're down. Good enough. Jill, will you please call for the vote on item 24? And 54. Thank you, Supervisor yeah. Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to item number 25, which we're hearing all by itself. And it's regarding approval delegation of authority of the county exec to negotiate, execute, yada, yada, the uh, property at 525 Charleston Road in Palo Alto. Jeff, do you want to, oh, Consuelo, do you open with this or Supervisor Simidian? There we go, Supervisor Simidian. I don't want to cut off any staff presentation, but I'm happy to move the approval of the staff recommendation. Thank you, I'll second that as well. That, that, that's fine. All right, um, Consuelo, we have a motion and a second. We have no public speakers. Do you wish to report anything out at this time? Thank you, Board President Wasserman. Nothing more to report on this item today. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisors, any further comment on this item? Seeing none. Supervisor Smith, your hand is still raised. You're, you're good with the motion? I, I, I am. I, I, uh, I know that uh, our county staff knows that I am uh, still hopeful that we can accelerate the timeline and uh, I appreciate the staff's willingness to work on that and what we have uh, discussed previously Mr. Chair and colleagues is that that's a conversation that probably is best had once we have a developer and if we vote in a moment we will have a developer and we can commence those conversations so I'm going to uh, uh, ask for an I vote and uh, then we'll start the conversation about how to expedite the timeline if possible. Thank you again. You got it. And Consuelo is an extremely talented staff person, so I'm sure it will all happen. Uh, Jill, will you please call the vote? Mr. Chair, can you confirm the seconder for us, please? Uh, uh, yes, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. 
Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we move on to item 26. Again, approving delegation of authority to our county exec. And this is regarding funding and development of 330 Distal Circle in Los Altos. Supervisor Simidian. Happy to move the staff recommendation. If there's a second, I'll speak to it just briefly. Second, Chavez, and then I wanted to speak to it also. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I just wanted to indicate, Mr. Uh, Chair and colleagues, that uh, earlier today I got a, an email in support of the project from uh, Nisa Flieger, the mayor of Los Altos, who has been working closely with our county staff, Ms. Hernandez in particular, uh, to uh, bring this project forward. Uh, she was hoping to be able to speak to the matter, but we ran a little longer than her schedule permitted. So I just wanted to make sure her uh, note of support was a matter of public record. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I was just really excited about this project and I wanted to acknowledge former Mayor um, Jan Pepper, who really shepherded this. And you know, I wanna just, I wanted to just thank her. I know she's not here, but, and also the, the staff in Los Altos who are working so closely with Consuelo and her team. Thank you, appreciate the comments. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, thank you. I certainly decided to support the project as well. Uh, this is a quick question regarding um, these type of project. If the, the, not the EH will do it, but let's say if, if they borrow the money and then the project is not completed uh, for whatever reason, is the county liable to repay the funds on the borrowing? If I may, um, President mm -hmm. Wasserman, I'm happy to answer the question. Please do, thank you. Thank you for the question, Supervisor. And I will add that we've been working very closely with this project specifically with the city of Los Altos, their planning department to really understand the land use path to reduce risk to the county. Um, we've um, conducted a number of community engagements, connected one-on-one um, -on -one with stakeholders to understand the challenges. Um, with that said, there are always issues that we face with any development, um, and we do have a repayment obligation, but also have the ability to sell the property if we are unable to develop housing at the site. Um, and that's part of our risk assessment and our recommendation to this board when we bring a property forward to you. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question, Supervisor. Happy to provide more details. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much, Consuelo. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? And no members of the public as well. Supervisor Lee, your hand is still raised. Did you have additional comments? Nope, I'm ready to vote for this. Thank you. You got it. We had a motion, I believe, by Samidi and second by Chavez again. Is that correct? That is, thank you very much. Jill, if you'll please take roll vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Members, you, Supervisors. That... I just wanted to take a moment to say that this was the first time that we issued our request for offers. And um, we had a pretty successful first draft or first process and very grateful to city staff, both of Palo Alto and Los Altos for working very closely with us, serving on our review panel. And we already have follow-up meetings with both agencies um, this week to talk about the next steps. And just wanted to thank this board for their continued support. Thank you. Thank you, Consuelo. And on behalf of this board, you're doing a great job. That was 26, we move on to 27. Jean Clark, Chief Procurement Officers, report back on the procurement process for the use of force equipment. Yes, sir, good afternoon, everyone. Can you see good this afternoon? Here? Yes, we can. Excellent, thank you so much. Honorable Board of Supervisors, Chief Procurement Officer, I'm here to provide a status report on the use of force and how it relates to some of the things we purchased with respect to lethal and non-lethal weapons what we have in inventory, and to look at the process for procurement methods, approvals, and reporting. Why this update now? When we took this on, we thought it'd be a good idea here to give a baseline of the inventory, which is a good step here. 
and to actually just get some good feedback that we're on track and take any uh, recommendations that you have as a board back to uh, uh, continue to complete it uh, in the June timeframe. So this is a check-in to receive a report, including the inventory. I'm just gonna go put some context around this, uh, these slides. I won't be too long here, um, just to um, put some context on it and uh, again, seek any direction. So this is, I'm just gonna go through this fairly quickly here because this has already been provided. The scope, uh, it includes uh, the department's uh, district attorney, office of the sheriff, probation department, procurement and technical services and solutions. To provide more transparency on the county's acquisition of relevant armaments, this working group compiled an inventory of, of lethal and less lethal weapons. We're taking a comprehensive approach to the acquisition of lethal and less lethal armaments by all of the respective departments. This includes approval workflows and reporting, which we're working on now. As part of the discovery phase, the work group is gathering relevant information on the five criteria that you have listed here. With respect to deliverables, an outcome of this project will be these five deliverables. And uh, if you look at number one here, list of lethal and non-lethal weapons, we tried to time this as best we could. Uh, the website came up with information uh, for the sheriff's department. So um, we did as best we could to get that current right now. We had to submit information uh, for the report. So the timing might be off a little. I want to acknowledge that because of the dynamics of it. Of the of the data itself, but uh, I the the website's probably the more current one because we had to submit this information of the inventory that we'll show you. But those are the five deliverables here, and then here's a status of where we're at here. We did the planning and it's underway for the analysis. You see the dates for configuration, implementation, some recommendations uh, that we'll find along the way, validate them, and of course, if the board so chooses to recommend anything. We will have, be happy to uh, change these dates to make it uh, make it happen to, to get all the information we want. Here, of course, is the inventory themselves. I won't go through uh, all of these line by line on them. You have them. Uh, it's probably just more fruitful discussion to have uh, talk about the the presentation itself. So this is by department of ammunition of lethal, less lethal uh, by department. Uh, the department's provided this information to us. So uh, I'll just go to some safeguards here. Weapons need to be purchased off a county contract. The county's current procurement system allows for buying catalogs and restricts county employees from purchasing items only agreed to in the contract. And there's another method that we call field purchase orders. Those would not be allowed for uh, acquisition of armaments. So uh, just some oversight in, in some areas here. Uh, the, the system itself for REBA and SAP also provides some controls in what we can and can't do through uh, workflow. Items of note, uh, all departments have some processes and approvals in place. There's no question about that through the systems, through some approvals. Opportunities exist in standardizing some of those areas as, as the group, as all of the departments, if you will, but, but know that there, there is process in each area to procure. Uh, we can fine tune standardizing some of that. Uh, some of the inventory uh, information because of security reasons and sensitive, now, I'll let the department talk to this. My high level understanding was there was some concern around uh, possible uh, theft or where uh, the community may know things are located. But again, I would uh, totally invite the departments to talk about that. It was my understanding it was location based was the security reason. Uh, but again, we'll defer to the department because we have some uh, experts on this call. Uh, gap analysis. Uh, we could come up with a firearm procurement policy for the groups. I think that's probably something we should do. And currently uh, the budgets are such that we, we determine what we need as we go. So I'm just kind of acknowledging that there may be an opportunity to shore that up. I'm not sure, but that's when we did some of our analysis with the departments, that's what came out. 
Um, and then we have a catalog uh, for all this information. That just is good project management on our part, just to show that we have this uh, carefully documented and, and know where it goes and how it's kind of retrieved um, for uh, you know anyone uh, in, in the public or whatever we're working on. We have a good process that uh, has been put together for this that can that can sustain good um, retrieval and updating of information. We did get good cooperation from the departments in, in trying to help us with what they have. Um, and then really, again, if I can just characterize it, we're, we did the baseline, we're seeking input here today, just to keep uh, current with you. Uh, we've got work to do. We've got work to do in uh, workflow. Uh, if the approval uh, methods, we're gonna take a look at that and then reporting so that it shores up some consistency around it. And then uh, depending on what we hear here, we'll work on that. And then in June, we will ask you again, quite honestly, for uh, any uh, further information that you would like us to work on or complete. So I'm gonna stop there. I think again, the, the, the more benefit is having a discussion around that. I just wanna put context on the presentation and I am open as are others uh, on, on the Zoom here to take questions. Thank you, Gene. You, you bet. Um, again, Board members, this is to report back on the procurement process. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, thank you. Um, related to this issue, um, there is a state bill AB 481 by uh, Assembly Member Chu uh, regarding um, trying to get law enforcement agencies to receive approval by the governing. Um, bodies before acquiring military style equipment. Do you know much about this bill? Is that to me, sir? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, I, I am aware of it. Yes, uh, I certainly am. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to see if, if there's any need for us to make an analysis and maybe coming back to us for a potential position that we should take on it as a board. Uh, if you know, if the board desires, we could take a look at it and, and review it and provide some uh, input. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Uh, okay. If this you're willing to do. I know based on the time, I believe it might happen pretty quickly by the end of May at the governor's desk uh, to move. So uh, if you think this could be done by the May 4th meeting, I really appreciate it. Eugene? Yeah. Are you okay with that? Uh, well, you know what we can you bet we can we can go after and put some good information uh, together as quickly as we could. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank Second you. is um, we <clears throat> we get our uh, what the military equipment that we might at times would get from the federal government is through the 1033 program right or sometimes through third party vendors. Um, Currently, there's no uh, approval process that's required, right? Right now, basically, if a state uh, directly contact uh, your office, uh, the, the purchase happens through the sheriff's office only, correct? That is correct. All right, I just wanna make sure. So so basically, uh, along with that, I just wanted to make sure whether, um, whether it makes sense for us to have to go through a little process so that there's some board, uh, at least notification of no approval uh, on these type of uh, uh, equipment that we, we, we're receiving uh, for, our, for our sheriff's office. Um, and- um, Excuse me, Supervisor Lee. Gene, yes. just, just for clarification, what Supervisor Lee just expressed was a personal opinion. That, that was not something that the board has voted on one way or the other, that was not direction. Thank you, Supervisor. You right. bet. Go ahead, yeah. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, please, okay, yeah, just to, just to clarify. So, um, I guess when when we yeah when we come back to uh, discuss AB forty one since it relates to it, I would love to get your uh, yeah uh, uh, some type of analysis on that on that on those procedures on the ten thirty three program uh, on the purchase of uh, military equipment. I think that would be very helpful. Okay, um, another one is um, we would like to find out. I guess, I guess I would like to see if the staff could provide a board on what constitutes military style weapons uh, and provide an inventory um, for our review. Uh, we do not need to know the location uh, of this because of the fact that that's the confidential information. That's the last thing I, I care to know. But basically, I think what we're trying to figure out is just have a accurate inventory of information, number one. Second thing is, um, 
if you believe this is information that should not be released to the public, I would like to know why. And then, of course, you can uh, you can provide to us as a confidential report, but I would like to be able to uh, know exactly what we have. Um, and then another, it, yes, go ahead. It, pardon me, sir. Is this addressed to the department, sir? Uh, yes, for actually for staff, but yes, uh, to to okay. uh, the department to provide the board this um, this information. I think it's best for the uh, sheriff's department to answer that question. Procurement doesn't have any special understanding of what the security issues are that are being referred to. So, the sheriff's right. speak to yes, that. yes. Thank you, Doctor Smith. Thank you. Uh, is the sheriff's here? Good afternoon, uh, Supervisor Lee. It's Talia Rodriguez, Assistant Sheriff, with the uh, um, with the Sheriff's Office. My apologies for the phone. Um, oh, I can well. answer some of those questions if, if you would like. Um, if you would try and repeat that for me again. Sure. So the question is, we are trying to figure out exactly what is the definition of military style um, equipment uh, in our uh, uh, inventory at the Sheriff's Office, and whether we could get a, uh, a inventory uh, as to the quantity. Uh, of what exactly do we have uh, in our office uh, for our uh, uh, review? Right, so we currently are abiding by what the state law is and we actually do have in our website all our current weaponry. Um, we don't have a clear definition from the board to what you considered military style. All I can say is that the equipment that we do have is considered police standard issue. Uh, we do not have anything um, that is greater than a 50 cal, which is pretty much what AB 481 is stating. AB 481 is basically saying or considering military style weapons, anything that's over the caliber of uh, a 50 caliber, basically. All our weaponry is, I, is for the environment that we currently um, enforce, if that makes any sense, then you can tell me. Sure. So the, the reason I asked that question is because, uh, yeah, there is a published list on the sheriff's website. Mm -hmm. uh, and when our staff reviewed it, it doesn't reflect what's included and being presented uh, in the PowerPoint uh, here. So I would love to ask if you could uh, work with our staff to update the website information to make sure that information provided is accurate so, so that it was consistent to what's published. So the information that we provided to procurement is basically an inventory of every single item that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that the the PowerPoint has the the correct information, uh, mm -hmm. but we did provide complete accurate information on everything that we have on the website. Yes, you do see that we have pistols, that we have rifles. The only difference from what you see on the website and what you see on the list that we provided procurement is the caliber. For the most part, everything is listed on that, in that group of weaponry is what we currently have. It's just basically the different type of caliber and perhaps the, um, the name of the manufacturer, but essentially they're all the same type of equipment, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think we, we've been reviewing it and I don't think we can put the heads and tails together. That's why these questions are being asked. So mm -hmm. if you could, I'm just asking if you could go back and uh, confirm what's published uh, and what's on PowerPoint, I, I certainly appreciate it, just to make sure the information provided, it, it matches. Okay? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we mentioned that there are gaps, right? Uh, An area of improvements being identified so I'm wondering, is it possible for you to um, uh, identify those gaps and areas improvements uh, and respond to those before implementing those changes? Uh, so that way it gives the board the opportunity to give some further direction on this item. Okay, just to clarify, thank you, Supervisor. To, we're working on understanding uh, some of those gaps right now in, mm -hmm. in our analysis of it. So is, is the ask then to report to you what those gaps might be before we recommend anything to, to pause yes. there, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly you could come back with some recommendations. I think that would be great, but okay. some, some okay. time important. Okay. I think if you could bring it back, say by the June 8th meeting, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Uh, and if that's the case, I'll be happy to move forward to receive the report. 
Okay. Thank you. I'll Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. I'll second and ask my colleague, uh, Supervisor Lee, in a moment if he's prepared sure. to accommodate some additional uh, direction uh, as well. Um, Why don't you go right in? Thank you. Uh, let me go first, I think, uh, to Dr. Smith and, and uh, Mr. Clark. And Mr. Clark, thank you, first of all, for the presentation. I thought it was very clear and very crisp. Uh, I, I am a little anxious that, um, you know, this is the follow-up on a referral that actually uh, came to our board in June uh, at my instigation. And, you know, it's taken 10 months to get to the point where we have a working group. I understand that the more explicit uh, direction came, uh, I think, in August. But still, uh, it, this is, um, I guess, Dr. Smith, what I'd like to say, and, uh, you know, as one board member and uh, as, um, as I'd like to, see, and, and to Mr. Clark, I'd, I'd like to see a greater sense of urgency in addressing these issues. Uh, th this is... Um, you know, all too often uh, the moment of uh, public awareness and engagement passes and the work then does not get done. I, I want to make sure that on these issues that uh, that doesn't happen. So let me just, again, stress the need for a greater sense of urgency. The The second thing is, um, it, it, Dr. Smith or Mr. Clark, either, either one, um, in terms of who's participating in the work group, is there a reason that our contracted uh, Office of uh, Correctional Law Enforcement monitoring the OCLAM uh, folks at OIR are not part of the group? And is there any reason that they couldn't or shouldn't be? No, they can. Go ahead, Dr. They could certainly be part of the group. Well, I'd like to suggest that uh, as uh, part of the direction, if the maker is amenable, uh, I certainly am as the seconder, uh, Supervisor Lee. Yes. And I'd also like to suggest that uh, we in, incorporate uh, some kind of uh, engagement by uh, what is, I believe, now a, a standing community uh, correction and law enforcement monitoring committee. I know we've made our appointments. Dr. Smith, Mr. Clark, any reason we couldn't engage their uh, attention as well? I think the only uh, question I would have is the um, department seems to think that there are some issues that are confidential or related to security. And I'm sure there would be an objection to having public members uh, in that discussion, but I don't wanna speak for the sheriff. Uh, other, other than that, and uh, I, I'm happy to stipulate that uh, information which is legitimately confidential, and I'm going to come back to what's legitimately confidential following up on Supervisor Lee's question, but I'm happy to stipulate that information that's legitimately confidential uh, would not be shared with the Community Correction and Law Enforcement uh, Monitor uh, Committee, uh, but I would like to ask uh, if the maker is amenable that we incorporate their review and approval as well. Uh, yes. Thank you. I got I got a lot of requests, Supervisor Lee. So thank you for leaving in. Uh, and um, let me just ask uh, Dr. Smith or Mr. Clark: Is there is there a, a place in this conversation for the public defender? I know that they are not the procurers of these kinds of uh, resources, but I, I certainly think that their clients have a vested interest in making sure that this process is a thorough and rigorous one. I think uh, the uh, reason they were left out is because of the original referral really just referred to the DA, the sheriff and probation. Um, I'm not aware of any reason to exclude them. Gene, is there a reason? No, we could, we could include them. No problem with that at all. Thank you. And I'm not sure that they want to be included, so I shouldn't speak for them. But if uh, Supervisor Lee is once again amenable, I think what I would ask is that we uh, direct staff to extend the invitation to the uh, public defender's okay. office to 
uh, be part of the group and or provide input as they deem it uh, helpful and appropriate. Happy to. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, Mr. Clark. And Mr. Clark, I should have said earlier, and forgive me, I did not, uh, notwithstanding my concern about developing a greater sense of urgency, I actually think you have a very uh, uh, ambitious timeline here in the next couple of months now that the group has been stood up. So I want to acknowledge that and say thank you for uh, for that, uh, as I even as I express my concern about the uh, amount of time it's taken us to get to this place. I, I do want to um, uh, ask uh, some more questions, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'm mindful of the time. So what I want to do before I ask a few of those questions and sort of uh, tee up some of these issues is indicate that um, I'm also going to ask that we, um, in addition to receiving the report today, if the maker of the motion is amenable, refer the the uh, th this item to to either um, health and hospital or health and hospital and public safety and justice. I don't want to speak for uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, but I uh, I think that the detailed kinds of questions that Supervisor Lee is already pursuing and that I know I hope to pursue are, are going to require perhaps more time than we have remaining today after a long meeting. So Supervisor Lee, if I may, through the chair, I, I'm going to ask if you can add that to the motion and maybe we can, uh, through the chair, ask our colleague Supervisor Ellenberg if she'd like to see it in committee or if she's happy to just have it go to uh, health and hospital. Yes. Uh, uh, assuming Supervisor Lee is is um, amenable to to your amendment. I am happy for it to go to health and hospital. I don't think it needs to go to both committees. I'll ask a few questions today um, on the record that if if they're not able to be answered in in real time, I would appreciate your asking them in your committee meeting. And um, with that. Uh, 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 consent, I, I will look forward to having the item, uh, if there's a, a majority vote, obviously uh, go to committee for a more in-depth conversation than perhaps uh, today's uh, schedule provides. Let me ask Mr. Clark and or, and, and forgive me, Ms. Rodriguez, is it Captain Rodriguez? I want to respect your proper title. Hello, uh, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. It's um, actually I was promoted to Assistant Sheriff. Well, uh, congratulations, Assistant Sheriff. That's a mouthful, but I I'll, I, I want to honor it. Um, you just call me Dahlia. That's perfectly fine. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Assistant Sheriff and or uh, Mr. Clark, um, it, could we get a fuller understanding now as to why the uh, some of the items were identified as um, believe the uh, this was NDC, uh, which was a uh, shorthand for not disclosed and confidential when we were asking about the total um, number of rounds, uh, as I understand it, for handguns. It just I, I was at a loss to know why that was information that uh, would compromise uh, the ability of the organization in any way. So I'm um, looking at the report that you were provided, um, Supervisor, you actually have a outdated report. Um, we provided a current report to procurement that actually gave more, uh, the, basically gave pretty much accurate information as to what we currently have. So I apologize for that in advance, but um, we can certainly send you or the board a copy of the most current report that actually has every single item that we currently have in our possession. Thank you. Uh, I would appreciate that. Um, it, um, as we look at the <clears throat> inventory snapshot, um, I see um, what is described uh, as on packet page 143, and forgive me, 
Mr. Clark and uh, Assistant Sheriff Rodriguez, that may or may not be helpful to you, but uh, under current state less lethal inventory for uh, SHF department, Sheriff's department, there is reference uh, under uh, line six, line seven, line eight, to what I believe are 40 millimeter launchers. Am I reading that correctly? That is correct. Can I ask what they launch? They're basically um, simunitions. Are they grenade launchers? Uh, they're not, well, they're not grenade launchers per se, but they're simunitions. So basically they launch anything from a pepper ball to a, um, to simunitions, basically impact weapon. Could you help us understand what an impact weapon is in the context of this conversation, please? An impact munition basically would be considered, for example, a rubber bullet. Or okay. a pepper ball would basically be a simunition that carries um, pepper spray or, you know, some kind of, this is not for CS. We do use them for CS gas because it's a different type of launcher. So they're basically to um, launch uh, CS gas, in some in some situations, and these are only carried by members of our staff that are trained in that for that purpose. Yeah, I, I just indicate now, so you have a heads up. I I'd like to follow up a little bit more on this particular weaponry when we have the meeting in committee. Just want to give you that advance. Uh, I noticed reference to OC spray. Uh, I believe this is a reference to uh, oleoresin capsicum. Yes, which is a uh, and, and would you tell us what that oleoresin capsicum is, please? Basically, that is a form of a spray that is um, lesser than the CS gas. So it's basically used as a less lethal, less lethal, sorry. It's less than lethal force. So when we have someone that is non-compliant, instead of utilizing any other type of force, if we can't use our, our commands or rebel commands or we can't go hunt with the person, then we use the pepper spray. Okay. And the CS uh, handball grenades, uh, tactical pocket grenades, the, the CS grenades, these are uh, the more potent uh, product, yes? That is correct. Okay. Um, is there... Uh, a reason that we didn't see any vehicles, or there is there nothing in the way of vehicles that, Mr. Clark, you think uh, it would be helpful for our board to be aware of? We can take one more look at that, Supervisor. Um, that's a fair question. Thank you. I, I'm I'm I, I'm going to encourage you all to think about this on a. Um, sort of a continuum, if you will, uh, between what I would call a sort of a standard squad car at one end of the continuum and, you know, what what most people would refer to colloquially as a tank, perhaps at the other end of the continuum. Uh, <laughs> you know, there there's a, a lot of room in between armored personnel carriers. Uh, I'll defer to Supervisor Lee, who I suspect has far more familiarity and expertise in this subject than I do. But I, I do think it would be helpful if when we talk about this next, uh, we get uh, some discussion about vehicles as well. Um, and uh, then I wanna go to the page, Mr. Clark, if you can put it up again, that had items of note. Okay. And I want, uh, I'll wait a moment here, if I may through the chair. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and I notice under 3B, it says there's no set budget for the purchasing of armaments. The departments need to identify funding. Does, does that mean, Mr. Clark, or perhaps it's a better question for Dr. Smith or Mr. Ituria, that um, we do not actually, in our budget process, identify either what weaponry will be acquired or in what amount? but rather that's a decision that is uh, left to the leadership of the sheriff's department uh, as they identify funds that they repurpose uh, following the budget? Yes, that's true. We uh, budget in by object. So object one, as the board knows, just for the public is 
personnel costs. Object two is service and supplies. So the uh, armaments and issues that, like that you're talking about would fall under object two. And the budget does not delineate specifically the amounts or type of uh, purchases. Thank you. That's a probably a good, good point for me to interject sure. uh, something. I think you're going to ask me next, so I'll be prepared. <laughs> um, the discussion that's being had really um, goes along the gray line between the board's authority to budget and the sheriff's constitutional authority to operate the type of operation that she thinks will protect the community pursuant to her constitutional authority. Um, if the board would desire, they could adopt policies that preclude purchases of certain types of equipment. Of course, at that point, you'd have to define exactly what that equipment would be in a specific way. Um, and um, it would be, you know, a policy of the board rather than a budgetary action, but it would ref be reflected in the budget. All right, I, I'm going to turn to County Council now and say, um, Mr. Williams, my recollection is the Government Code Section 25303, which codifies the prerogatives of independently elected sheriffs and district attorneys, also contains language which specifically provides that not only is the Board of Supervisors entitled to exercise oversight and budget responsibility, but that we are obliged to do so. Is that a fair recollection and characterization of the language of section 25303? It is. All right, well, I would just call that out and ask that uh, Mr. Clark and the administration uh, perhaps be mindful of that when we meet in committee, if there's a vote to move forward so that we can have that conversation. And Dr. Smith, uh, could I ask that you have uh, the appropriate budget staff there to help us discuss uh, by what means, if it was the will of the board, we could appropriately um, exercise some judgment about uh, uh, budget allocations used for uh, weaponry. Um, maybe I should try to explain uh, what I just said a little bit more clearly. I, I heard it. Uh, and I understand the distinction between policy and um, budget, but um, I, that's why I think precisely because of what you shared with us, I think we need to have somebody at that meeting who can, uh, you're, you're routinely present at those meetings, so maybe that's the solution, uh, Dr. Smith. I, I apologize, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted you to make sure, wanted to make sure you knew I, I understood. I just think we need to have that discussion and um, we're, we're gonna, I don't wanna be in a situation where we get into the meeting and don't have the right staff people there. Dr. Smith. I'm just trying to think of how I'm gonna phrase it to get the point across. Uh, we don't budget down to the purchase of individual equipment and we can't do that, but you can adopt a policy that precludes the purchase of particular equipment. Thank you. Then I would ask for the staff to be present who can help us have that conversation. Uh, forgive me if we were just talking past one another a little bit. And that relates to uh, Mr. Clark 3A, which is, as I understand it, your uh, gap analysis is indicating among other things that there is no firearm specific procurement policy. Is that, do I have that right? Among all the departments, yes, that's true. Okay, uh, and I think that's clearly a um, uh, a subject uh, for uh, discussion. Um, Mr. Clark, I know your procurement. Has there uh, been a discussion of use of force claims and what they cost the county? 
To my knowledge, no, sir. I'm, I'm, I don't have that. I don't have that information. Dr. Smith, is there any reason that couldn't or shouldn't be folded into the larger conversation? Since ultimately, if there are use of force claims which are either settled uh, or result in judgments against our county by virtue of the weaponry, uh, that uh, is uh, money that comes out of the county budget. Certainly, we can include a discussion. Uh, I don't think uh, procurement or myself or administration could give you a good answer to that. It would have to come, I think, from county council. Well, council's been kind enough to provide some of that information previously on a pretty regular basis, so I should say thank you for that. Uh, but ask Mr. Williams, is that something we could perhaps update with a particular eye towards this conversation? Yeah, we can, we can certainly do that. You specifically want to know any settlements or judgments associated with uh, weaponry. In other words, yeah. where, where a weapon was involved in use of force. Yeah. Yes, and also uh, where weaponry was not involved. <clears throat> and um, so we can get some order of magnitude, but as an example, um, and I'll look to the assistant sheriff here, uh, if I get into uh, uh, poor choice of language about what's what, but you know, I. I'm not sure everybody would think a collapsible baton was a quote uh, weapon. Uh, I would. Um, so, you know, if somebody has got a use of force complaint and there is a um, a baton involved, I, you know, I'd want to sort of understand that since that's one of the things that uh, the budget dollars are paying for, as we've discussed thus far. Does that clarify a little bit, Mr. Williams? Yes. Thanks. Um, I'm going to stop there, Mr. Chairman, not because I don't have more questions, but because I know uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's waiting in the wings, and I'm going to just ask that all of the requests for information be incorporated in the motion if Supervisor Lee is amenable to that, as he has been thus far, and for which I say thank you again. Thank you. Supervisor Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. Not at all in the wings right here on the virtual dais with you, Supervisor Smidian. Uh, and thank you very, very much for this line of, of questioning. I am I'm very appreciative that you and Supervisor Lee are going to take this up in uh, health and hospital. It certainly is relevant as a uh, health and safety issue. And I would be very interested in seeing um, if, if the conversations lead to policy recommendations. Um, on um, what, what type of weaponry we agree to spend public dollars on. Um, I, I think that would be very interesting and useful. I want to direct a question uh, to county council in the event that an answer is available now. And if not, I would ask if you would consider it in your committee meeting. Um, I saw that in the report that uh, probation and the district attorney uh, provided the exact number um, of Glock 17s that they have, but the Sheriff's Department just provided a range uh, for how many of that specific firearm. They don't disclose the real number and uh, the, the website listing that Supervisor Lee referred to, and, and I'm happy to look back at it again if I didn't see the current update, but it showed a range, not specific numbers. And I'm curious to know two things, uh, James. First, what justification, what legal justification is there for not disclosing uh, the specific amount or type of any particular armament or ammunition? And secondly, what qualifies a particular firearm or type of ammunition as um, as NDC, not disclosed and confidential? I would refer those questions to the sheriff. I'm not sure what the basis was for the decisions that they made on, on that or what particular risks that they believe it presents. And I would need to know that information to make a legal determination. Whether it's based on, on, on law. Right, because I don't, I don't know what the, the, their specific factual concerns are and I'm not I don't believe that my office was consulted in oh, okay assistant sheriff Rodriguez can you address that then is it in accordance with a with a state or federal law 
Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, I appreciate the question and I want to reassure you that we did provide all the information. I think initially this was a snapshot that was taken early on when we were beginning the process. Um, and again, if, if I may, I can certainly forward you the information that was sent to procurement where you can actually see the exact numbers of pistols, rifles, uh, 40 millimeter launchers, every specific item that we actually have, what has been issued, what we have in, what we have in reserves. All that information is definitely uh, available to you. Uh, my apologies again if it was not in the report, but that is definitely was provided to procurement um, before this meeting. And I will take a, a closer look um, and, and see what I missed. And I would appreciate your resending it. And if all of the the precise numbers are there and not simply the range, then my question uh, will have been answered. So thank you. Absolutely. And if I just may, um, one of the things that we were very clear on with the Sheriff's Office, what we wanted to be completely transparent with all the information that we provided to the board, realizing that this was a public meeting and the information was going to be available. So again, my apologies. Um, we somehow dropped this, but we definitely will send you a copy of all that information. Um, so that you can look at everything that we currently have. Thank you. And, and did procurement get that list as well? Uh, yes, they did, actually. They did receive it. We had a conversation um, last week in regards to it because we did see a mistake in the report. Uh, and my apologies, Jean. We did see a mistake in the report, and we went back and said, hey, we need to make sure that the board has all the, all the information available so that they you know, so we can avoid these types of questions because, again, the, what was important to us was to be able com to be completely transparent and showing that you that we do have these armaments, we do have this weaponry, but again, it's not to hide anything. Mostly, we understood that this was very important and it's important to our community to know what the sheriff's office has and what we utilize and what what we utilize the equipment for. So we completely right. understand that, and again, be more than happy to send that to you. Thank, Thank you, you very me. much. I appreciate that, and I look forward to to looking at the updated report. Jean, I, I'm sorry, did I talk over you? Oh, no, no, no problem at all, Supervisor. If I may, I I believe there was a supplemental information that was sent in that did incorporate the latest information. So I just I just want to respectfully put that out there. I appreciate that very much. I will uh, do a little closer due diligence and make sure I find the same list as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. If no other, I'm going to make a couple of comments. Uh, we have one member of the public. We'll hear from the one member of the public first. Jill. One moment while we get the timer. Our first speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, this is Blair Beekman. Uh, Thank you for everyone and their efforts on this item. Um, this is work that, um, you know, could easily date back to 2014 and 15 with uh, the incidents in Ferguson, Missouri. And uh, that was, I think, the first serious large realization. It was time we have to review uh, how uh, police and sheriffs use army surplus things and, and army grade equipment. Uh, the surveillance and technology ordinance came around at the same time, and I know Supervisor Ellenberg is working on reimagined issues since 2020. So good luck to everyone. Uh, hopefully technology ordinance ideas can help with this process at this time, and good luck to everyone in continuing good work to offer accountability uh, to this subject matter. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, Jill. Um, this, this is going to be a, this is going to be a uh, interesting conversation going forward. I appreciate Health and Hospital taking it on. A um, couple of comments were made, and I'm sure there's going to be many more that uh, I may share a difference of opinion in. But do we still have the assistant sheriff on Dahlia? Dahlia, I'm just speaking. We're each just speaking. Thank you. We're each just speaking as individual supervisors. This, there is no direction being given besides what Supervisor Lee has already said, and I believe seconded by Supervisor Simidian. But for myself, 
and and I know I'm outvoted here, but how many types of nine millimeter or 38, how many rounds you have is not, I'll just say this supervisor's business. We, we don't micromanage as, as, as uh, CEO Jeff Smith said, there's object one, object two, each department buys however many items they need under object two and employs however many people they wish under object one, they just have to stay within their budget. So I, I appreciate you gathering all of that information. Um, but for myself, whether you, whether you have 5,000 rounds or 10,000 rounds or a nine millimeter, doesn't matter to me. Where, where we talk about excessive force reports, and I appreciate Supervisor Sumidian asking for that information, and I look forward to reading through that information. Um, for me, something that wouldn't be relevant is the baton. It's not the baton that's guilty of excessive force. It would be the officer that's guilty if excessive force is found to have happened. So I may see these things a little bit differently. I just wanted to share my thoughts at this time with my fellow board members. And again, we're each just one person and we'll see where this goes as it goes through committee and eventually comes back to the board and what direction is given regarding limiting certain type purchases, whatever is in the board's um, right to do so. Supervisor Allenberg. Apologies, done. Oh, not there, okay. So we have a motion from Supervisor Lee. We've got a second by Supervisor submitting along with a lot of direction. Members, is there anything else anyone wishes to say on this matter before we vote on the motion and second before us? Seeing none, Jill, will you please conduct a roll call vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, we now move on to our final item. I believe, Jill, is that correct? Item number 29? That is correct, sir. Thank you very much. We now move on to item 29. Sure, uh, President Wasserman, this yes. was an item that um, that I, I asked to be agendized, and so there's no presentation necessary. Oh, I would okay. just like to make some comments, if that's okay. Please. Thank you so much, and thank you, uh, Mr. Janako, for the work. Um, I asked that this item come back to us uh, at our March 23rd meeting. And my intent was to receive the audit work plan for the jail reform recommendations, not, not just attend summarized recommendations, because what I want to make sure of is that we're not simply auditing that which is complete, but also we know what's in process and where it is in process, given that we started working on these over five years ago. Um, so what I would like to do is um, move to receive the report and ask this, uh, Mike, if, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Janako, if, um, if we can get uh, th this come back as a biannual report as part of the uh, board jail reform study session, and that, this, that uh, the staff report on the jail reform recommendations implementation in progress made since the last time the report comes to the board in a graphic form with percentages uh, two, that the staff report with estimated timelines for completion of the remaining jail reform recommendations. And three, that OCLEM report with a progress update on the jail recommendations audit. Um, and that I, I just want to ask uh, OCLEM if in all future reports, if you could just give us work plans and dates uh, for when tasks will be per, uh, performed and any proposed timelines. And I, I know that a lot of your work is relatively new. So uh, going forward, that would be my request. And that's a motion. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Do I have a second from a board member? Oh, second. second. I believe Supervisor Lee beat out Vice President Ellenberg. Mm -hmm. So you'll get the second on that one. Supervisor Smitty, you have your hand raised for additional comment. 
Uh, starting with a couple of questions, if I may, uh, through yes. the chair. Ms. Zanaco, where are we on the information sharing agreement, which I know you've wrapped up some while ago with other departments and agencies, but where does that stand with the Sheriff's Department? Um, hello, Supervisor Smidian. Um, to be um, direct and, and concise, uh, we are where we were in November, which is we don't have one. Um, my understanding is the sheriff has retained outside counsel and we've had some discussions, but we have had no movement with regard to uh, 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 effectuating an agreement. I'll just say that's disappointing uh, and go on to say that it um, clearly impedes the ability of your office to do its work. Uh, and to the extent that you can do the work with whatever workarounds are amenable or available, uh, it's going to make it more costly. Uh, we've discussed uh, some of the options previously, so I won't <coughs> raise those again. Uh, but I did want to just uh, check in yet again on the status of the agreement, and it's clear there isn't one. So thank you for that. Could you be? Um, could you share with us a little bit uh, about how you see the a uh, community group that uh, has been stood up, the Community uh, Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring Committee playing a role in this work, uh, if if you do, going forward. Oh, absolutely. I think that um, the community, monitor, community group uh, of law enforcement monitoring um, will be very helpful. It provides a public face and a public facing uh, to do a number of things that I think a community a group of community-based uh, representatives are most effective in doing. For example, uh, the community conversations that were stood up and begun last summer uh, to have those continued uh, and using uh, CCLEM to do that, I think will be very effective. And uh, I look forward to seeing how that, um, how that uh, rolls out. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Janako. Those were my only two questions. Um, and uh, I'll go with that. Thank you very much. Oh, Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, for a question for Mr. Janako, um, we, I know that uh, Oakland has the auditing responsibility of jail reform recommendation uh, and have has Oakland, or ha, well, have you issued any subpoenas? Are you anticipating issuing any subpoenas to compel the sheriff office to provide this information? Uh, Supervisor Lee, um, it is my understanding um, as of today, April 20th, that the sheriff is agreeable to providing the information we need to uh, continue with the jail reform audit. And if that's the case, there will not be a need to uh, issue a subpoena for that information. We made a request in the beginning of April for information with regard to 10 of the 80 subgroups of recommendations. And um, under that agreement um, and understanding, the sheriff will be providing that information in May. And we'll see. I, I am hopeful and optimistic that information will be provided in May so that we can get that audit underway with regard to the 10 recommendations that um, have, I been, have been identified as being completed and ready for auditing. And, and is that uh, those 10 recommendations, is that something you could uh, provide to us as well? Yes, sir. Um, I can provide that information to you. Um, it ranges everywhere from issues involving jail classification to uh, improvements in dentistry services and the custody health side. So it goes beyond the sheriff's office, um, but there are um, 10 of the 80, which is really more like 80 or 90 of the 655 recommendations subgrouped uh, there and it's a big healthy chunk of, of work. So we look forward to receiving the information. Thank you. I was one of the persons who voted for the 600 and so recommendations a few years back. Um, Oakland notes that the uh, Jerry Reform Work Group is reviewing the other recommendations. I think it's a total of about 33, right? That have been deemed completed but not submitted for auditing. Um, so the impression I'm getting from this is that these additional recommendations will be submitted and audited in some type of rolling basis. And is it possible for Oakland to continue the process of auditing the set of recommendations uh, at a time and provide the, uh, the board at the next the jail reform study session with a similar audit process, timeline, 
uh, a work plan to audit these additional recommendations. The yeah. point is to allow Oakland the time to assess how its current proposed audit process will play out and uh, for it to identify and make the necessary adjustments uh, and then to present to the board at the September uh, 20th meeting on what I learned. Yes, I, I, will, I, will, I will work with the working group that is um, identifying the recommendations that are ready to be audited. Here's the conundrum is that um, Oakland doesn't have control over, about, over when the recommendations would be ready to be audited. And I, I also believe I'm trying not to uh, go over a, a road that was gone over before when there was a request for all 655 uh, with an arbitrary deadline. And none of that was ever done. That was just, that failed. And I'm not, I'm trying not to repeat failures of the future, but uh, to the degree that uh, the, the partners in the jail reform group can provide some information to me that I can then convey to this board on, on where they are with each of those uh, recommendations, I can provide it. Um, mm -hmm. I won't be able to check it um, in the same way, uh, but I can provide what they're representing is done for sure. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board members, we don't have any public speakers on this item. And forgive me, the motion maker was Simidian, is that correct? Chavez. Okay, and then Supervisor Lee beat out Supervisor Ellenberg. I remember those close finishes. All right, if there is no further discussion, I'm going to ask Jill to take our final vote of the day. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank and with you. that board members, today's board meeting is concluded. Have a nice evening. Stay well. Take care, everyone. See you all soon. Thank you Thank all. You, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. President. Thanks. Good night. Good night. And with that, this meeting will be ended. Thank you.